So good morning. Uh, welcome to the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing uh, listening session. Uh, my name is Ron Davis. I am the Director of the Department of Justice Community Oriented Policing Services Office, also known as the COPS Office. Um, let me just start with a quick background on why we're here before I turn the meeting over to our distinguished task force and the co-chairs. Uh, on December 18th of last year, uh, President Obama signed an executive order creating the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. He identified two co-chairs who you'll meet in a few minutes. That would be Philadelphia Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey and George Mason Pref uh, Professor uh, Lori Robinson, who's also the former Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs. And in creating this task force, the President identified a couple pr main priorities which the co-chairs will talk about, about building trust between police and the communities, but while doing so, making sure that we continue our downward trajectory of crime reduction so that as we build trust, we've also become much safer as, as a nation. Uh, the COPS office was identified as the part of the Department of Justice to support, so the whole Department of Justice will be supporting the efforts of the task force. In that capacity, I serve as the executive director for the task force uh, to help facilitate the outstanding work that the task force is doing. Let me just say this from the beginning. On behalf of, of the president, for those who are watching, thank you for turning in. And on behalf of the president, I want to thank the task force again. This is now, we started in Washington, D.C. We went to Cincinnati. We're now in Phoenix. We'll be in the next couple of weeks coming back to D.C. And if you can just imagine the amount of work that the task force members are doing. Uh, because somewhere in between all these things that, that they're doing, they still have to manage police departments. They still are professors at major universities. They're still civil rights activists and community organizers. They're still doing their work, but the contributions that they're giving, the time and the sacrifices, uh, just, I just want to say as the executive director and on behalf of the president, thank you for your leadership and your time. Uh, with that being said, uh, throughout the morning, I will give you how the, the, the program will flow. So what we'll start with the co-chairs, we'll have some introductions by the task force members, and then we'll get straight to our distinguished panels. So with that, um, so we can get straight to business, I want to turn it over to the co-chairs, uh, and that would be Philadelphia Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey and George Mason University uh, Professor Lori Robinson. Let's one, one note, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, is I do want to acknowledge um, that, as you know, um, the full administration is supporting this effort. I want to acknowledge uh, Cosme Lopez, who's here from the United States Attorney's Office. Thank you for attending. Please uh, share our our thanks to John Leonardo, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona, for his support, and uh, we appreciate your attendance. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you, Ron. Uh, I'm Lori Robinson, <coughs> uh, co-chair of the task force, and as Ron said, I'm a professor at George Mason University and former Assistant Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to have the opportunity uh, to co-chair the task force uh, and honored to uh, co-chair it uh, with Commissioner uh, Chuck Ramsey. Uh, as Ron indicated, this is the third of our listening sessions uh, and we'll have one additional one in Washington, D.C. on February 23rd and 24th. Our timeline is very short. We have committed to having recommendations on the President's desk on March 2nd. Uh, that very short timeline uh, requires us to come forward with very concrete recommendations on a very important topic, uh, as Ron Davis outlined. Uh, our focus today is on community policing and crime reduction. And we know uh, that uh, the, this subject is really at the core uh, of our mandate. Many people have observed that in the years since 9-11, uh, that in many ways the policing community has perhaps kind of lost its way on community policing as the focus has been on crime reduction uh, and data-driven approaches. Uh, we'll be hearing from a very illustrious number of witnesses today uh, on uh, this subject, uh, hearing from academics, from community representatives, uh, from policing uh, professionals. Uh, and we uh, have already reviewed much of their testimony. 
uh, we'll have an opportunity for questions uh, from our panel. Uh, and as I say, I think we have a brilliant uh, lineup of witnesses. Uh, in a moment, our task force members will be introducing themselves. Uh, but at this point, let me turn to my co-chair, Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you, Laurie, and good morning, everyone. It's really an honor to be here uh, today and to co-chair this task force with, uh, with Laurie Robinson. Uh, between Laurie and, and Ron, they've pretty much said everything that needs to be said as far as the introduction goes. I'll just give you a little bit about my own background. Uh, I'm currently the police commissioner in Philadelphia. I have been for the past seven years. Uh, prior to that, I served as police chief in Washington, D.C. for nearly nine years. And I began my policing career in Chicago. I'm a native Chicagoan, and I spent close to 30 years as a member of the Chicago Police Department. So I've been in policing since 1968 when I started as an 18-year-old police cadet. So my entire adult life has been devoted to this profession. And this is a period of time now that is very important for all of us here. Um, it is a defining moment for us in our business. Um, occasionally, we do have periods like this. Well, this is one of them. And that's why the president formed this task force. That's why we're, we're going about our business trying to get as much input as possible. I want to thank all the people that are here to testify uh, before us today, those that have presented written testimony, those that are participating via um, social media. Um, you know, believe me, um, we want to hear from you. We want to we want to hear your thoughts and your opinions on um, some of these very, very important topics. So with that, let me um, turn it back over to, um, to Lori, and I guess we'll start um, with the introduction of our um, task force <laughs> members. So why don't we do this, Cedric? Oop, there's a little problem there, a little feedback. So uh, yeah, one, one on at a time, I guess, is what we need. So we'll start with you, Cedric. Good morning. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for being here. And, and uh, again, I'm, I'm very delighted to, to be part of this task force. But just a little bit about myself. I'm Cedric Alexander. I'm currently uh, the Public Safety Director in DeKalb County, Georgia. Uh, my police career started about 38 years ago in Florida. I grew up policing in Dade County, Florida, and held a number of positions since that time. Currently, also, I'm uh, <clears throat> national president of Noble, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, and uh, very delighted to be here with you all today. So thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jose Lopez. I'm the lead organizer uh, at an organization called Make the Road New York. Uh, we're an organization that spans across New York State. Uh, and works on a number of issues with a base of 16,000 members. Um, we're also a member of CPR, Communities United for Police Reform, uh, an unprecedented campaign in New York City uh, to address uh, biased and unfair police uh, practices uh, used by the New York Police Department. Uh, and we are also uh, working in partnership with the Public Science Project at the CUNY Graduate Center with a team of about 12 youth researchers uh, to uh, do research um, and gain perspective and narrative around the issues of stop and frisk and the impacts that stop and frisk have on young men and young women of color between the ages of 14 and 25. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tracy Mears. I'm a law professor. I've been a law professor for over 20 years. I teach at Yale Law School right now. Before that, I taught at the University of Chicago. My research focuses on um, understanding the dynamics of policing in urban, cr uh, urban communities and the nature of crime and crime reduction and how we can actually come up with crime policy that is both effective and fair. Um, most of my research uh, of, as of late is focused on procedural justice and legitimacy and I've done a lot of that work with many of you in this room and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say today as I'm sure as all of the listeners, both here and out in the world on social media. Good morning. I'm Sue Rar. I come from Seattle, so I'm embracing the sunshine while we can. Um, my, my path here started in 1979. I started working as a patrol deputy in the metropolitan Seattle area. Spent the next 33 years learning 
that learning about this profession, and that was my preparation for my current job as the director of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission, also known as the Police Academy, where all the, all the local and municipal officers in Washington are trained. Um, it's been such a privilege to work with the task force members and to listen to the testimony. Uh, many of the panelists are people I've admired my whole career. So it's very exciting to be part of this incredible process where we're bringing, bringing the best minds in the country together to help us um, move our police culture to our full potential. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I think now you can hear me. It's great to be here. My name is Connie Rice. I am a very old civil rights lawyer, and I've been suing law enforcement for a good 30 years, but then the last 10 years, I've been marching side by side with Chief Beck and Chief Bratton, and um, we have come up with some fabulous solutions in LA, and for those of you who are professors, you absolutely must study this, or you're gonna be completely left behind in the dust. So I'm hoping to share what we've learned, and, um, I'm very, very grateful for everybody participating, and I thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sean Smoot. I'm the uh, Director and Chief Legal Counsel for the Police Benevolent Protective Association of Illinois and the elected treasurer for the National Association of Police Organizations. I've spent uh, the last 20 years of my professional life advocating on behalf of police officers uh, in court at the bargaining table and at the state capitol and at, at the capitol in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm very honored uh, and uh, humbled to be asked by President Obama to be part of this task force and to have the opportunity to work with uh, uh, co-chairs Robertson and uh, Ramsey and, and my fellow task force members and, and look forward to your testimony today and uh, appreciate everybody's uh, attention and, and tuning in uh, across the web. So I uh, look forward to hearing the testimony and, and appreciate, um, appreciate what you're bringing forward to assist us in forming good, solid recommendations for the president. Good, good morning, my name is Brian Stevenson and I'm the director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I've spent about 30 years providing uh, legal assistance to poor people and people of color and prison people, uh, people facing uh, imprisonment. Uh, we've been pursuing reforms of the criminal justice system in a range of areas uh, with particular attention uh, to how we provide greater services, greater equality, greater reliability uh, for communities that have been historically marginalized. Uh, I want to add my voice in just thanking all of the experts and all of the people testifying today. Your contributions really make a difference to us. We've got a very short timeline, and so the quality of your work and the time you've spent preparing your presentations are, are really greatly appreciated by those of us on the task force who really do want to seize this opportunity uh, that Commissioner Ramsey was describing. We have some challenges that we hope we can advance and meet uh, in the coming years, and I'm delighted to be a part of a process uh, that takes on these uh, challenges uh, directly. So thank you for being with us, and I look forward to your testimony. Good morning. My name is Roberto Villasenor. I'm the Chief of Police for the City of Tucson. And on behalf of Arizona, I'd like to welcome you to a climate where you don't need overcoats to go outside. Um, after being in D.C. and Cincinnati, this is a, a nice change for the task force. I, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I've been a chief for six years, been a member of the agency for close to 35 years. Tucson and Arizona is my home, and um, it's very nice to be here, and I'm very honored to be part of this committee. I've learned a lot in the past few listening sessions that we've had, but I'd also like to point out and acknowledge my colleagues who are in the audience here, both in uniform and not in uniform. I think the, this is the most chiefs we've had from one of the, the um, jurisdictions that we've gone to. And oftentimes, Arizona's in the news for some unique legislation that happens here, but oftentimes it's these individuals that are out there and, and trying to bring some light to the fact of how that legislation affects different parts of our community, and they are true proven leaders who will take the information they hear today and, and disseminate it back within their communities. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say, and I look forward to starting today. Thank you.
Oh, thank you. In addition to um, uh, the task force members, we also have two technical advisors, Steve Rickman, if you raise your hand, Stephen, and Daryl Stevens. Um, so as you can see with this outstanding task force, the technical advisors, we have the great team from the SAI, who's you'll see in front of us, that are supporting this. Um, but if you didn't hear the first part, I was just reminding people that you can provide your comments through the uh, COPS website. And at the end of the day, we'll have a public comments period where those in the audience and from those who give comments online will be able to uh, we can hear your, the task force can hear your comments. With that, I turn it back over to the co-chairs. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Ron. Uh, our first panel is on uh, community policing and crime reduction research. And we have a terrific group here with us. Uh, I'm not going to read full bios. That would actually probably take up our entire time with the backgrounds of this group. Uh, those are available both on the web and in handouts in the back of the room uh, for those who are here uh, in Phoenix with us. So I'm just going to do brief identifiers. Uh, and we're going to start uh, with Bill Geller, uh, who is here with us from the Chicago area. And he's the director of Geller and Associates. Bill, welcome. Uh, and uh, let me just interrupt for a moment and remind our uh, witnesses here that we have had your written statements. And if you could summarize, uh, primarily focusing on your recommendations to us, uh, and stay within the five minutes. Bill? Good morning. Thank you for your two years of work. After 40 years of working with police, community organizations, government agencies, civil rights advocates, and researchers on a variety of police community challenges, I've reached a few conclusions that I hope will help you strengthening policing in our police society. My conclusions highlight some less obvious capabilities that police have or could develop and which they can use to powerfully bolster community improvement efforts. I recommend that this task force identify effective ways to motivate police to use such capabilities to help communities help themselves. Here are some of my conclusions. It is feasible to police communities in a way that helps reduce crime, disorder, and fear, and honors cherished liberties. Tracy Mears recently called this rightful policing. Police can catalyze community action that will build safer, fairer, more livable neighborhoods. Such catalytic policing involves supporting community members and organizations who are already working hard to improve the livability, safety, and fairness of the neighborhood. Arresting criminals is one way to arrest community decline, but police have other problem-solving options. For example, they can help community groups overcome program implementation obstacles, vouch for the community groups with government agencies, potential funders, opinion leaders, and others who can make or break the group's success, and invest tangible resources to enhance the community group's impact on neighborhood well-being. Some of the capabilities police can deploy are their intimate knowledge of community assets and liabilities, their credibility among government decision makers, their can-do attitude and creativity in working around bureaucratic obstacles, and their ability to nonviolently influence people to behave in ways that bolster community well-being. Catalyzing community-led community -led progress often puts police in supportive roles in which the traditional police command presence is unhelpful. Cops' brains and hearts may be more useful than their guns and badges. Police and community groups may need to invent new ways to teach and learn from each other about how to get things done to improve communities. They need a generosity of spirit that includes using mistakes and setbacks as building blocks to success rather than excuses to walk away from the collaboration. What might come off as heavy-handed tactics by police when they operate independently can be seen instead as nurturing, empathetic, trust-building investments in helping communities improve themselves if police act as community-endorsed collaborators. And when collaborative initiatives help squelch long-standing neighborhood crime problems, police often feel new trust in community organizations and new job satisfaction. Let me illustrate my conclusions with a particular type of police community collaboration. 
For the past 20 years, my colleague Lisa Belsky and I have conducted field studies of the transformative community impact of partnerships between police and local community developers. We have worked with police community developer partnerships in many cities and have written two books, including eight case studies about a strategy we've called Building Our Way Out of Crime. In this strategy, community-endorsed physical redevelopment of blighted, disinvested neighborhoods improves quality of life and cuts crime without significant gentrification. The eight collaborations we documented are exemplars of how government can catalyze capable community organizations by behaving in a respectful, strategic manner that puts government in service to community-led initiatives. These eight collaborations produced crime jobs ranging from 70% to above 90% declines that lasted for years. Community improvements included replacing or repurposing crime-generating properties with better housing, commerce, social services, and amenities. Properties that once ruined neighborhoods were transformed into generators of safety, vitality, and community pride. Our case studies were in Charlotte, Minneapolis, Portland, Oregon, Providence, Richmond, Virginia, Sacramento, San Diego, and Washington, D.C. In these cities, particip participants told us the transformations, I'm sorry? In these cities, participants told us the transformations would not have occurred but for the police community development partnerships. And participants did not attribute crime drops to displacement of crime and poor people to other neighborhoods. My final observation is about building police community trust. I think durable trust comes not when cops and community members who distrust each other sit and talk about distrust, but when they take action together that solves daunting crime problems. Trust is a valuable byproduct of collective pride in a job well done by people who were brave and dedicated enough to suspend their skepticism and work across the police community divide to accomplish something important that neither could have done acting alone. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Dolores Jones Brown, and she comes to us from John Jay College, uh, which is part of the uh, CUNY system in New York. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I understand that my comments may not yet be online, uh, so I'll make reference to them, however. I come to today's session wearing several hats, <coughs> which are outlined in my written testimony. My interest in this topic is both professional and personal. At this moment in time, nothing pains me more than having spent time as a prosecutor. Uh, uh, Ma'am, can, can you turn the mic on? Okay, the green light was on. Do I need to start up? Okay. I'd like to thank the task force for this opportunity. I come to today's sessions wearing several hats which are outlined in my written testimony, which I understand may not yet be online. My interest in this topic is both professional and personal. At this moment in time, nothing pains me more than having spent time as a prosecutor, academic researcher, and educator of sworn police officers for more than 25 years. And yet as a wife, sister, and mother of a teenage son, I spend a great deal of time worrying whether my husband, brother, or son will have an encounter with the police that will leave him criminalized, hospitalized, or deceased. In my January 9th comments, I recommended the mandatory piloting of neighborhood policing as a specific form of community policing for use in urban settings. The deaths of Eric Garner and Michael Brown are evidence that in some cities, police departments have become too socially distant from the communities they serve, and academics may, in part, be to blame. By overstudying some police tactics and understudying others, we create, or not, the body of knowledge that police agencies come to rely on. During the period 1991 to 1998, the neighborhood policing approach in San Diego is credited with having produced greater reductions in violent crime than those achieved in New York. Crime dropped in San Diego and continues to remain low without increasing the number of arrests, without substantially increasing the number of sworn officers, and without increasing the volume of citizen complaints. This year, amid concerns about how police departments 
should and should not handle community protests, the San Diego Police Department organized a Martin Luther Day King March. This kind of police sponsored event presents a unique <coughs> trust building opportunity that cannot adequately be assessed by quantitative measures. It presents unique opportunities for qualitative research that explores the impact of such an event on both those who are policed and those who are doing police, policing. As implemented in San Diego, neighborhood policing is a form of community policing that incorporates a problem-solving or problem-oriented approach, also known as POP. POP has been identified as one of the most strongest evidence-based policing, policing approaches, but some policing scholars acknowledge that problem-oriented policing may be an overused term and that many police departments attempts to utilize what they identify as problem-oriented policing fail because the police agency decides the problem it wants to address without talking to the community or because the police favor the use of one particular method over others. A properly designed neighborhood policing approach allows police departments to tailor policing service and enforcement techniques to the unique needs of distinct neighborhoods. Recognition of these unique needs requires more than computerized maps of calls for service or crime complaints. It requires the establishment of genuine relationships with many different kinds of community residents. Models of this type of community engagement already exist. In Detroit, this meant police officers volunteering to mentor the children of incarcerated parents. In Orlando, it meant a chief going door to door to invite housing project residents to a meeting in their community room with the ultimate purpose of successfully solving a triple homicide. In Houston, it meant establishing a phone line for residents to chat with the chief. In Philadelphia, it meant police partnering with a community development organization to help community residents reclaim a local park for, from drug dealers. In Salt Lake, it meant the chief reaching out to the immigrant community to assure them that their immigration status would not interfere with their rights as crime victims. And in San Diego, it meant utilizing hundreds of volunteers to facilitate the connection between police department and community residents. Since I'm nearly out of time, I want to point out two other things. That much of the credit for crime reduction has gone to police departments, but over time, communities have invested in their own crime reduction techniques. In New York, 25 cure violence approaches that have been used in neighborhoods have demonstrated that in communities where the cure violence or Chicago ceasefire model exists, homicides are down 18%, and in the neighborhoods where they do not exist, homicides are up 69%. The bulk of police experts are white males, and this presents an imbalance in who is studying policing and who is being policed. My recommendations are that the federal government fund the piloting of neighborhood policing strategies in urban departments, that it creates a commission Oh, and, and creates a manual and consulting team on how to engage in neighborhood policing. That it provide federal evaluations for those pilots and that the principal investigators for those evaluations must include researchers of color, particularly blacks. That the mandated, excuse me, the mandated of neighborhood policing programs shall be a training ground for the development of police researchers of color. And last but not least, that urban youth who are policed most shall be funded to hold summits that report back to the federal government how neighborhood policing has impacted their lives in their communities. Thank you. Our next witness is Dr. Dennis Rosenbaum, University of Illinois at Chicago. Thank you, members of the President's Task Force, for this invitation to speak. Community policing has come a long way since we wrote a book on this topic 20 years ago, but we have failed to acknowledge how the aggressive tactics used 
recently to suppress crime in hotspots, which have been quite effective, by the way, have caused significant collateral damage in minority communities. As a result of saturation patrols, investigatory traffic stops, stop and frisk, and increased arrests, young people of color have only one image of the police and receive only one message. We're suspicious of you and we're watching every move you make. Briefly, I will propose a solution to this problem which I call Respectful Engaged Patrol, or REP for short. This is a new version of foot patrol that includes a complete program of behavior change. REP policing acknowledges the positive aspects of hotspots policing and broken windows and incorporates the key elements of community and problem-oriented policing and procedural justice. This approach should simultaneously reduce crime and build community trust. No doubt, REP policing is being practiced by many officers today, but we need to take a more systematic approach if we expect to achieve widespread implementation. Here are the basic components. Component one, training. REP policing would begin by thoroughly training officers in the social competencies required for effective human communication and rapport building. This includes everything from social etiquette and procedural justice to resolving interpersonal conflict. Officers would be required to practice these techniques the same way they practice on the firing range, repeating the behaviors over and over until they have reached a level of proficiency. To be clear, this training does not exist today. The training would also cover bias regarding race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, social class, and mental illness to avoid insensitive responses that are perceived as derogatory, demeaning, or threatening. Finally, officers will be trained in problem-oriented policing in small geographic areas, something which has been lost in the road to reform. Component number two, implementation. Rep officers would be encouraged to initiate positive contacts with people on the street under the supervision of experienced trainers. Officers would be expected to engage young people in conversation, not interrogation. There are no shortcuts to developing rapport. The rep officers must invest many hours walking the beat, talking to people before they will be respected and trusted. Component three, evaluation and feedback. We know that individual and organizational change requires strong feedback loops that continually shape behavior, and these are missing for most programs. First, I'm proposing that rep officers, as part of field training, wear body cameras. Trainers will review the videos and provide feedback to the rep officers weekly. In addition to positive reinforcement, trainers will point out specific behavior patterns where improvement is needed. Second, rep officers will use smartphones to collect contact information to build a knowledge base about the community and to generate phone-based satisfa satisfaction surveys. These technology-based feedback systems will not only help to achieve the desired social skills, but will provide a system of accountability for the department. Some closing comments. For more than a century and a half, foot patrol was a nasty and brutish exercise of police authority. It was revisited in the 1980s as a form of community policing with some evidence that it could reduce fear of crime and recently has shown promise in Philadelphia as a tool for reducing violent crime. Now, in light of the task force mission, I strongly encourage you to take foot patrol to the next level, going beyond aggressive enforcement to create more positive encounters with people on the street. The potential benefits of respectful engaged policing are numerous. Police can be in the long process of restoring respect, trust, and legitimacy in minority neighborhoods. Officers can, take, can engage in serious problem-oriented policing that is not possible inside the squad car to address local crime and disorder problems. Stop and frisk can be used more judiciously as officers learn the social ecology of the neighborhood and quickly distinguish youth who are innocent bystanders from those who are repeat troublemakers. Minority youth will feel they are being treated more fairly and not singled out. They will, this will result in more cooperation, less resistance, greater willingness to obey the law, fewer arrests, less minority confinement, fewer lawsuits, more officer safety, and more positive media coverage. Fewer juvenile arrests will decrease the criminogenic effects of contact with the criminal justice system and reduce the massive system overload. Finally, please give serious attention to building the type of training and management program I've outlined here. I would propose a randomized trial with several U.S. cities to demonstrate the utility of the REP model of community policing. We would be happy to work with the President's Task Force to build this new program. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rosenbaum. 
And our final speaker on this panel is Dr. Wes Skogan from Northwestern University. I, I detect a Chicago bias on this panel. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Uh, in my prepared remarks, I tried to address the question of what happened to community policing. Uh, as, as new ideas go in community policing, it's really quite old. It dates from somewhere in the middle of the 1980s. Community policing is also perhaps the one idea in American policing that's proven to have worldwide legs. Uh, it's really transformed the way policing is done in democracies throughout the world. So we've had a, a, a huge export industry uh, in the area of community policing as well. What's not clear is where community policing is on the agenda today in American cities. Uh, the first problem, of course, is that cities started going bust in, in the wake of the Great Recession. Um, the routine operations of police departments are almost all locally funded. Um, and when house prices dropped and retail sales dropped off, so did municipal revenues. Uh, by 2010, depending on the study, anywhere between half and three quarters of police departments reported that their budgets had been cut, typically in the range of five to, to eight percent. Now, laying off officers is really hard, but freezing vacancies, cutting programs, and refocusing staff priorities is less hard. So that's what most of them did. Now, some argue in the age of retrenchment, which is what we've been in, policing has to, re has to revert to something they might call its core functions, which certainly could include jettisoning a commitment to community policing. Certainly, it's not hard to find reports of cities that abandoned their community policing units and closed their storefront offices. Uh, but as the years go by, uh, this is increasingly short-sighted. Uh, we know that how police relate to the general public affects even their crime-fighting effectiveness. The police need people to cooperate with them, to follow their directions in moments of crisis, to report crimes promptly, to step forward as bystanders and witnesses when they have something to contribute. In 2014, how many homicides did not get solved because no snitching was the rule, even among those who knew and perhaps even loved uh, the victim? The federal government has tried to play some part in fixing this problem. The, the Community Oriented Policing Services offices uh, awarded $124 million to agencies across the country to hire or rehire officers for community policing posts. But in the scope of things across the country, that's not very much money, and finding even those dollars was hard, and it was in the program is only temporary. Um, in, in policing, programs have to be a local agenda item. They have to be a local priority. A second factor, I think, involved in declining attention to community policing was that the, the what we might, we might call the innovation agenda space started to get really crowded. In 1987, it was basically community, community policing versus a kind of an earlier professional model. And that was under fire for having encouraged kind of aloofness and a wee they gap between the police and the public. But by the end of the 2000s, the list of ideas that are, that are competing for attention in the area of policing has really grown. Just to make a quick list, problem-oriented policing, procedural justice policing, predictive policing, intelligence-oriented policing, evidence-based policing, turn page, hot spots policing, uh, and even what I'll call metrics-driven policing, or CompStat. Anti-terror policing got thrown into the hopper as well, and boxing agencies into enforcing immigration laws didn't help. For, for off, it often has demands that run afoul of the community policing agenda. I sympathize with the chiefs who have to sort through all this, sort of deciding what they can do, what they can afford. Uh, a useful trick is sometimes these agendas involve different parts of their organization, and they can do more than one thing uh, at a time. Uh, procedural justice policing, for example, focuses specifically on the encounters between police and the public when, they, when, they, when they're stopped as speeders or when they call in as victims. Uh, and there, what the rank and file needs is training. Uh, by contrast, community policing emphasizes working with organizations and institutions and it importantly involves district commanders, liaison officers, and even representatives of other city agencies. So agencies can do more than one thing at a time. There's plenty of support for community policing among both the general public and in the agencies. It's difficult to find a town even today where the chief doesn't claim to be doing community policing. She always wants to have a program that she can, appoint, that she can point to. And this is because the voters and the taxpayers really expect this to be so. Uh, when you read about cities that have cut their um, community policing units, they always claim that they're going to continue to do community policing. Uh, and the good news is that between the public support and the existing infrastructure within many organizations, it might be possible to breathe new life into community policing in a relatively short period of time, if there is the political will. We also find that there's support for community policing within police organizations around the country. 
as part of a group that's conducted a, a surveys of police officers in, in 84, 84 police departments involving 16,000 officers, we found that in a big majority of organizations, police officers themselves report that their bosses, the guys at the top of the organization, uh, are telling them to stick with community policing. That's a message that they're getting from the top of their own agencies. And we found that 75% of them th themselves think that community policing is a good idea. By now, police officers have grown up with this. This is what they've had all their time. Now, legitimacy is one of the most important products of policing. Um, and it's, the policing has improved immensely over the last 30 years. Police are more effective at fighting crime. They're less corrupt. They're better equipped. They're less likely to unlawfully shoot people. They're much more professional and sophisticated. The problem is that none of this shows up in public opinion. Uh, the ratings of police uh, haven't changed in virtually 30 years. And the racial disparities in this, the, the racial gaps in, in support for the police, haven't shrunk at all uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, compared to the late 1960s, uh, public support for the police is actually down by 17 percentage points. So either the public hasn't noticed all these great improvements have been made in policing, or they have other agenda items that have not been dealt with. And I think one of those is going to be uh, legitimacy. Um, crime has dropped like a stone in this country for, for 20 years, and it hasn't perked up public opinion at all. Um, what people want is that, to know that they can trust their police to do the right thing, to, to address the problems that really concern them, and that, and that they get reasonable treatment when their paths come across. And community policing and the, and the programs that go with it uh, remain our core tool for ensuring this kind of legitimacy. I look forward to the task force's recommend, recommendations in this regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Scogan. We're turning now to the questions, uh, and I wanted to clarify one thing. There was a question about this uh, at our Cincinnati listening session. Uh, we call on, uh, Commissioner Ramsey and I call on our task force members for questions in the order in which they have indicated to us that they have a question. Uh, and that's uh, logical, I would say. Uh, we're starting here with Roberto Villasenor, followed by Tracy Mears. Roberto? Thank you. This is primarily directed towards Dr. Rosenbaum, um, but all of you can feel free to weigh in on this. Dr. Rosenbaum, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your comments about the benefits of community policing and what we should do to try and enact that. But as I listen to them, you talk about police officers having time and being required to get out of their cars and talk with the community, um, body-worn cameras and the benefits that they provide, the issuance of smartphones to all officers out there. These would all be great alternatives to employ, however, they're quite costly. Then I listened to Dr. Skogan, and he talks about the reduction in funding over the years and the lack of emphasis on community policing that that had to translate to as chiefs tried to bring their departments down within budget. So looking at those two opposing thought process or realities, when you put that into play and address it to the recommendations, what do you think is the most important aspect or one of the most important aspects that we need to concentrate on that's within the realm of possibility for the funding we have? Well, thank you. Um, that's a good question. Um, a couple comments. One, I think we need to redo the training. I mean, the training uh, has not been done. It's a bunch of talking heads that we all do well at. Uh, and we need to practice just like they do on the shooting range. I know that Sue has done some of this in Washington. We need to model some of this uh, stuff. So that can be done without the technology. But I think the systems, to me, it's a matter of priorities. You know, um, it, these things don't have to be implemented immediately. They can be implemented over time. And we, need to, we definitely need field tests first. I mean, cameras are a, a complicated business. We've had very little research on cameras, just a few studies. Uh, but they have a, I'm arguing they're a potential tool for performance enhancement. Just like professional athletes watch themselves on video over and over and over to get it right. And so we can do that. But, you know, we can, uh, it's a, priorities are the last comment I want to make about cities and leadership. Uh, you know, a lot of cities are spending millions and millions of dollars on consent decrees now. You know, eight, ten million dollars. Uh, it's expensive. So I think in the end it will be cost effective, I would argue. Dr. Skogan, did you or others on the panel want to weigh in on this? No, I think that um, because policing has been and will continue to be large, a, a very locally funded 
uh, branch of government. I mean, it's about 90, 90, about 92 percent of their total revenue goes to uh, their total budget goes to, to staff. Um, it's got to be a local priority. We need to find ways to uh, to stimulate, to to awaken interest, to provide technical assistance, uh, to link community policing, as Dennis Rosenbaum has suggested, to link community policing to. Uh, other exciting technological things that are happening in today's environment because that will also perk the interest of officers and perk the interest of the public. Um, but we have, to, we have to find ways of, of, of keeping it high on the local agenda. And that's inevitably is what's going to have to be done in the, in the world of policing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Bill Geller? You have to expand the playing field for where your assets are coming from. Um, if, I remember being on an uh, airplane and uh, it was a very short flight attendant and she was struggling to get a bag up into the overhead. So she asked a tall passenger if he would help her and he did and the problem was solved. So there are, there are a lot of assets around communities. They don't have to be within the police department. They don't have to be within the government. There's people that have know-how, that have resources, that can donate things. Uh, I'm not focusing particularly on the, how you're going to pay for the body-worn cameras. I'm, I'm making a more general point. Um, that if the police and the community, in a very robust way of understanding the nature and scope of the community, are in this together, there are a lot of assets. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are hidden in plain sight. I, I would like to address that. I think that the examples that I offered of actions that police chiefs around the country have engaged in don't involve things and don't involve money. It involves building relationships with communities of color. And since those are the communities that we tend to police most rigorously, I think that we need to spend more time with the relational piece that doesn't cost a lot of money. And that's why my recommendation for neighborhood policing. Thank you. Our next questioner is Tracy Mears, followed by Sean Smoot. So my question actually builds on your comments. And uh, the jumping off point is um, Wes Scogin's um, observation that policing is fundamentally local. And so we are constituted as a task force to advise President Obama uh, with respect to national recommendations. And one way of understanding your comments today, I'm going to leave Wes's uh, to the side for the moment. The first three presentations were really um, sort of best practices. This is, uh, these are best practices of how to do policing locally. Um, but one of the tough problems that we have been wrestling with over the last few weeks is to sort of think about going beyond just mentioning, you know, follow best practices. You've, given lists of different places where people do great work. I think yours was the most extensive, uh, Bill. Uh, if, I, I would love to hear what um, any one of you has to say, so this isn't for any particular person, about how to think about what the federal government in particular could do, or if not the federal government, um, some kind of recommendation we might be able to offer to um, the states to help, now I'm going back to West Gogan's remarks, um, incentivize uh, localities to make this a priority. I know, and this will be the last thing I say, um, that in some cases, state legislation can actually um, present particular hurdles. Um, so maybe one thought is to, to make sure that um, those hurdles go away. But um, if you could sort of go beyond these are the best practices of, of particular localities and, and help us to think through an infrastructure for either incentivizing or maybe even mandating it, that would be extremely helpful to me. I spent the first 20 years or so of my career working on deadly force issues and uh, advocating uh, for reductions in shootings of and by police. And I came to learn from my wife, who was a storyteller, that a box of statistic is usually trumped by a really good story. Um, in the uh, fractured federal government, um, I try to think not simply what could be done by executive order, but what could be done without having to sign your name at the bottom of a piece of paper. Um, you could, on a highly bipartisan basis, do the kind of storytelling that happens at State of the Union addresses where the president points to somebody's sister, widow, whatever, 
And these stories come alive, and what they, they make the country want to do is understand, how did that happen? Who made that possible? What family member, what village, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That you could, because everybody, every politician who holds the purse strings has people at home that they want to make heroes out of, so they will in turn, uh, you know, like the politician. It would be so easy if you announced topics of stories that, that demonstrate the impact of the innovations you want in police, community trust building, and so forth. It'd be so easy to get people of whatever political stripe holding up local heroes, whether they're cops or community members or something else, and doing the kind of massive storytelling that Hollywood knows how to do, that good politicians know how to do, um, pre ministers know how to do. Um, and uh, the, the, the apparatus of the federal government, once a story gets above the fold on the front page, or is, is the lead story on the evening TV news, or you know, whatever other form of social media, the federal government knows how to respond. They know how to develop programs, they know how to budget and so forth. What you need is, is blocks of the country saying, I want some of that, how do I get me some? Um, I would like to follow, I do think storytelling is important, but I think it's more important after we have an established body of demonstrated knowledge on a particular thing. I know social science research is slow, but the federal, back to your question, the, 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 the role of the federal government, in my opinion, is to take the best knowledge, <coughs> develop these demonstrations, and evaluate them on a, in a scientific way. You get the best minds of police executives, community leaders together, put together these demonstration programs of how you would make the difference, try them out in a number of cities, evaluate them, and show that it made a difference. Philadelphia has done this, Foot Patrol, various cities have done this over time. You've mentioned examples. And I think that we have, well, there's a little bit of work to be done here. The body cameras are just so unknown at this point. I think they're great tools. Um, they're gonna change the whole game. Just the way cars change the game, radios change the game. Citizens and police are gonna be on good behavior as soon as these body cams that's my hypothesis. I could be wrong. It may be undermined. It may be all kinds of reasons why it doesn't work. Um, but I think that uh, these training programs, we need a concerted, we, we, we generally have these, and the, one of the problems, Bill, I agree with you, that stories are powerful. And um, we, we, 30, the, the, in 19, whatever it was, 30 years after the President's Commission, we went to Washington to discuss progress, and I think it was an attorney in the audience stood up and said, the reason you guys with all your charts and statistics haven't made a difference is that you haven't put a human face on suffering. And I thought, well, what is that? You know, it's really amazing. It was a powerful statement. We do need to do that. There's no question about it, too, when we get to the point of dissemination. On the other hand, frankly, I find that police departments historically have just uh, unfortunately been a little bit sheepish. I grew up on a farm in Oregon, so I can talk about sheep. And, and some, somebody puts something out there, and everybody follows as if it's got scientific support for it that it's going to work, when in fact a lot of these things are, are, could be dangerous in the long run. Thank you. Uh, Do Dr. Jones-Brown, did you want to weigh in on this? Yes, I do. So the um, suggestion in my original testimony in January that the federal government mandate um, the piloting of neighborhood policing strategies, of course, anticipated that there would be funding that police departments would apply for to um, implement a neighborhood policing strategy. Um, also, the, my recommendation is that the federal government fund um, or commission a how-to neighborhood policing manual and put together a consulting team. We already have the great minds of very good uh, police chiefs, current and former, who have done amazing work it's just not all together in one place. I think that manual, um, based on the activities of the consulting team, would provide a blueprint for um, local agencies engaging in um, what I've been suggesting. I think it is absolutely important that the federal government become involved in the training of researchers of color in the area of policing work. I think it is very disheartening to know that so many people of color get policed, but so few researchers about policing uh, are people of color. 
and that's certainly something that the federal government could get behind um, funding. And the idea that the federal government would actually fund these youth summits where they come and take talk around the nation about how policing is impacting their lives is all doable, in my opinion. Anything to add? There's no shortage of stories and documentation. The office that uh, Ron Davis directs has been producing uh, uh, summaries and descriptions and reports and, and documentation on effective, apparently effective community policing projects for, for more than 20 years. It's a huge, it's a huge pile of these. Uh, what we lack in policing is the ability to translate from the research and from the documentation to actual practice. I think we all understand the reasons for this. Police departments are not good at learning in abstract ways. They're not good at remembering things over a decade that they've learned in abstract ways. They're very sensitive, very quickly responsive to turnovers in leadership and finding new directions often for no particularly good <coughs> fair idea. Uh, what we lack is a kind of a, of a upper, upper management, mid-upper management infrastructure of people who've been to regional training centers, who've been to national training centers, who've taken some uh, some training both in how to figure out what their priorities are and what, what are the best strategies for tackling them. Um, and so things like the Washington State a centralized training facility provides a kind of a leverage point for a whole state. Uh, and if we had a, a dozen leverage points like that around the country that would bring together uh, the, 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 the rising mid-level managers uh, and, and, and help, help them understand uh, what the alternatives are and what the research looks like, that would, that would be worth a lot. And it would have to be long term, it would have to be this decade, it would have to be the next decade. But we don't, we don't invest in, um, in change management, which among other things requires bringing people from across uh, departments. Uh, here Britain is a very good model, but there's a whole different labor market where people move at the management level from organization to organization, and carry with them the centralized training that they get at Brams Hill and other places. Uh, and, we simply, and we simply lack that. Um, so I think that it's really, a, it's really a question of identifying these leverage centers where people can be brought together uh, and, and, make it, and make it part of being a successful manager that you've been to these kind of places. You could also try to build it into existing programs that already take place in, in places like Quantico, well, which, for, to which police officers have been going for 30 years, uh, and see to it that that's part of the agenda there as well. But I think that's, to me, the focus has got to be at that building a, a tradition of mid-level management of high flyers uh, who understand and are, more, are committed to this kind of enterprise. Uh, thank you so much. Sean Smoot will be followed by Jose Lopez. Um, first of all, I want to thank the panel for your testimony this morning. It's been very, very insightful and appreciate the effort and, and the, uh, uh, the thought that went into it. Um, I, so you've, you've really identified very well, I think, what some good practices would be and, frankly, some of the hurdles that are created by the competition for resources that, that communities across the country are experiencing. And so I, I, you've danced around this uh, quite a bit, but I would ask if you could identify uh, with some specificity a benchmarking uh, recommendation in terms of how, me how would we measure the success uh, of a community policing program and I think somebody mentioned uh, the, the homicide rate. We've heard testimony, I don't, you know, with medical advances and stuff, maybe measuring shootings is more accurate than measuring how many people die uh, now. Uh, and that's certainly an argument that's, that's floating around. But I, I just, I'd like to hear from each of you if you have a thought of, of a specific uh, benchmark that, that could be used to show Look, this is this is if you're doing this, it's you're successful. I would like to just uh, first say that we've uh, through the National Police Research Platform in like 55 cities, we've tested um, a new metric that has to do with the quality of police citizen contacts, and so it measures procedural justice, the, th the kind of things Tracy and others have been working on, measures and officers. Uh, from the perspective of citizen, these are sort of fancy customer satisfaction surveys. But we have no national metrics on things other than crime. I mean, so it's, if we're going to say these things are important, as we do every time we get together, why don't we measure them? And why don't we get cities to have metric scores on these things, volunteers? And 
and give them feedback. The feedback part, the translation part that Wes is referring to has been missing as well. And so that's something I would advocate. We also, and Wes has been part of this and through the platform in 100 American cities, have taken the pulse of the internal culture, the, the, the level of cynicism, their views of the community, whether they believe in community policing. Um, we should know how police are feeling. You know, oftentimes you'll hear the police culture is the main obstacle to reform and innovation. Is that true? Can we change the police culture? Can we get more positive at what, what why are people unhappy in police organizations? That's a whole nother discussion. But, but I think that that's part of the metric system. We should have ongoing measures of these things. This is just my opinion. There's also a move afoot to turn the National Crime Victimization Survey a bit to this topic as well. Uh, there's a group now working on, on forming questions that would go into the national sample. They interview about 70,000 people every six months. Uh, and to, 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 to date, they don't ask about police service. They don't ask about, uh, about people's interface with the police. But the, the, in perhaps two and a half years, because things work slowly with the Census Bureau, uh, the National Crime Survey will have police questions, which will provide us a nationwide benchmark, urban, suburban, rural, uh, major metropolitan area statistics, uh, and that will provide a kind of a comparison point against which police departments can kind of judge where they stand. Good. Jose Lopez, uh, and he'll be followed by Sue Rohr. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. It, when I need to figure out how to um, build yardsticks, I hire people like the other three folks. Um, what I'm concerned about is that the focus is not just on things so close in to the police world. I think that um, I'd like to hire um, these folks to be sure that livability, quality of life metrics, like they have in Charlotte, for example, um, are really measuring the quality of neighborhood life. And there's things that have nothing whatsoever, apparently, to do with policing that are in those data. And yet, good policing should make a difference in the experienced quality of life for residents of the neighborhood. So uh, I'm not disagreeing with any of those things. But let's figure out what the lived experience in a neighborhood that is, is beleaguered with crime and distrust and all of the other stuff is, and let's figure out how you would know if things are getting better and what contribution the police are making to that. If Again, if you think of the police as stepping beyond their normal roles, not in a way that's expensive, in a way that's decent, because they live in the community too, often, um, then all kinds of things occur to you that are, that are measures of how we're doing. So to your point of the difference in um, reductions in homicide as opposed to reductions in shootings, one of the community-based anti-crime uh, programs that I was talking about from New York actually measures reductions in shootings. And so one of the things that they can claim that in a particular neighborhood, and this is why um, I'm pushing this neighborhood policing piece, is that in this particular neighborhood that was known for a high number of shootings, once this program took effect, there were one year and a day went by with no shootings. And so while overall, when you combine other neighborhoods with the New York stats, things didn't look as good, but that's a pretty good stat. I think the other thing that's really important, we are here because people died. And in at least one of the cases in Staten Island, it is clear to many of us that that's a death that should not have occurred. Um, and so one of the ways we can measure whether police departments are being successful, if we can reduce the number of incidents in which any segment of the population believes that the police has engaged in behavior that was unnecessary. The other thing as a lawyer, the number of lawsuits and the amount of money that police departments are paying out in complaints and civil tort claims um, in New York exceeded all other departments, governmental departments in 2009, that's not a good thing. And that's something we can measure. If we can reduce that, that would be an indicator that things are, are better, that there's more community well-being. Thank you. 
Jose? Yeah, I think that I think that the Garner case in talking about a, a death that definitely should not have happened um, lends itself to the question that I have. And I feel like this conversation around kind of fair policing, respectful policing, uh, relationship-based policing is something that we've heard across all panels in every city that we've stopped in. Uh, I, but I'm still having trouble kind of wrapping my own head around it, right? I, I mean, I work with young people and I'm a young person um, who, who has not had many good interactions with police officers. Um, I don't know that I'm in a place and I don't know that many of the folks that I'm working with are in a place where we want to open ourselves up to have a good relationship, right? To, to, um, to build a sustainable relationships with the very same folk who are coming in and killing innocent men like Eric Garner. Um, and so my question, I guess my question, I want to hear a little bit from you all about understanding kind of where we are and where we would want to be, which is this responsible and relationship-based policing model. But it seems like there's something in the middle um, that's missing uh, that we need to talk about that could help get us there. Um, and I know kind of you've referenced um, you know, the, the crime intervention model, uh, but I'm just wondering, you know, uh, what needs to happen uh, in order for us in communities across the country to get to this point that you're talking about where we're seeing relationship-based policing? Um, is, is it, you know, uh, I, for me, I'm just thinking about, you know, I don't know that we can get there in New York City and Dolores, you and I sit at a lot of the same tables there. I don't know that we can get there based on the current departmental infrastructure that the NYPD has, right? When we're talking about, you know, broken windows policing, when we're talking about stop and frisk, when we're talking about quotas, knowing that, and I think community members um, are, are kind of uh, more sophisticated now across the country in what they're calling for because they know those things. It, it's, it's hard for me to think about how we get to what you're talking about when bad policy and bad practice exists, which seems to be the hurdle. I can start by, uh, I, I do want to say that the comments I made about being on the street, that's long term. It's going to take years before they, the, the young people on the street feel that these are good cops. So you got to start somewhere. So that's, that's one thing. I agree with you, though, and New York is, is different maybe than the rest of the country, I don't know, but the, the, what I think has in common is poli people also lack trust that the police, uh, in we haven't talked enough about this really, that, that there's accountability for officers' behavior, that people, that good cops get rewarded and bad cops get punished, and that, um, and so I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the settlement agreements with the Justice Department, we tend to think, well, that city has a problem and let's just let them solve it. What did we learn from all that? Why can't we extract the lessons from that? And they tend to revolve around accountability systems, having good training, that's the kind of training we're talking about that isn't there, having, inter having early intervention systems, early warning systems for officers that have repeat problems, uh, and what's done about that. And when there's a use of force, uh, report or a complaint of use of force, what is the after action review? What is being done to, to hold people accountable, to retrain them, to send them back? How thoroughly are we taking this seriously so the public has trust that the police is pol are policing themselves and, that's where, and that they're transparent about that process, that they're open about that process and that, that they, and so I think that's part of it too, getting your internal house together and being open and honest about what you're doing to retrain, to recruit, select, you know, train, supervise, uh, discipline your people. Uh, and, ha and believing that, having the public believe that what you're doing is adequate and sufficient. Now the cities that are under review by DOJ Civil Rights Division, they're doing all these things, or they're trying to, because somebody's watching. I think why can't we do that proactively around the country without having the Department of Justice involved? Uh, Bill Geller. <clears throat> the notion that relationships could form among people who are really alienated from each other 
um, based on experiences, based on rumor. Um, some people communicate mostly by rumor, as we know. Um, it calls for examples of where very difficult relationships have been flipped into good ones. Connie Rice, what are the odds that you and Bill Bratton would have hooked up? What are the odds that instead of throwing bombs over the wall, you'd be parking in the basement of the LAPD headquarters um, and part of the solution? So, I mean, my approach, I mean, I don't, and sometimes it's data driven, sometimes it's, often it's not, is um, find things that seem to have worked spectacularly well. Find neighborhoods. I mean, I don't understand cities. I, am, I understand families, I think. Certainly we have relationships that have improved within families among people that didn't like sitting down to the dinner table together. I understand neighborhoods a little bit. Wes understands them much better than I do. Um, but find examples and penetrate the causes of success. I mean, my father was a labor mediator for his career. In the 1940s, there'd be government study after study uh, from the Labor Department on the causes of industrial strife. Somebody finally did a, a study on the causes of industrial peace. So find things that work and dissect them and figure out who done it, how'd they do that, what made it happen. Now, you're talking about young people. They're different than Connie Ray. She's youthful, but, you know, but young people's <laughs> brains are developing. You know, no, I'm old. <laughs> where, where, where Tracy works, you have the, the Yale Child Study Center. I mean, they're people that understand the differences between adults and children. And I, I would not pretend to say that what I'm thinking about in terms of adults will work the same way. But that, that's what I would urge is instead of proceeding from an unmanageably complicated problem, find pockets of excellence, find pockets of success whether it's within a church, it's within any, you know, the kind of stuff that Brian Stevenson's doing. Find things that work and say, how did that happen? What's in that black box, pardon the expression? And so hence my recommendation for the how-to manual and using people who have made it work. So um, if you ever have an opportunity to talk to Val Demings, she said when she invited those folks in the housing development to come to a meeting with her, she never thought they would show up and when she got to the meeting, it was standing room only. And she went from a uh, complex where she had a triple homicide to by the time she left office, the most serious complaint was a noise complaint. So it's been done. And I guess what's most frustrating for me, having done this work for so long, is that we keep acting like we have to reinvent a wheel rather than comprehensively bringing together the evidence that already exists and then doing the additional rigorous research that uh, Dennis is talking about. We have the formulas. People have done it. We just have to make sure that we push their agenda as opposed to some of the other agendas that are being pushed in policing. And it can't be about things. For people of color who are being policed, they are really not interested in a lot of things, and many of them can afford a lot of things. They want a police department that cares about them, they want a police department that listens to them. They want a police department that's willing to work with them rather than work at them or do things to them and for them. They're not children. They have capacity. They want to join with the police to make their community safer. And again, I re want to reemphasize those anti-violence community-based programs that are already working. They need to get more publicity. They need to be studied more reported about more, and supported more. Oh, Wes Gogan, did you want to weigh in on that? Well, thank you. Did you have anything else to say? Okay. Sue Rohr, and then she'll be followed by uh, Brian Stevenson. Thank you. I have actually two questions. My first one is for Dr. Rosenbaum, and it's a little bit of a challenge on the question, and that is, on what do you base your statement that there's no training currently available? On, on teaching better social interaction skills? Well, I didn't quite, if that's what I said, I, what I, let me clarify that. So, um, mo first of all, general statement about training overall. Um, most training in this country is, if you look at the academies are, and we need more research on training even, but uh, first of all, it's, the ones I've observed, it's just, uh, um, there is scenario-based training, but it's usually around certain encounters of force. 
Um, it's not about the social interaction skills. Now, uh, secondly, there have been very few controlled rigorous evaluations. You can count them on one hand of, of the effectiveness of training and policing, which is a shock. Um, third, um, there are some innovative things, I think, coming out of your shop and out of the folks at DARPA, because uh, I was involved in that as well as a consultant to DARPA, that is really pushing the envelope about what needs to be done. I think that's the kind of stuff uh, where we uh, get deeper into the woods on this as far as what goes on in human interaction. It's, you know, introducing yourself, dealing with issues that come up. There's so much complexity involved in these interactions. Uh, most complaints against the police are not used to force their rudeness, right? I mean, people, police are rude. And how can we just start there? What, what goes on uh, in that dynamic? The body cams will answer this question. <laughs> uh, but, the, um, but I think that, uh, and it's not been implemented and evaluated, I guess. That's, I would like to see the kind of work that's being done out in, in Washington and other places uh, and uh, done, more systematically evaluated. And um, I think it's a start. And I, there was something else I was going to say, and I've forgotten uh, my main point, but I'll okay. think of it in a second. Just to reassure you, it is being evaluated <laughs> We're in the process. Okay. So with, with that in mind, the fact that there are, there actually is training out there about social interaction, I would, I would ask all of you, what is the relative um, importance, though, of that specific training about neuroscience and human behavior within the culture of policing? What's the role of culture? If you, if you train all these great social interaction skills, but you have a culture that is very much focused on broken windows, counting quotas and statistics. I'd, I'd like your opinions on the relative value of working on the culture, where that, how that balances with training. Well, you've already mentioned two kinds of culture. One is a kind of a management culture. When you turn culture into, uh, into performance metrics, CompStat, and then that, that, of course, raises the question of is what's measured matters. Um, and what Dennis Rosenbaum was describing to you was a system that in 55 cities, they're now measuring what matters in an important way when it comes to police citizen uh, encounters. So there's models out there for doing that. There's a second meaning of culture here, which has to do with the sort of operational culture of policing. Um, this is something that's been written at, written at, at tremendous length by, athlete, by, by academics um, without recognizing that the world of policing has changed a lot in the last 20 years. The police departments are much more diverse. Um, uh, there's much, there are many more multiple agendas going on. Um, and so that um, uh, while, while the, 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 the dimensions of traditional police culture are strong, um, it's, it's, it's certainly possible to find leverage points and find ways to, to push organizations forward. The key for, for officers has to be training. I mean, what do police departments do? They're a human service organization. They hire, they train, they supervise, they can't fire anybody. So they hire, they train, they supervise. Um, and so it's one of the big three is training. And so I, that, if I was picking a focus, uh, it would be the development and um, promulgation of training programs as being something that departments already do. They already have to do it. They already have time in the agenda space for it. Um, uh, they have the, the mechanisms for delivering it. Uh, so sort of Im improving the quality and and, and content of it would be among the simpler things we could do, actually, uh, because the delivery mechanism is already in place. So I would focus very heavily on training. Bill? Just like I don't understand something as complicated as a whole city, I don't understand something as complex as the culture of a whole police department, and I don't care if it's a 14-officer police department. Um, I think... I'm sorry? Are there some mileposts about cultures that you could point to as, rather than describe the entire culture? Are there some characteristics that? Well, I think I, I would approach the changing the police culture um, in the same narrow scale that I would approach rebuilding communities that are troubled. Um, Susan Herman, who's now working for the NYPD as a deputy commissioner, I forget her title, but she's the point person it's an invented deputy commissioner position to try to improve police community. Yeah. 
she said years and years ago when working for a previous NYPD commissioner, I think the first African-American commissioner the city ever had, that in a democratic society, there's nothing quite like a good cop and there's nothing quite like a bad cop. Um, their capacity to help or hurt individuals, families, neighborhoods um, is remarkable. I would argue that if you're gonna to try to get some sense of a general police culture, that the, the kind of people Susan was talking about, the good cops and the bad cops, are each, to a certain extent, breaking the rules. So you'll find, uh, and, and I know the police executives know this, you have your outliers, and most of the police executives' time is spent with a percentage, a small percentage of problem employees. But the good cops are also bending the rules. They're fighting the culture in order to connect in an authentic way with people that they'd probably go to church with. You know, they, they know these people. They live in the neighborhood. And, and again, once again, I would say find the ones that are bending the rules, bending the culture, whether it's at the individual officer level or the unit level or whatever it is, figure out what they're doing that works and figure out whether they're breaking rules that ought to be changed. You know, and the culture, of course, is not a, a written thing, but that's, that's the way I would try to approach this, is figure out the level, make your, make your solution at a level of um, focus where change is actually possible. I, th I think the focus needs to be on police leadership, and um, Chief Ramsey has written a magnificent piece for NIJ that has the transformative quality or the ability to transform um, other police leaders who are not as innovative as the ones that I spoke about in my testimony. But as goes the leader, goes the department. And I think there are definitely ways in which we have to incentivize chiefs to take more risks, like the chiefs that I spoke about. And if they are willing to be more relational, I think that they can, in fact, either um, cause the bad officers who don't want to work for them to leave, or they can transform um, some of the officers who just want the support to be more relational um, as opposed to um, count things. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questioners and not a lot of time. Uh, so let me turn now to Brian Stevenson and he'll be followed wrapping it up with Cedric Alexander. Well, I just want to thank all of you. I, I found uh, all of you uh, made comments and, and had insights that are really helpful to me. I want to just return to this question of social distance because I think all of you are really talking about how do we create less distance between these institutions that uh, can create great distrust and great disarray and disruption in communities. Um, and I want to really pick up on Jose's question because a lot of our focus has been on how we get police officers better prepared uh, for greater intimacy with the communities that they serve. But I do think there is a comparable challenge in getting communities prepared to accept that intimacy. Uh, and I just want to kind of ask a, a couple things. Um, uh, Professor Jones-Brown, I was really intrigued by some of the examples you gave. And the one that really perked my ears up was this model in Detroit of officers uh, providing mentoring to the children of incarcerated parents. And there are a lot of features to that that really are interesting and exciting to me. But I'd be interested in knowing what kinds of strategies uh, were employed to get the families and the children open and interested in that kind of relationship and whether that kind of thinking is something that we can highlight as we kind of move forward. And, and, and also, um, uh, Professor uh, uh, Rosenbaum, you talked about this rep idea of initiating positive encounters with people on the street, which I do think has a lot of potential but I think there are communities, and I think Jose related to this, where people are cynical and suspicious and disbelieving that even an apparent positive encounter has the legitimacy that would make participating in that encounter a sensible choice. And in fact, proximity to the police in some communities is something that gets you in trouble. And so I'd like to hear more about what, if anything, we know about how to engage communities into these initiatives. If you do the initiatives without preparing the community, I think we're going to undermine uh, and uh, create uh, a poor outcomes that we, we really can avoid if we have some, some better thinking about that. So the elephant in the room is always a race. And um, I think one of the things that have made some of the initiatives that I talked about successful um, in terms of being able to bridge that gap is that they were chiefs of color. 
And so I think the importance of building researchers of, a, of color who can get the kind of evidence that will provide the answer to your question mm -hmm. um, is something that we currently lack, and hence the recommendation that I made. Mm -hmm. um, you've raised a really good point, and uh, you know, I think uh, there are many ways, of course, to, that the community could be prepared for a closer, intimate dialogue with the police. And some of it is through community open discussions, you know, through programs like, you know, CAPS that uh, uh, Commissioner Ramsey started in Chicago, uh, that there has to be a talk about race as well. Uh, the reconciliation work that's being done, I think, is good out of John Jay and other places. Uh, to have an honest, open apology about the history. You know, for 150, well, all the way back to slavery, police have been on the wrong side of justice until the 1960s. I mean, that's a fact. It's well established. Um, and that we have reasons to talk to you and interact with you other than investigations. And I think every police chief in every city in America has to re-examine our investigative stops approach. I think that's what is d divisive about race. Uh, it's not the traffic stop for speeding because that usually is treated fairly regardless of race. It's the investigative stops that I'm suspicious of you. And it turns out it's because of who I think you might be. And so when we stop putting and believing that that's the only way we can get solve crime in America, which we still rely on today as a predominant model, then, so we have some thinking to do in private, the police do, before they go to that meeting mm -hmm. about how we're going, why we would police. And you can solve problems, that, that my argument is that when you go out there and you're part of the community, you can find these resources that Bill's talking about, you can think up new programs jointly, as Dolores is saying, and, and so there's a lot of possibility there. Bill, if you can be very brief. I, th I don't think you prepare communities for um, relating to the police um, by giving them a hazmat suit to go into a contaminated area. I think you prepare them by the police listening carefully and using trusted sources in the community to find out what different parts of the community are trying to accomplish, what they believe in with all of their heart and soul, what they're working every day to do. And then the police coming say, can I help some kind of way? I'll leave it at that. Great. Cedric Alexander. Uh, yes, I'll try to be uh, <clears throat> quick in the interest of time. I'm not going to ask any questions, but I have several questions. So I'm going to end with some comments in terms of some observations that I've certainly uh, <clears throat> heard you all share. But for me, trying to formulate recommendations around what we need to do to uh, move policing forward in the 21st century. Here's some, I mean, you know, there's a lot of great things we know we have done well. What I'm challenged by, quite frankly, is the fact that the complexity of the things that you're talking about, I think, are much greater than what we give credence to. So, what do I mean by that? We can talk about what we need police to do, but I really think we have to share in terms of, I need to hear more of, and not necessarily from you all, but doing this whole process, of what more can community do? Uh, Jose and I sit on this task force panel together, and what unique about this is, is that he and I are generations apart. How he articulated, he experienced police in his generation and those that in his community, which he has a sense and take responsibility for, is very heartfelt that young people today uh, have to feel the, the way they feel towards police. They're not willing to extend an olive branch. But the fact of the matter is this, no matter what police do, if you don't reach back from the other side, it's not going to matter. So we gotta work through that piece. And in terms of the research itself, uh, the research that I've seen over the last number of years in many ways are, is written, but I don't find it very beneficial because it's, if I ask most of these chiefs out here, and be interesting with them coming up next, uh, how is it helping them? Most of them will probably say it's not because it just stays within the halls of academia but really does not move beyond those walls. And so therefore, it probably does not do them a great good deal of good. Here's the biggest issue for me, I think, in terms of trying to formulate these recommendations for our nation's president, is that these are real complex and convoluted and deep-seated issues. 
if Jose's generation is so angry about reaching out to the police, imagine what it is like for other people of color who's been experiencing it far longer, far greater, and generationally. But yet, they find a way still to reach out. I grew up in the 60s. Uh, I grew up during the civil rights era. Jose did not, but I did. But even though I, choose, I chose policing as a profession, I have many friends that did not. But we have to find a way in all of this to incorporate more of a community, quite frankly, that is gonna be just as willing to reach out because what has been done has been done. I think what we have to figure out is make sure that it doesn't happen continually again. And it still is happening in this country every day. It's just not being reported, maybe because we don't even have a reporting mechanism that's in place that really shares just what is going on out there in policing, at least not at a federal level anyway, it's not being reported. So this is really uh, heavy and convoluted, and, and I would ask you all with everything that you bring here today, and, and Dr. Scoggins, I think you pretty much narrowed it up for me earlier in your presentation where you say out of all, and I'm paraphrasing here, out of all that has been done, in terms of enhancing police, we're back at the same place. People asking the same questions. Out of all the work that's been done, the literature that's been written, we're still back here trying to figure out what it is that we do. But I did have one question, if I could, Madam Chair, uh, before I end here. In regards to your- Over time, if you can make it very quick. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Your ARA EP program. Have you employed that program in uh, Chicago? Uh, and if you have, have you had any results with it? I'm just curious. Uh, well, you know, there's uh, procedural justice training in Chicago. There's similar training out in Washington State. Um, but no, it has, not, it has not been implemented at okay. the level. This is what I'm talking about, where uh, police officers are trained at the academy repeatedly to deal with social interactions. Uh, with all kinds of folks. There are various programs that could be brought in, you know, CIT for handling right. cases of mental illness. You know, what, pieces of these things, so they all have a lot of truth to them. Bringing it all together, uh, getting people, so the answer is no. And, and one other piece I would also consider too is the fact that we also have to be mindful that we also have a public health issue in many of these communities. Mental health being one of them, poverty being one, like poor education being another. And I'll attribute to, because at the end of the day, police can do so much, very realistically. I think we really have to come to terms with that. They can only do so much, but there have to be other wraparound services as well, too, to help them to accomplish their mission if we want to make some real effective change in those communities. And that's all I have to say, Madam Chair. Thank well, you. thank you very much. Uh, my, my director here, Ron Davis, is telling me that we're running over. This, however, has been just a marvelous panel. Let's all join in thanking them. <laughs> oh, we're now gonna take a very crisp five-minute break uh, and be back for our next panel.
Now they need to cut them on. Here we got it. And we'll be starting in one minute. Okay, thank you all very much. We're going to get started again, the second panel for today, Building Community Policing Organizations. And as just a reminder for those of you um, viewing the proceedings, uh, bios of the panelists are available on the COPS website. Uh, so we will not be going into any detail around their uh, individual um, uh, bios. But it is really my honor and privilege to introduce our next set of panelists. And we're going to begin with um, Anthony Batts, Police Commissioner, Baltimore Police Department. Thank you very much. Here we are. Thank you very much for the opportunity, panelists. Thank you very much for allowing uh, us and myself to come before you. I'm not going to go over in, in great detail of uh, what our papers, my paper was or, or my thesis as we submitted. I'm going to go through some of the highlights and maybe touch upon some of the questions uh, that were raised last, times, um, uh, last time. My thought process is this, and I apologize to the panelists who I've known for many years. You've heard these things come from me before, so you're going to hear them again, so I apologize right now, so I'll share that with you. Metrics drive culture, and whatever we measure is going to drive the culture of policing. What, uh, what we ask for is what we get, and today we are getting exactly what we've asked for. You have police departments that are extremely efficient at dropping homicide rates at all costs, and that has imp impacted communities. Now, in the city of Baltimore, I just wanted to share how, how we've tried to build community policing, and then I'm going to divert at the end. First of all, we started uh, about two years ago as I stepped into this police organization, being my third police organization, and I've had the opportunity to take on some of the toughest police departments in the United States. And in this particular uh, scenario with the, the city of Baltimore, we started with a strategic plan. We started with looking at inputs and looking at outputs, looking at police officers' numbers and crime statistics, but we tried to, to evaluate and go to a higher level to look at outcomes. Changing the local metrics, we started looking at community and neighborhood health. Much like the city of Los Angeles and some of the other cities, the metrics that we're looking at and trying to put in place are different. Hopefully, we'll get different results. Uh, we started also internally by building a professional standards bureau. And in that bureau, uh, it, was, it was focused at rooting out corruption, misconduct, and holding violators accountable. We then started with a, a separate uh, division. We started with the community partnership division. There again, some of the traditional engagement of our communities, starting with our faith-based community and spreading from, from there. Another cornerstone of the building of community policing in Baltimore was transparency. That became the cornerstone of our, of our police department. When we were wrong, we shared that we were wrong. When we were right, we celebrated the rights. And we didn't have a, a hard time saying that we needed to grow and move away from some of the, or move towards some of the challenges that were there. We also have moving, we are also moving towards body cameras like most police agencies, much like I did in, in the city of Oakland five years ago. Um, and now that we're seeing some of the, the very in-depth issues that come along with body cameras, it's very complicated. Next, we went to training, and then we started focusing our training on constitutional policing, addressing issues of empathy, bias, impartial policing, emotional intelligence, and we're still growing at, at those practices. And then we made sure to expose our police organization to the best practices nationally, bringing in uh, uh, very well-known speakers from around the country, uh, Chris Magnus being the latest, who was just in Baltimore yesterday, and he uh, actually enjoyed the weather there. It was about 17 degrees. <laughs> uh, also, uh, as we moved in deal dealing with how we uh, built and addressed crime in a community policing standpoint, uh, we established or reestablished a focus on violent repeat offenders. So we're not going after an entire community, 
We're not doing mass incar incarceration. We're focusing on those people who have caused harm or were causing harm to our communities. We've instituted programs like ceasefire program, which goes along with violent repeat offenders in violent groups at the same time. We're building youth programs that are, are value-based so we can reconnect with our, our community to get out of this one-dimensional policing, which is just focused on enforcement, but connecting, engaging, and growing with our community as a whole. We've instituted, we've instituted foot patrols where we've uh, told the officers that uh, whether you're in a business, co business community, commercial community, or whether you're in a residential, we want you out on front, we, foot, we want you talking to people. And it's not just to address crime, it's to connect with people, to sit down on the doorsteps, or in Baltimore, as we call it, the stoops, and have a conversation with the grandma, to tell her where you came from, ask her where her people came from, and get to know the community in, in, a, in a larger level. We've eradicated stop and frisk and the concepts of stop and frisk and taking those off of our books and moving the police officers away from the tenets of stop and frisk. Uh, in a moment of clarity, I had one command officer tell me uh, when he came on uh, a number of years ago, what uh, the department did was stop every African-American male and search through his pockets. So any African-American male walking down the street, they got out of their car, searched through his pockets looking for guns. And the impact of having uh, someone stop you for when you're not doing anything and searching through your pockets. And as an African-American man myself, having someone stop you in front of your kids and what that feels like and to have your kids see you treated that way or put down on your knees or sat on the sidewalk and the impacts of those things and trying to share that with the police department as we move, move, we move forward. And building that philosophy of community policing overall. And we're moving away from being Baltimore-centric into being more police-centric and, and moving away from being Baltimore-centric and being police-centric also, also. Looking to resolve problems in a larger scale with other departments in other parts of our community. community. We're also looking towards succession planning so we, can so we can focus on change management so this is just not a short-term fix, that this is a long-term goal for the police department as a whole. In short, what we, came out, out of, what we came out of that in the two years that we've been there as a team is every metric in policing, we've been successful. Homicides are down. All part one categories are down. Officer-involved shootings are down from 33 to 11. Excessive force complaints are down. Lawsuits are down. So <coughs> what we should be saying is raising our hands, jumping up and down, and saying that we were successful. Well, we're not, because we have a total disengagement for trust within our community, making a, putting me in a position to reach out to DLJ and asking them to come in for a collaborative reform because although we're going in the right directions and we have these successes, we have no trust within our community as a whole. And, as, and with that, you know, I was looking at a special since this is Black History Month on Thurgood Marshall, and Thurgood Marshall, Marshall went away from just um, practicing law. He moved towards social, social justice. And many times, uh, I think, for policing today, for police chiefs and police executives, we need to learn how to address crime through social justice as a whole. And we may, call, we may call it community policing, we may call it uh, legitimacy, but really it is social justice. Leadership should be focused on not just crime fighting, but tackling racism. Uh, one of the things moving from the West Coast, where I'm from, Southern California, then Northern California, and now I'm moving to the East Coast, is in uh, the West Coast, I dealt with a lot of issues on diversity. And that was the discussion on point of diversity. When I go to Baltimore and the East Coast, I'm dealing with 1950s levels black and white racism. It's taken a step back. Everything is either black or everything is either white, and we're dealing with that as a community. And I'm stirring that pot. Now, I may not be able to change some of the things that I'm bringing up, but I can bring, I can bring those issue up, issues up in the bully pulpit and have that conversation started. So not only taking on racism, taking on sexism, taking on literacy, mentoring, me mental illness, the character building. These are all things that police commissioners or police chiefs today have to take this on. It's a bigger role for us, and these are the things that we need to, to teach. And it also means when we're reaching out and reaching back to our communities, we have to allow, we have to engage our critics. Uh, I have a meeting coming up when I get back um, in the next week or two, or some of the most uh, verbal critics of the Baltimore Police Department and some of the most verbal critics uh, of, of uh, my tenure. And so we have to sit down with them, taken from what Bill Bratton did with the wonderful Constance Rice uh, that I uh, watched from Long Beach uh, when I was there, is that we have to turn the people who are critics into our friends, into our allies. And we do that by listening. So when Mr. Jose Lopez and I were in the bathroom together having a conversation before we reconvened here, I think for us in policing to engage the community that is angry with us, we have to find out why they're angry. There's a lot of pain that's there, and we have to understand that. When you have 100 American cities that are in protest, 
it should be a clue to you that we have to do change. And it's not the community that has to change, it's policing that has to change. And with that, I will uh, stop. Uh, the only thing is, is uh, the last thing is when a police professional steps outside of their lane at the things that I'm talking about, whether it's mental illness, racism, sexism, it makes the political body a little nervous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Jeffrey Blackwell, <coughs> Chief of the Cincinnati Police Department. Thank you, sir. Thank you, panel. And Commissioner Batts, the collaborative agreement that you spoke of initiating in, in Baltimore, we have had in Cincinnati. We came out of that situation in 2001 with a collaborative agreement that I'm sure you remember Iris Rowley back in Cincinnati when you were there, how passionate she talked about the change that was necessary in Cincinnati and how it took place. It took place with a, the work of over 3,000 individuals in the city of Cincinnati to affect that change. But I talk about it uh, as a low point, and we pivoted from that to become what I believe the model, model police agency in the United States. And we've done that by uh, a lot of different programs, a lot of different oversight things that we do. And the other thing that we do well in Cincinnati is that we walk our talk. You know, I hear a lot of people talk about community policing. I hear a lot of people talk about getting involved, but, um, and I hear a lot of people, uh, as Jose spoke of, the trust issues in urban America. Those can be overcome if people believe that you are authentic. And the way you become authentic is that you're there every day with people in the community, working with the people in the community to overcome some of the societal issues and ingrained impediments that have contributed to the relationship chasm uh, that make difficult any sustainable improvements. Historical racism in America, poor police training and oversight, as well as the over-reliance on inefficient and archaic police models and strategies, uh, coupled with the other root causation issues that I'm gonna really talk about because we have got to start working on those, urban poverty and joblessness, urban core gentrification, declining moral voice levels, and decreasing diversity in law enforcement. And the diversity in law enforcement is, is very germane for a couple of reasons. First, your department should look like the community that you serve. Uh, that seems really obvious. But the other thing that we know uh, in this room, the police officials know in this room, that the more diversity you have on your department, you, you have better perspective and you hold people accountable, not only in the locker room and the roll call room, but on the streets when you are policing. And so it's very important that you have the diversity um, in, the, in the ranks. Um, crime and the fear of crime drive many police intervention strategies. Uh, Data-driven statistic, statistical analytics is pushing police agencies into a more focused approach, which at times minimizes or ignores the human component and other interactive factors that create synergy and buy-in from interested and sometimes desperate community stakeholders. So the first three things that I think we all have to uh, work on is trust and relationship building in communities. In Cincinnati, we've done a few things along this end. Uh, first, we do community problem-oriented policing. That is our uh, framework, that's our basis. And what that means is, not only do we listen to the community for what the problems are, what they want us to address, but we also work with them to develop the strategy to work on the problem. So we've eradicated the big me, little you mentality in Cincinnati by working with our, our constituencies, not only on what they want us to do, but how we accomplish that. We've established quality of life enhancement teams in Cincinnati, teams that work on problems as deep and as wide as they have to. They're not tied to the radio. So they work on issues at the community level for a long time to help eradicate the issues. We also have a neighborhood liaison unit, and we formulated or we helped with the formulation of a faith-based uh, group called the God Squad. That, that group at all of our public events helps raise the moral voice for peace. Collaboration has to be authentic. You raise the social efficacy of communities when you collaborate with them and you build relationships with them and they see you in the neighborhoods every day. You know, we have, um, the academic portion of, uh, that everyone has heard about in this room, and we rely on two uh, PhD doctors in, in Cincinnati, Dr. Eck and Dr. Robin Engel, and they give us 
the evidence-based data that we need. We meet with them every Friday. In fact, Dr. Engel is in our crime strategy meetings every Friday so that we know that we're on the right stack of mail in that regard. Um, transparency has to be department-wide. That's the third thing. On-time press releases. If you, you need to release information on time, you have to share strategies and values with community members. You have, you have to discuss outcomes and successes. And then the other thing that um, comes under the transparency is the optics of policing. Not only what you do as an agency, but how you look in the deliverability of your police services. For example, wearing black gloves in the summertime and having the military equipment and all of the things that prove to the citizens that you really are disengaged. Uh, some other things that can help are cross-cultural training programs. I developed a program called the ABCs of CPD for three reasons. A, to learn about the cultures in our community. B, to discuss the police culture, which many people don't understand because of the Hollywood impact on policing. And um, third, or that was the third. So the ABCs of policing. We've also taken that program uh, to a group called Boys Hope, Girls Hope, which is a youth program in, in Cincinnati that I sit on the board. We have trained teenagers to deliver the ABCs of policing to other young people. That will increase the authenticity and better help that program be received. In relationship building, uh, community problem-oriented policing is our foundation, evidence-based platform that is shared, authentic, everyday engagement. Um, we operate a little outside the box, however, and that and, and by that, I mean we deal with root causation and other ethnographic issues in Cincinnati. Issues such as poverty, education, unemployment, fatherless homes, and health care issues. So we have a program. We develop a few programs. Uh, first, when our recruit classes graduate, for the first week, when they first have those shiny badges on their chest, and they get immersed into the cops and robbers of policing. The first week, we send them to the homeless shelter. We send them to the food bank. And we send them to the Boys and Girls Clubs and the rec centers that we are in to help underprivileged kids uh, learn to read. We have a program called Get the Grades, where we go into the uh, three of our Boys and Girls Clubs in Cincinnati and five at-risk elementary schools and mentor and tutor kids. And this year alone, we improved reading scores by 60%. Now, what police department has to do that. I will offer that none do, but we realize that it is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do to raise the social capacity and the sustainability in our communities. We also have a program called Hoops Heart Hope. Don't confuse it with the Midnight Basketball League. It's far more substantive than that. The Hoops Heart Hope program in Cincinnati meets 10 weeks at the at most at-risk rec centers in our city, we have 500 young people aged 10 to 19 that deal with character, integrity, and leadership building. We feed them a nutritious meal, and then they play basketball until midnight. And I realize that everything we do, as Commissioner Bat says, has to have metrics. We get what we measure, so we measured this program. It's hard to measure love. It's hard to measure what relationship is. So we, we measured crime around a one mile radius around each of the rec centers in very impoverished areas of our city. And for the 10 weeks of the program last year, we didn't have one crime on Friday night between six and midnight involving a young person, not one. We also tracked our young people and we tracked our young people and we kept uh, uh, tabs on them through school and none of them have been in trouble since coming to the program. The last thing I'll talk about is demographic inversion. I think that's the thing that's missing to, that has not been talked about to date. As the urban gentrification continues in America and you have people that traditionally, traditionally lived in urban cores now living in outlying, even uh, rural areas, those police agencies have got to have better training and a better capacity to deal with their changing constituencies. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Chris Magnus, Chief of the Richmond, California Police Department. Good morning. It's nice to join you today. So first, just a little bit about Richmond. We're an urban community of about 110,000 residents located 11 miles north of Oakland. Richmond was the site of the original Kaiser World War II shipyards, now home to one of the largest refineries on the West Coast. It's a very, very diverse community 
40% Latino, 27% black, 17% white, and 14% Asian. And despite the improving economy, 20% of Richmond residents continue to live below the poverty level, and the unemployment rate is 17%. Richmond has historically struggled with high rates of crime and has often been among the nation's most violent cities, even, even when crime has decreased nationally. In 2004, Richmond had 8,168 Part 1 crimes. In 2007, the city sustained 47 murders, most of which involved firearms and occurred in public places. Public safety and a long-standing distrust of the police <coughs> have been some of the top concerns of residents for many years. So in response to these concerns, the Richmond community committed to addressing violent crime as a public health crisis. City leaders recognized the need to influence individual and collective behavioral factors in the ideology and prevention of violence. Now, like most public safety agencies, Richmond PD believed it was practicing community policing, a much overused term, although quality relationships between residents, especially residents of color, and police officers, frankly, were non-existent or strained at best. Community policing in our department was synonymous with public relations, and a small select group of officers did the majority of the department's community outreach. However, since 2006, the department has made a number of changes to address these issues and to build a more effective partnership with residents. Now, let's be clear, these changes have not come easily or quickly because they have involved first and foremost transforming the culture within the police department, but as well as in the community. And culture change takes time. It requires adaptive, not just technical leadership, and it's built around relationships and trust. It also requires a top engaged management team working together with shared goals committed to achieving the same mission, one that encourages cops and professional employees to achieve superior outcomes. So there have been multiple components involved in this change process, all of which continue to require hard work, creativity, and commitment. Let me give you a few examples. First, Assuring all officers, not just a select few, are doing community policing and neighborhood problem solving. In our department, every officer is expected to get to know the residents, businesses, community groups, churches, and schools on their beat. Cops are expected to work with these folks to identify and address public safety challenges, including issues such as blight. Officers remain in the same beat for several years, and this helps us build familiarity, and trust. Second, hiring, training, evaluating, and promoting officers based on their ability and track record in community engagement, not just traditional measures of policing, such as the number of arrests they make, or their tickets, or their tactical skills. The department has hired a highly diverse group of officers. At this point, we look like our community. It was 60% non-white and many of them are from Richmond, which has been a deliberate process for us. These folks have backgrounds that include social work, volunteerism, civic engaging, civic involvement, and a wide ranging life experiences. Officers receive training in communication skills that includes things like dealing with the mentally ill. They learn about community resources, crisis intervention, crime prevention, diversity, and fair and impartial policing. Officers also receive feedback that specifically evaluates how they're doing with their beat projects, their connections with the community, their overall community policing skills. And very importantly, in order to get promoted, officers are required to study and test successfully on materials that focus on evolving police community issues, best practices in crime fighting, partnering with diverse communities, and more. If you want to get advancement in our department, I use the phrase, but it's true. You have to do more than talk the talk. You have to have walked the walk. We want to see examples of how you've actually established credibility within your beats. Not just hear about what you say you're going to do once you get the promotion. We want to see examples of what you've already done. And we talk to neighbors to see if that's true. Third, 
insisting that public safety is a shared responsibility. It's got to require a partnership between residents and police. You can't just have the finger pointing or sitting back and waiting for somebody else to do the heavy lifting. So a few examples of innovative police community and partnerships in Richmond have included our active and very effective ceasefire program that's helped reduce murders in the city to its lowest level in over 30 years. A West County Family Justice Center, which is a collaboration the police department took a lead role in of service providers and advocacy groups that work with the police department to provide a one-stop shop of services for victims of domestic and sexual violence. A nationally recognized daytime curfew program that has resulted in recidivism rates of less than 10%. Young people don't just get picked up, we figure out what's going on in their lives and with their families that's causing them not to be in school, get them referred to the right resources and then rigorously follow up. And then police participation in such diverse community activities as urban greening programs, ongoing coffee with a cop or similar gatherings, programs that involve kids uh, being mentored in high crime multifamily housing complexes and an annual foster care youth summit as well as a series of programs that we call Unity in the Community that involves folks meeting in our Latino neighborhood schools that focus on the issues they've identified that are important to them. The common threads here, accountability, approachability, and transparency. At the end of 2014, Richmond had recorded a record low 5,115 part one crimes, including 11 murders. Again, that's a 30 plus year low. It cannot be overstated, this was not a result of any single quick or easy solution, nor are we claiming mission accomplished here. We've had multiple challenges in Richmond, including limited personnel, tough labor issues, litigation, and a history of complex racial, political, and financial obstacles. All that said, in Richmond, <laughs> if we can do it, as the vernacular of Rosie the Riveter goes, and that's a Richmond icon, by the way, and achieve the outcomes we've gotten. We believe other cities can utilize similar strategies to build successful police community relationships. Thank you, Chief. And next we'll hear from uh, Patrick Melvin, Chief of the Salt River Police Department. Uh, the Salt River Police Department is part of the Pima Maricopa Indian community. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chairperson, uh, Director Davis, and honorable task force members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to represent Indian Country on this prestigious uh, panel here. Uh, and I'm going to be talking from a perspective of um, a tribal agency that's here, right here in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's right down the street. Uh, my testimony comes from a pr perspective of proactive, professional, and progressive law enforcement uh, tribal agency that embraces its sovereignty and has been in existence for over 45 years. The Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community has an enrolled member population of over 10,000 community members and serves a daytime population of approximately 250,000. A little background about the uh, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. Visitors to the community can experience a host of numerous commercial businesses, shopping malls, the Talking Stick Resort, Casino Arizona, the Salt River Fields Major League Baseball Stadium, the spring training home of the Arizona Diamondbacks and Colorado Rockies, the Scottsdale Community College, and several major freeways. The police department has created an environment of ethical, caring, and well-trained team members who deliver professional services to 88 square miles of residential, agricultural, and commercial lands. <clears throat> Excuse me. The police department investigates and presents investigations to and testifies in tribal, state, and federal courts. All police officers are tribally sworn, state sworn, Arizona Post certified, and federally sworn. We receive a special law enforcement officer commission and certification through the Bureau of Indian Affairs to investigate federal crimes. Calls for service are about 100,000 a year. We have 132 miles of roadway, 18 miles of freeways and state routes with a daily vehicle count of approximately 300,000. Currently have 154 departmental team members, 118 are sworn, and 36 are non-sworn, or what we like to refer to as professional staff. The police department is committed to partnership of public service, mutual respect, professionalism, and dedicated service-based policing. 
Of the 566 federally recognized tribes in the United States, the Salt River Police Department is amongst the top five largest police departments in Indian country. Our community is a sovereign nation and regards all relations between the United States and the community to be a formal government to government nature. As a sovereign nation, the community exercises the inherent authority and control over its territory, natural resources, and welfare of its citizens. The community is accountable to its citizens. The President's task force recommendations should, be, should highlight the need for authentication of police community contacts validated by the use of in-car camera systems and or body cameras, interrogations corroborated by the use of videos, and the standard practice of release of facts in situations involving sensitive police-involved shootings, all under the guise and practice and limitations of sovereignty. It is recommended that police disciplinary action, if warranted, and once appeals and court actions have been exhausted, be open for public view, such as the case of the Salt River community, with our seven-member council appointed uh, community law enforcement commission. It is recommended that we continuously strive for a culture of transparency. As far as communications in Indian country, our recommendation is to vigorously train young officers in the art of verbally engaging the community. An officer's ability to engage the community and follow the principles of service-oriented policing should be considered in all promotional and advancement opportunities, pretty much like my colleague to my right has said. Public trust policing, having open two-way communication with the public is absolutely essential and should be willing to give out relevant legal information into investigations of misconduct and non-misconduct concerning police leadership. The preeminent reason of a police organization is dysfunctional or not rests on the quality of supervision that police officers receive. Police organizations that have unfettered control over its officers are are agencies with a scattered and unbalanced approach to the community they serve. However, limited supervisory control and management of the department, but full accountability is a recipe for failure. In essence, someone must ensure that the policies, regulations, and interactions designed for improving relations with the community are followed, or at the least, there are consequences for deficiencies. Concerning constitutional policing, it is recommended that the officers be systematically and consistently trained on law and legal issues, offer tuition reimbursement, and offer incentives for obtaining higher education, providing equivalency credit for military and life experience in the hiring and recruiting process. Efforts should be directed to turning law enforcement into a profession. Other professions require formal education to practice law in their profession, and there should be a standard to enforce the law. Encourage, encourage, encourage formal education. The Police Department, uh, SRPD, Salt River Police Department, proposes that a series of town halls, specifically in Indian country communities across the country, aimed at law enforcement CEOs and community leaders addressing concerns of public trust while educating the public on what law enforcement is and is not, with an emphasis in sovereignty clarification and education. To accomplish this, there needs to be a systematic understanding that the lack in some cases of transparency and communication by law enforcement authorities helps to create an environment of confusion and mistrust. Reengineering community policing needs to be reengineered to include intelligence-led policing, programs that will actually involve the community and community input on how to fight crime in their perspective or respective neighborhoods. Need to include the police commission, oversight groups, citizens, police academies, community meetings with community members and officers involved. Fighting crime involving the community, soliciting ideas and solutions for future successes. Effective crime reduction and employment strategies includes again intelligence-led policing, focusing policing efforts into certain areas of concern, street crimes, gang squads, sex offender squads, traffic enforcement, etc. Should be a hub where they can share and distribute information. Building systems partnerships, both within and outside the criminal justice system, multidisciplinary teams to include other meetings with po the police commission, the family advocacy center, the tribal prosecutor's office, social services, child protective services, et cetera, within the legal parameters of a sovereign nation. One of my colleagues uh, talked about the diversity in the workforce. 
The challenge to hiring a diverse workforce in law enforcement is reflected by the faces of the organization's leadership. The key to diversity in law enforcement is visibility of diversity, opportunity to engage people in their, in, on their terms, and opportunities to advance, such as community member preference and Native American hiring preference. Your current workforce is your best recruiters for diversity or your organization's loudest critics. In closing, my final recommendations. Community policing must be a reflection of the community we serve. Our departments should truly understand the culture, history, traditions, and quality of life issues our communities are facing on a daily basis. Our police departments should actively involve the entire community who we serve to include our youth, our elders, our businesses, our faith-based groups, community organizers, schools, elected officials, etc. Our police departments should actively attend, create, or design opportunities to daily communicate and be visible within our community in non-police generated events to develop positive interaction with the communities we serve. Our police departments should embrace delivering education and not just to law enforcement, but to seek real-time problem-solving sol solutions to improve the community's quality of life issues. Every level of our police departments should and must internalize these essential community policing elements with our mission goals and daily activity and hold our police department team members accountable for performance-based results. Community policing is a collaborative effort between the community we serve, the police and local government to identify problems or crime and work together for solutions. Successful community policing combines the efforts and resources of the community, police, and local government to form a perfect circle. It, is, it has a positive effect on reducing crime, increasing communication and trust, and enhancing the quality of life in the community. More now than ever, police must be able to work collaboratively as partners with our neighboring police agencies and communities to build partnerships. Thank you, thank you. very much, and thank all of you uh, for your testimony here today. And now we're going to turn to our task force members for their questions. And again, a reminder that we call upon task force members in the order in which they've indicated that they have a question. And we're going to begin this uh, round with Connie Rice, followed by Sue Rohr. Uh, OK, am I pushing the right thing? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ramsey. Um, I had, I work with Chief Beck and a number of other police chiefs in the LA area. And um, be thankful you're not in LA. You'd have 4,000 square miles <laughs> to deal with and hundreds of police departments. But the hardest part of the community problem oriented policing that each of you has described so well, the hardest part of it was getting the community to agree to engage. And I'd like to hear from you what suggestions. I mean, Chief Beck just called me up and said, Connie, you've got to do this for us. Because in order to get LAPD on the right footing with the community, I had to go to the Watts community, which meant I was going to the women because it's a matriarchy still, going to the great grandmothers. And, and they needed me to go to the great grandmothers in particular, Mrs. Day and Mrs. Tolliver. Mrs. Day had lost two of her sons to LAPD guns, and Mrs. Tolliver had lost three of her children to LAPD guns. How do you go to parents whose children have been murdered by your police officers? That's how they see it. How do you ask those community members to then sit down and co-lead uh, a, a community police fluency and uh, strategic partnership between community and police. What recommendations do you, because that's one of the hardest conversations I've ever had to have. And my police force couldn't quite do it. They just didn't know how to have that conversation. Should it be community intermediaries like me who hold those conversations? Because you're not gonna get real cooperation and genuine buy-in and legitimacy conveyed upon your police department until those painful past uh, hurdles are jumped. Thank you, 
Hope I'm on. I think you're right, at least for me in my experience, whether in Long Beach or Oakland or Baltimore, you need intermediaries. The reality in, in my city now in Baltimore is that in certain parts of our community, there's a visceral hatred of that police department. <clears throat> and even me coming in as an outsider and only being there two years saying that I didn't, I didn't cause a problem here to solve it and resolve it doesn't bring me credibility. So for me, it's, uh, I don't have a kind of race. So I have to go to uh, the pastors of my community and <clears throat> excuse me, it's the same concept because it's a matriarchal society and the mothers are going to church and we use the pastors to give us that credibility and we start the conversation. But when the conversation starts, part of what I have to do is say that we as a police department have been part of the problem. And that's very hard uh, to stand, and be, stand before a police organization and get it to the point to say that we've been part of the problem. And in fact, if we've been part of the problem, how do we start becoming part of the solution? Mm -hmm. And the reality is that many times, and I've said this in other spaces, is that uh, police officers are not part of the problem on purpose. Uh, it's just like in the 1980s uh, where we had the rock cocaine epidemic and, and where I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, where it was just impacting our communities and communities said, do something. And we did what, what we knew how to do at that time, which was arrest people and, and put up battering rams and tear down rock houses and do all those things. And we thought we were doing God's work. We thought we were making a difference. But through that mass incarceration, we obliterated communities. Yeah. And so when we, we have to start with the conversation, if we have an authentic conversation, we've been part of the problem. We have to find a new way to be part of the solution. And we do need those intermediaries. And we have to do a lot of listening and not telling and let people know that we give a damn. And I also think that as we become more guardian-like and less warrior-like, we can help uh, bridge those hurdles that you spoke of and, and, and bridge those gaps that exist. But do, I don't think for a minute anyone in the room thinks that people in urban cores of cities throughout the United States don't really want our help. The problem has become over the years that the disenfranchisement that they've experienced due to police misconduct or, poli or perceived police misconduct have created barriers where people will live with the crime rather than call the police and not know what type of police service they're going to receive. So as you eradicate those bad relationships, as you build that authenticity, and as Commissioner Batt said, you know, in some communities where it's really bad, you need leverage, you need lever pullers. I, I don't want that in my city. I want to be the lever puller. I want to be the person that is connected enough to the community where I don't have to leverage a relationship with someone else so that I can come somewhere and talk to people and have my message be received. That comes from, from commitment and, and being in the community every single day with folks so that they get to know you and they trust you. And as you build that trust up and your officers see, as someone on the previous panel said, as, as the chief goes, so does the department. Well, that's not always true um, unless you have good uh, frontline supervision and middle supervision that is actually out there day in and day out doing the work. But as we break the disenfranchisement, I think, I think that's the first step. Chief, let me echo that just really, really quickly, just, just to share this with you. Chief Beck, our chief in LA, uh, the first time I saw him out on the basketball court in the housing projects on a Friday night, I pulled him aside and I said, you gotta get out of here, the sun's going down. And he said, no, I'm going to play. I'm going to play till 10 o'clock tonight. And I stayed there with him because I just knew he was going to get shot. And um, I'll be damned if he wasn't up there high-fiving and low-fiving and running up and down that damn court. And he had bonded with all those gangsters who were bound and determined to get on the squad so they could say they played the chief. And he didn't care. He didn't care if they were Grape Street Crips. He didn't care if they were blood bounty hunters. He played with them. And he's there every Friday night in a different housing project. And I have to say, it's worked wonders. Thank you. Thank you. Um, either Chief Magnus or Chief Melvin, do you want to? Or we'll move just, on to the next. Just a couple quick thoughts on that, because I really think, and maybe we have somewhat of an advantage in a little bit of a smaller city, but I, I think that this kind of legitimacy you're talking about has to be built on, it has to be built on communication and respect, and that respect has to occur even in enforcement situations. It, this just can't be a 
beat officers or others who are treating people respectfully at neighborhood meetings or in engagements that are more traditional and formalized and that tend to attract people who are either already supportive of the police or open to them. It has to occur in environments where there may be real hostility and at the very least skepticism. We're, what we've really had to do is acknowledge that there's a lot of ambivalence around enforcement in our community. We don't get celebrated for making the massive arrests, so we've had to learn that it's programs like Ceasefire where you really have the police and the community talking about shared problems, folks understanding why we're going after particular individuals. The community sees us doing outreach to them, giving them opportunities. We're doing that hand in hand with community members. And then when those folks are saying, we're not gonna take that outreach, we're continuing doing what we're doing, we've had support from the community in the enforcement piece, but again, that only occurs if it's done respectfully and if there's really a lot of transparency involved. So we've had to engage our critics. That, that's, I think that's where it really starts. It's easy to engage people who already, who already get it and support what you're doing, but the engagement of critics, admitting mistakes, acknowledging the past, and committing to do things differently, uh, I think has to be a, where that relationship building starts. Thank you, thank you. If, if I may just uh, for, uh, indulge me just for a minute. In, in tribal country or in Indian country, uh, the elders and the seniors of the community are the power bases. And when you can, uh, in, in tribal country, you have to listen. And a lot of times it's better to listen than to speak. And once that's accomplished, you get a lot more information. Uh, one of the things that uh, I do is I hand out my personal cell phone number, and I quickly learned that after trust started being uh, developed, that grandmothers know how to text nowadays. <laughs> and I started receiving text messages in the middle of the night, but it was very good intelligence information. And then when you'd return a text message, that was trust building. Uh, transparency at the executive levels of the organization is definitely essential, required, and necessary. Uh, not only at the, uh, uh, the ground level or the troop level, but the executive level. We have to have uh, not only accessibility at the executive level, but also transparency. Also, dignity and respect. My colleague mentioned d dignity and respect. Travel country, it's all about respect. All about respect. And one, another thing, and I'll, I'll be finished here. In tribal country, especially in a small community of 10,000, you can, you're not going to arrest someone and not see them ever again in your career. You're gonna see them next week or tomorrow or they're gonna be part of the day labor program. You're gonna see them again. You're gonna see them in the cafeteria. They're in the community. You're gonna see that person again. So it's very important to treat everyone with dignity and respect, even if they are under arrest, to treat them with dignity and respect because it'll go a long ways because you'll definitely see them again. Thank you very much. Sue Rohr followed by Sean Smoot. Okay, I have one question for Chief Batts and one for uh, Chief Magnus. Uh, Chief Batts, I applaud your dedication to moving away from the aggressive stop, stop and frisk. I think a lot of people believe that's the construction of police departments, and I suspect that the roots are, go beyond that. Can you talk about the resistance you have received outside, or maybe within your police department, um, but on a larger political level, uh, and well, how you dealt with it? The, the body within the city of Baltimore does not like uh, stop and frisk uh, in any category. So uh, the body politic or the residents uh, have seen um, the negatives of doing stop and frisk. Um, what I try to, to do is, is capture our culture and use within our culture. And what I share with them is how do we become tactically proficient by better knowing the law and understanding the law and under, understanding uh, uh, ter what a Terry stop really is and what the, what the purpose is. And so we, we, we craft everything through our training uh, based on tactical proficiency. What they don't understand is that, uh, like my grandmother used to give me castor oil, she put sugar in it, and I didn't know I was taking castor oil because I was taking the sugar, and we try to do that uh, from the tactics of the organization. So the organization is responding. It's not moving as quickly as I like, but it is responding, and we are seeing the results, and we're moving away from stop and frisk. Thank you. And Chief Magnus, you talked about diversifying your police department, and we've had many discussions about how do we accomplish that. Um, it sounds like you've had a lot of success there. What, what are some things that you did that helped you uh, create a more diverse workforce? 
I think you have to reach a tipping point with almost every group that you're trying to bring in to your agency. People have to see that you can be a person of color, you can be a woman, you can be um, gay, and you can still, you can be promoted, you have opportunities, there are other people that look like you within the department. That critical mass is best achieved by having members of your department do be actively engaged in the outreach, not just one specific recruiting team that's tucked away in your HR section, but to have a, members of your department that really <clears throat> exemplify what you're looking for. They know where to go. They know where to find people. And if we get out of this idea that all our recruits are coming from you know, existing academies or traditional sources of bringing in folks into a police agency, and we let our um, department members who are already representing that diversity take a lead role in recruiting. They are our best recruiters, and they can help build on that critical mass. Thank you very much. Sean Smoot, followed by Tracy Mears. Thank you, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. What a distinguished panel of police leaders. I thank you all for your uh, testimony this morning. Um, uh, Chief Blackwell, I can't tell you how impressed I was and frankly many of the other task force members I believe were with the testimony of your union president uh, at our meeting in Cincinnati and, and her voice and uh, in talking about the commitment collaboration that the police union has to working uh, to improve the, the city and the city's police department. So I, I think you're really lucky to have her and I, I wanted to let you know. And Chief uh, Magnus, I've even read some really nice comments about you that have been attributed to the police union leader in your, in your city. Um, uh, and and I, I wanted to just touch and, and highlight a little bit your truancy program um, because I think that's really a linchpin uh, in, in terms of long-term effect uh, that we haven't heard before uh, today. And you know, I, any police officer can tell you if, if you can identify a kid that can't read and write, that kid, when they grow up, is gonna be in the system. And, and so what you're doing is really awesome in, in terms of, of identifying those kids and why they're not in school and getting them in school. Um, my, my question for you, and really for all of you, and it doesn't require a really long answer, is um, you know, what portion of your budgets, I mean clearly you all have communities that uh, support you, um, that have made community relationships, community policing a priority. What percentage of your budgets annually uh, are committed to your community policing programs? Everyone looks towards me to start that off on. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't think any of our budget, at least my budget, is isn't um, uh, committed to towards community policing, and uh, a lot of it is just on salaries. Ninety-two percent of my budget is salaries. It's just officers. Period. So I don't have a lot of uh, uh, discretionary funds that are that that are, that are there. But I, I think it's not dedicated. Is our philosophy and anything that we're doing and that we're moving that direction uh, after two years is dedica dedicated towards community policing. And uh, this this uh, summer we had uh, 150 to 200 kids out of our academy, and I pulled officers out of regular patrol to number one feed these kids in the morning and the afternoon and actually get them in the hook of sports. But bigger than the hook of sports is to deal with their value system. Uh, I'm going to start a program where I'm going to put uh, 10 officers into a housing project taken from a la LAPD and what they've done in their housing projects uh, to stay with, stay, stay with the kids, make sure they get to school, make sure that we engage with their teachers, make sure that uh, we keep the housing project safe, but also do sports too at the same time. None of that's funded out of my budget. And uh, all those things and all those processes that we're going to grow, we got to grow them out in-house. But that has to be part of what we do. These officers are getting paid. It's the philosophy and how they do it. So that 92% of my budget will remain the same, but it will be focused on community. Let me, let me just rephrase the question a little bit because that's a great point because a lot of these programs are funded out of other. What, if you know, you know, what kind of financial commitment are you getting from the city, from the city government to, to help you with these programs? Uh, my mayor is moving uh, um, 
mountains to make this happen as a whole. And, and when I say community policing for me, and it's probably community governance, and it's just not the police department there again, getting away from being police centric. In our city, our, our government, our mayor is moving, so she's shifting all of her resources. So I would say major, the major part of the city government as a whole is shifting to, to this circumstance. So I wouldn't have a cost factor, but the city itself is making that move. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, did you have? Um, we're running short on time, so I'd ask everyone to keep both questions and answers as concise as possible. Next, we have Tracy Mears, followed by Brian Stevenson. Hi, um, that was really fascinating and, and actually inspiring too. I just have one question um, because my first question was posed by Sue already and you all gave really great answers. So this question is for you, Chief Magnus. Um, you focused a great deal in your testimony on um, not just talking the talk and walking the, but walking the walk and how you actually incentivize that. And you said one way you do that is to basically say, you're not going to get promoted, right, unless you um, meet these metrics that are not focused on arrests or stops, but on these other, you know, really important factors. So the question I have for you is that given that the vast majority, as I understand it, of police officers leave the force at the same rank that they enter. Um, how do you think about how the incentive structure works there when most people actually aren't being promoted? So you know the interesting thing about real community policing and problem solving if beat officers are engaged in it is that you know I think cops are pretty pragmatic and there's two factors at play. One is they want to be more effective, and the other is, like most of us, they want to be appreciated. They want to like their jobs. They want to feel like the environment is, is a good one for them. Our goal is not to incentivize community policing through, you know, it started out for us in a lot of departments by like, oh, well, we'll pay you overtime to do this. Well. First of all, I think I, that sends the wrong message, and second, I can't afford that. I have to incorporate community policing and problem solving into the way people do their day-to-day -day work, and yeah, I want them to do it in a way that I can incentivize through promotions and evaluations and training, but more importantly, I want it to be incentivized because they see it works. They like the fact that residents appreciate them, that we live in a poor, predominantly non-white community that comes to city council meetings and says, we support these guys, we support the police budget, we even support compensation that's fair for them. They like the idea of having people in a neighborhood that will come marching down to my office if I try to transfer them to a different beat and tell me how screwed up I am about that. They like that people know them by their first name. They have business cards with emails and voicemails, and yet I've got hardened, and I do mean some pretty hardened cops who I find out are handing out their personal cell phone number to community people to call because that works for them. They're doing what works, what makes their job better and what gives them greater enjoyment in doing their job. Frankly, I think that's the strongest way to incentivize it. Brian Stevenson, uh, followed by Jose Lopez. Well, I, I, I would just say, uh, Commissioner Batts, I was actually startled uh, during your opening statement because you did something I almost never hear anyone in the leadership position do in any arena. You actually expressly described recent policies and protocols at Baltimore, uh, declared them as contributants to uh, distrust and illegitimacy and then announced that they were not going to be part of your administration as commissioner. And I was very um, in, in impressed by that. And I wanted you to kind of evaluate uh, the relative importance of that tactic of naming things that have been done, that have created distrust and illegitimacy, declaring, making a commitment that they will not be part of the administration. And I'd be interested in any, if any of the other commissioners have, have used that, have done that, and how you would evaluate the importance of that uh, as a leader trying to build trust in the community. 
I think the board had said, uh, and I forget which member had, had said it, is that there's a tremendous amount of pain that goes on in this community and in two, two phases. One, not only talking about the policies, but talking about how we've contributed to the pain in, in a community. And in order for, like Jose was saying, in order for people to engage you in conversations, you need to walk from their step, from their point of, point of place. My lucky position, and I, I wear this with a red badge of courage, and, and Executive Director Ron Davis has heard me say this many times, I grew up in South Central LA, I grew up in a ghetto, and I understand what it is to be on the opposite side, and so I make sure I say that so people understand, I know what the pain is like, I understand that. Also, I have to share the fact that I have two young men who are my sons, who walk to different streets in different cities at the same time who may be impacted because their head nowhere in their head says they're the chief of police, the son of a chief of police or a commissioner. So I think acknowledging the policies have been problematic, acknowledging that we've caused the pain, but the opposite side to that is you gotta acknowledge that there's a lot of good police officers doing a lot of good police work for the lot for the right reason. And many times it is leadership that guides them. And if a leadership has guided them off the wrong path, and most leaders are trying to do the right thing, we have to acknowledge that to 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 get better. You have to say the pain's been caused for this, so we have to start healing. And I'd like to just add one thing to that. You know, we, we've been having these talks, we've been, and they're much necessary, but we've got a lot of good police officers in the United <coughs> States. We have, a, we have a tremendous amount of uh, really dedicated, caring, honorable police officers in this country who care. The problem is, is that when we spend 99% of our resources chasing 1% of our community's population, which are criminals, we, it, it gets thrown, thrown out of balance. So when you let police officers slow down a little, get away from answering radio calls, and engage people in their communities, you, they, they fall in love with folks because they get to see these young kids and these people in these communities as people. And if you allow them to stay tied to the radio, the only thing they deal with every day is criminals. And they become jaded. And they become one-sided. So when you open up their their mental picture a little bit by giving them the time to engage people. And that's, that's a leadership um, approach that's very risky for us because we're short in Cincinnati. We have budget crises. We have needs all over. But you have to make a commitment to stop chasing the things you've always been chasing and measuring and engage people in your community and see what happens. And I think it will work. Thank you very much. Uh, Jose Lopez followed by Brittany Packnett. Thanks. I have, a, I have two quick questions. One is um, uh, for Chief Blackwell. Just want to learn a little bit more about the uh, mental health response team. Um, so a little bit about kind of the makeup of the team, uh, the training, but also um, at which moment uh, do officers call for the deployment of that, uh, of that team? And that's very important because we deal a lot in every community, New York, everywhere, Baltimore, Cincinnati, it doesn't matter. The mental mental health crisis is very real in this, in this nation. So we've trained a good percentage of our officers. In fact, we try to have all of them trained. And the point of uh, beginning to triage folks starts with the actual radio call. Our dispatchers know who is mental health trained on their roster every day, and they send those people first um, to the situation. And it has worked out really well. I have a civil rights attorney, much like Connie Rice in my city, named Al Gerhardstein, who reminds me all the time that we can always do better in a, in a myriad of areas, but especially in the area of mental, mental illness and mental health. Um, and so we try our best to make sure we take all of those factors into consideration when we're dealing with those folks. You know, a lot, in many cities you have suicide by cop situations. We had a situation very similar in Cincinnati, and Al called me the next day and said, just because a mentally ill person has a gun doesn't mean they're calling you to come and kill them. You need to strategize, you need to have tactics, you need to be able to tactically retreat. And I've heard Chief Ramsey say that a lot. And so we're, we're starting those dialogues in our city and, and training our officers to be very mindful of who they're, in, who they're encountering and who they're impacting. Is around the idea of, of incentivizing uh, established credibility um, through promotions, uh, which is something that Chief Magnus have, has talked about. I'm just wondering across the panel whether or not that's something um, in your departments uh, that you're looking towards or that you're using now when you're thinking about who gets promoted and who doesn't and what the, what measurements, uh, what measurement tools kind of exist to understand 
um, you know, what it means for an officer to have established credibility uh, on, their, on their beat. In uh, Baltimore, what we're starting to do it is, uh, we haven't gotten to the, the evaluation piece, but we're gonna do that. But I incentivize by bringing community people into the, the promotional boards. So we have our community leaders sitting there on, that, on the other side of that table. And it's funny because uh, from my perspective, my command staff, we ask operational questions. Um, we ask rote memory related stuff. What the community asks is just like, uh, like Chief Magna said, what have you done in this community? You know, you can't talk about it. How, how many kids have you impacted? How many schools have you gone to? How many meetings? How many things have you solved? How many changes have you taken place? So the message has been pretty, sent pretty clearly through that organization. In order for you to promote, you better connect with that community because they're going to be the ones selecting you in the future. If I may, um, there was a time when for police examinations, it was a written test, an oral board, and 5% seniority. Now it is a time, uh, <laughs> now it's a time where that community member, like uh, Commissioner Bat said, is uh, actually on the panel. And will, uh, there was an artist that said one time, what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. And that community member is asking that same question. It should not be the first time that community member sees that person. And uh, someone on the panel mentioned earlier, uh, what you will bring or what you will do, it's more of what have you done. And I think that's very important. And that's how uh, that recommendation from that panel determines, uh, gives credibility to the person who's in the promotional process. Thank you very much. Brittany Packnett, followed by Roberto Villasenor. So I originally had two very brief questions, but Chief Blackwell, your very thoughtful answer gave me a third one. So I'm going to ask for very pithy answers because I'm going to try to ask the answers briefly, ask the questions briefly rather. But my, my first question to Chief Blackwell is, so in terms of the practices that um, are engaged in on the mental health response team, what of those things are kind of just good policing and should actually be implemented in the way that we train folks toward community policing? I think you're right. I think you answered it. There are good police practices that we, that we should follow with everyone. But with mental health and, and mental health crisis scenarios, you know, there are a lot of things that we need to understand from a training perspective that can help our officers. You know, the media portrays mental illness as uh, life and death scenarios for police officers when in fact 90% or higher of mental, uh, mental health folks that, are, that have issues are not violent at all. They're not violent. So we need to react to them differently through our training, leadership, and direction that we get in our agencies so that we bring these um, scenarios to a quick resolve. The other thing about mental health uh, that we're seeing in many cities is returning war veterans uh, from the active theater. And so in Cincinnati, we have put together a, a warrior in distress group with the military liaison person in my department. And we've actually helped uh, de-escalate situations as, as far away as Alaska over the phone with returning veterans who are, uh, have taken their families hostage or, or uh, threatened harm and hold up in a standoff situation. And I think that's a big mental, mental um, health piece that is being missed. Thank you. Uh, my second question is for Chief Magnus. So um, I just want to say I greatly respect the fact that if, if Richmond is a, a community where 80% of the folks are non-white and 60% of your unit is non-white, that that is uh, not a perfect match, but certainly one that is better than in most of our communities. Um, and I think that that's incredibly laudable. My question is, are, are you all, do you also have um, a recruitment and hiring goal around people's socioeconomic background? Because I think to the point that Commissioner Batts just made, that also matters for how people are able to build relationships. So I just didn't know if that's a stated goal of yours and how you're going about recruiting folks. I, I really like you pointing that out because, you know, part of the problem is you can hire people from all sorts of different racial gender backgrounds, yet depending on their life experience background, they can all sort of have an uncanny similarity that may not be the right match for your community. Um, we really have tried hard to not just do the sort of lateral hiring thing where you're out of convenience bringing people in from other departments as a way of filling a spot who may already just have the police credentials but don't have the relationships or the emotional intelligence that you're looking for to serve your community and rather recruit folks locally from within Richmond who have life experience backgrounds that are really going to help them relate to other 
young people in our community, particularly the young people of color who may have had a pretty rough time growing up, that part of that process involves having a healthy, for example, explorers program where kids as young as 14 through 18 can be involved in becoming part of your police department, having a cadet program where young people can get some education in college while they're becoming familiar with police work. These are things that sort of ingrain a broader cross-section of young people from different socioeconomic backgrounds into your agency. And if I could add on that, because I know we're really short, and then Jeff, I'm sorry for cutting you off, is I'd, I'd be really careful on just watching the racial construct of a police agency saying that that's going to solve the problems. Um, I have a police organization that's 52% uh, uh, minority, 48% uh, African American in a city that's 65% African American, and there's no trust that's there. Uh, so I, I don't think it's the color of the person. I don't even think it's the gender of the person. Is if you can have empathy and connectivity to those communities, no matter what your color is, even if it takes you playing basketball on Friday night. Although Chief Beck can't play basketball very well, I just want to say that. So. And the other thing about recruiting Brittany that I want to add. To Tell that. him he can't jump. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh oh. I'm not going there. You know. I, I talk about recruiting a lot and I get really offended when I hear scholars and others say, and, and I've heard other police chiefs say that there is this dearth of qualified minority applicants for police agencies. And uh, Dr. Alexander, he, he and I have had conversations about this and I wholeheartedly disagree with that because that's suggesting that my son may not be qualified or uh, Chief Ramsey's kid or Anthony Batts here, but, and that's not true. The reality is there are many, many qualified minorities that choose not to be police officers because of what it represents to them, especially in the city that they live. <coughs> so the agencies that are truly having problem recruiting uh, diverse workforces that look like their communities need to look in the mirror and to see if they are delivering the type of police service that makes a young qualified minority want to be a part of that team. Thank you very much. Roberto Villasenor, followed by Cedric Alexander. I just want to thank you all for your comments. They've, they've been very enlightening. And I guess one of the biggest benefits of, of sitting on this panel is getting the opportunity to focus on our profession and to listen to the different viewpoints and the different experiences from people across the country. Yeah. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. I'll bring it closer. And. But one thing that I keep coming back to, right now I think that police across the country are feeling somewhat persecuted, the officers that are out there. I like what Chief Blackwell said that, you know, 95, 99% of the officers are doing a great job out there, but you don't hear about that. You hear the anecdotal incidents that get painted across as if this is representative of all policing that's out there, yet we all know as practitioners that's not the case. And maybe that's our fault. We don't trumpet it enough, or maybe it's the media's fault that they don't expand on it enough as to what's going on. But the problem that I see and the question I'm putting out to the panel there, because you're all very progressive creative leaders that have developed, it sounds like, these philosophies within your agencies. How do you keep the officers buying in to that? How do you overcome the cynicism and you know the rejection that some officers may do? Because they're feeling like no matter what they do good, it doesn't count. So how do we get past that? I, I think there's a couple things that are going on there. I think you got to also look at our customer base or our audience right now. Um, I had an opportunity to pin a paper with uh, Sean Smooth, who's, who's sitting up there on the panel uh, for Harvard. And what we were pointing out is that you have a different uh, youth that's growing up today. And what I mean by that is you have a population that's growing in, growing up where you have uh, priests who have been pedophiles, you've had misconduct at the highest level, we've gone to war over misinformation, so they're going to question us. And it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. And they're going to have the constitutional right to do that, so we have to build uh, employees, police officers that understand what that customer base is going to, uh, going to become. So I think we're going to be we're going to have shots taken, and much like the uh, Chairman Charles Ramsey, Ramsey said, is that this goes through ebbs and flows, too. Uh, during my 30-some-odd years, it's gone through ebbs and flows, and it's going to continue. But we're going to be questioned more and more, and Taz, you're, you're very much aware of that, too, at the same time. But I, I, made a, I did something that uh, probably almost made my mayor cut my head off, but you know, I, I did it from my heart, is I had a young uh, officer that had been on 22 years uh, do a car stop, and um, a guy ended up shooting him in the stomach. 
and he was fighting for his life. And on a cold uh, winter night, I stood in front of a hospital and I said, how many people are going to march for a police officer who just gave his, who gave his life for trying to make our community safe? And that, that just caused an atom bomb in my community making that statement. However, I got notes from around the country, around the world, saying thank you from police officers, moms, dads, wives, uh, sons who have lost their, their loved ones. At some point in time, we have to move away from just Black Lives Matter, because I believe that. I, I think we can evidently see that pretty clearly from where I come from. But all lives matter. There needs to be a reverence for all life across the board. And if you can't, if you can't make that statement on both sides, we have an, a bigger issue there. And what I, what I try to do real quickly is um, make the officers understand that they see situations not as they are, not as the situation is, but as they are, the lenses that they look through. And so when you give them the opportunity to change their perspective by changing some of their daily routine and putting them in environments with a lot of young people, with minorities, with our newcomer populations in some cities, it becomes quickly evident that we're all the same. The young kids, poor, black, white, it doesn't matter. The parents have the same dreams for their kids in urban Baltimore as they do in, you know, uh, Beverly Hills. They want their kids to grow up and be better than them. But what's happened is police officers don't get to engage young people enough, and they don't get to engage people in urban America enough in non-threatening, non-criminalistic environments. And so as we change that, we change biases because we change the lenses. So. So I just need to add just one thought, though, about this uh, issue of Black Lives Matter and Police Lives Matter, because part of the problem is if we allow in our departments the conversations to be framed as if this is the one side and that's the other side, like these are diametrically opposite points of view and you have to pick one or the other, or that to acknowledge that black lives or lives of color matter somehow is to diminish the value and the lives of police officers, that's a problem. So we have to be having conversations with our departments that involve our community about why members of color in our cities have felt marginalized in their relationships with police in the past and what that history looks like that has gotten us to where we are now. If we can have those conversations and then start talking more about how we move forward together and bridge that gap, then we get away from the idea that this is a pick one or the other kind of contest, which I think leads us nowhere. I was going to try not to go into uh, this portion of the conversation, but uh, with everyone saying about the Black Lives Matter, Officers Lives Matter, uh, I have a college-age son, two actually, two college-age sons, one's a sophomore, one's a senior. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, with cop kids, we've had these conversations, you know, dad's a square and, uh, you know, we're not cool, and uh, how police issues their entire lives. Well, they're both criminal justice majors now, and it's kind of uh, funny. But anyway, uh, my oldest son is a senior at uh, uh, Harris Stowe State University in St. Louis, Missouri. And we got into these conversations about, um, you know, this and that and what's going on there. So I finally came to him and I said, well, what are you going to do, son? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to talk about it or are you going to do something about it? Well, um, someone said someone knocked someone's head off. Well, my wife, after our, my son told me that he applied for an internship with the Ferguson Police Department, um, and then he actually got the internship. So he's actually interning this semester with the Ferguson Police Department. His whole perspective has changed now because he sees now the other side. And there's always two sides to a story. So we were talking about the uh, change in the perspective, uh, the open communication with the social media age that we have now. I think we need to, to continue to have the dialogue and the conversation because those persons that are qualified to be uh, part of the law enforcement community of the profession, I think after seeing um, and being exposed to more, uh, that will actually eventually happen. Thank you very much. Before I turn to Cedric Alexander for the last question, Brittany, I think I inadvertently cut you off. You had to follow up. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, my, my last question is for Commissioner Batts. Yes, so you talk about um, the establishment of the Professional Standards and Accountability Bureau as well as the Community Partnership Division. I'd love to kind of know what role civilian oversight currently plays in Baltimore and how those three kind of units interact currently. 
Um, what, what's going on is that we have a, a, police, a police review board that doesn't work very well. And part of when I walked in, moving beyond what the laws are on the book, we started presenting more information to them, making it a very more robust process without being asked. I thought that was necessary. I think just for credibility, that works well. Uh, the review board is pushing right now to expand its powers, and they're working with the mayor to see how they're going to do that, and there's a task force there. They called me They called me in and asked me what I thought my process was, and I said I come from two prior cities that have civilian oversight at this point. And, and then I asked the question, does that work? Um, in whatever form that you're going to put it or you're going to build it, you know, whether it's in the form of the Los Angeles Police Department, whether it's in the form of San Jose, Detroit, New York, et cetera, have those, have those boards given you what you're looking for, which is credibility with the citizens. What I've seen with the boards that I've been on, and they've worked very effectively, they still do not give us the legitimacy that we're looking at. So that construct is there, but does it work and give you what you're, what you're looking for? That's the bottom line. Thank you very much. And we'll end with uh, Cedric Alexander. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Jonah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, so, so here's a question, and, and this is an emerging issue I'm seeing particularly in my community, I don't know whether it's relevant to yours or not. But first, let me just uh, uh, say I totally agree with you, Commissioner Batts, in regards to I think what we want to see show up to our homes is the very best police officers that are out there, regardless of race, color, gender, sexual preference, religious affiliation, whatever the case may be. I agree with you wholly, because at the end of the day, that's what we want is provide good police service. But we all are very mindful of the fact, too, that diversity still is very important in this country. And so we don't want to minimize that or marginalize it in any kind of way as well, too. But here's what I'm seeing. And, and maybe you, each one of you can share from your own departments uh, if you're having this experience in that <clears throat> as much as police has become much more uh, as we're beginning to change, if you will, and each one of you are certainly have uh, uh, articulated a great deal of experience and great things that you're doing in your departments in as much as they are similar, each one of them are very different too, it appears. But uh, are you seeing this uh, uh, whole emerging issue of young people who are coming on your departments who are not staying as long as you and I have stayed? They come on, they stay for a short period. They're new population of kids much like my friend Jose here, who are young millennials. And they have a different way in which they navigate through the world. And many of them will not go into this profession, or any profession for that matter, and stay 20, 25, and 30 years. And to me, that kind of, in some ways, does that complicate the issue? Because if they only stay with you a few years after you put all this time and energy in trying to promote community-oriented policing, and all the positive things that we're trying to change. Many of these young people don't stay very long. Uh, we see high turnover rates. Uh, we see challenged budgets. And we see more and more being asked to police because as these young guys change, you got to train another group of young people you know, as well, too. So it makes your job just that much more challenging. So I'm just kind of curious. That may not be your experience, uh, but it certainly would be helpful to hear uh, from you if it is, because I think that has to become part of the calculus that we do here as we move forward as well, too, because we, you know, to say that we're going to, to uh, uh, make these recommendations that I truly believe are going to make a difference, uh, I think, too, we have to talk about some of these very uh, relevant issues, particularly as it relates to longevity, those who stay in the profession, those as a result of a faltering economy uh, during the mid 2000s, as the economy comes back, what I'm seeing is young people who did go to college and now being able to go get the job they always wanted to have. And so that leaves that void there. Uh, so it makes it challenging for all of us. And then when it comes to diversity, I agree with you as well too, uh, Chief Blackwell, that uh, uh, you and I have had some conversation around that. In fact, we need to talk more about that as well, too. But it's, uh, I think it's something that we have to pay attention to. So I'm just, not to belabor this anymore, but I'm just curious as what y'all thoughts are. Any of you guys can jump in. 
I think that train has kind of left the station. I think if you look at the academic journals out there, they're going to show, and in the paper that Sean and Sean Smoot and I kind of put together is that young people, not just in law enforcement, just in the job market, that all are going to have multiple jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's somewhere close to, it wouldn't be unexpected, somewhere close to between 10 and 20 different jobs in an adult mm -hmm. lifehood. So that is the norm for uh, all young people across, across the spectrum. I remember uh, as a young chief in early 2000, uh, major city chiefs had uh, major discussions on Texas having people moving left and right and California having uh, officers do the same thing and, and move around. So I know we've been discussing that for at least 15 years. So I think, I think that has, that, that, that uh, train has left the station. That's going to happen. It's happening now. Now what's more germane is your question is how do we manage that? And how do you give people to have a stake within your city, within your community? And the community believes that you don't care unless you, actually my community doesn't believe you care about the city unless you're born and raised there. And if you're not born and raised there, then you have to be there about 40 years before we believe in you. So I think we, we really do have to have that conversation. I don't know the answer to it. I'm trying to put all the mechanisms that we possibly can to, I even bring my recruits in the first day and I ask them who their favorite football team. And if they don't say the Ravens, they're doing push-ups. I ask them who they, uh, their, their favorite, uh, their baseball team. They don't say the Orioles. They're doing push-ups. And really, and I, and I joke around with them, but what I tell them, why I say that is I'm from Los Angeles in the Los Angeles area. The Baltimore people in Baltimore could care less where I came from. They could care less that I was a Dodger, a Dodger fan or Angel fan or any of that stuff. They want to know that you love Baltimore, that you understand the rich culture, the rich tapestry of this city. And I started teaching them from that standpoint. So from day one, when they come in, they have to understand whether they're coming from another state somewhere else. It's about this community and what this community represents and the legacies that are there. You know, that's a very good point you brought up, Doc. And um, this right brain generation, these new millennials, they really do want to serve mankind. So as policing changes, they'll stay with the departments. You know, we all came on, all of us, Taz and all of us, Chuck Ramsey, we said in our interviews to become police officers that we want to help people. That's probably what each one of us said. Well, it, policing evolved into just helping crime victims and uh, focusing strictly on that. As we start to broaden our perspective and our platform of engagement with folks, young people that want to become a part of, will want to become a part of that so that they can truly serve mankind and make a difference in some of these young kids' lives, especially in urban America where it's needed. So I have a very young department and yet less than 2% of my department over the last nine years has left to go to another agency. And I think part of that is addressing internal organizational culture because if you're hiring folks and they figure out quickly that until they have five, 10, or 15 years on the job, nobody's really gonna listen to what they have to say. Their ideas really aren't all that respected. They really have very little autonomy to do much of anything inside the department or out in the community. Then I think absolutely folks are gonna move on, especially if you're hiring people with college degrees or who got into this because they wanted to make a difference in the community or whatever the reason. So our theme for hiring has been community of leaders. That's what we call our department. And that means whether you're the most junior officer in the agency or the most tenured command staff, you are considered a leader and we are trying to cultivate the idea that you have a role to play internally in shaping policy, expressing and putting forth new ideas, finding creative ways to engage the community and making a rewarding career for yourself. Even if you stay at the rank of officer for the next 25 years, you're gonna be able to do interesting, important things and you have something to contribute. That's a culture change. Just real quick, uh, we have a motto, hire here, retire here. Uh, it's definitely a challenge for retention in uh, my community in Indian country. Um, and I think by uh, uh, showing that we care, uh, that the community cares about the employee, it definitely helps with our longevity with the employee, but it's a challenge. It's, I think it's a challenge uh, across the country now to keep people uh, with your departments. Well, thank you and thank all of you very much. And please help me uh, welcome Amoris. Thank. <laughs> this panel and now I'll turn things back over to our executive director Ron Davis yes, yes ma'am okay so uh, we're going to be breaking for lunch we'll adjust the calendar a little bit return at uh, 1 and just so those that are watching know and for the audience 
The task force as it breaks for lunch will not and cannot deliberate on the items that we discussed. So we'll just enjoy a good meal. See everybody at 115. To Chief Betts, he says, and I quote, tell him I don't need to jump to play him. Oh. <laughs> tell, tell Charlie, it's on now, baby, it's on.
So we'll be starting in about 30 seconds. Could you point your name over there so people what, might know who you are? It's taped down. Oh, is it taped? Yes. Is there an extra person? <laughs> no. Oh. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Sure. All right, we're going to get started with the afternoon session. Our third panel for today is uh, going to focus on using community policing to reduce crime. And as was mentioned earlier, the bios of all of our panelists can be found on the COPS website. Uh, we're going to begin with Kevin Bethel, Deputy Police Commissioner, Philadelphia Police Department. Commissioner Ramsey, uh, Professor Robertson, and members of the task force on the 21st century policing. First, let me thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today on the work we're doing centered around what we've come to know as a school to prison pipeline in the city of Philadelphia. We all agree that the safety in, in, in and around our schools across the country is paramount. However, zero tolerance that results in children being arrested for minor offenses does not contribute to maintaining a safe environment. It does contribute to the disparity in arrest. Disproportionate numbers of students of color are arrested and unnecessarily exposing students to the trauma of arrest. Lastly, the collateral consequence of arrests stay with students into adulthood, potentially affecting future employment and causing numerous other negative hurdles. To derail any school to prison pipeline, the Philadelphia Police Department collaborated with critical stakeholders surrounding this very critical issue. The Philadelphia Police Department, the Philadelphia Department of Human Services, the school district, the district attorney's office, the Philadelphia Family Court, and other stakeholders implemented a responsible and innovative police diversion program. Philadelphia police and schools are changing the management of students who have, who have committed delinquent acts on or near Philadelphia school premises. Stakeholders agree that it is in the best interest of students and community members and certain summary and misdemeanor delinquent acts be handled by the school system in conjunction with supportive services without filing a delinquency complaint with the court. By linking youth with community-based services, police are able to divert the appropriate low-risk youth from arrest and formal delinquency processing while connecting youth and family with necessary services. Youth are referred to the nearest community-based DHS intensive preventive services program. IP IPS programs provide comprehensive, intensive early intervention programming the youth exhibiting high-risk or at-risk behavior. The community-based IPS program's core components include academic support, social and emotional competency building, mentoring, recreation, work-ready programming, community service engagement, and parental involvement. The school district currently enrolls approximately 142,000 students in grades K through 12, with an overwhelming majority of students coming from low-income families more than 87% qualify for free or reduced price lunch, and historically underserved racial minorities, more than 71% are African American or Latino. In the 2012-2014 school year, there were over 7,500 serious incidents that resulted in over 33,000 suspensions and over 1,500 arrests. The Philadelphia Police Department developed the school diversion program after discerning that too many youth were unnecessarily arrested and referred to the court system for low-level acts. In cases where school principals and other administrators turn to the police department to use arrest and juvenile justice referrals as disciplinary action, the negative consequences for students can be significant. Although the school district removed in zero tolerance in 2012, we have continued to work with the district and its officials to use the school diversion program as a means of keeping students out of the juvenile justice system and away from the negative consequences that could arise from the contact with the system. How does the school police diversion process work? When a delinquent act occurs in the school, school police first contact the Philadelphia Police Department. 
The responding PPD officer reviews school records, and based on information gathered, the PPD officer called the Diversion Intake Center, staffed by police officers and social workers, who determines whether or not the student is eligible for diversion. Youth are, youth are eligible for the Diversion Delinquency Program if they're over the age of 10, have no previous record, previous not guilty or withdrawn offenses included, and have committed certain offenses for which diversion is appropriate. Within 72 hours of the alleged delinquent act, the DH diversion social worker makes a visit to the student's home and assesses the student with regard to risk factors such as alienation, rebelliousness, delinquent friends, rental incarceration, alcohol, and or drug abuse. The DH worker then speaks with the child, parent, guardian, to develop appropriate interventions. Youth are then referred to six community-based intention preventive services programs. Families that fail to participate are visited by police officers to explain the purpose of the program and the importance of the family and student participating. Since the start of the school year in September 9, 2014, 267 students have been diverted under the school diversion program. A total of 332 students have been diverted since we began the program in 214 schools last May. The racial breakdown is as follows, African American 74%, Hispanic 16%, white 9%, and Asian 1%. Moreover, the school district, under the direction of Superintendent Dr. Height, have fully embraced the program. Through our combined efforts, the arrest for the school year to date is down 57% from 846 arrests last year to 363 arrests as of January 31st. Recently, the department, with the support of Family Court, applied for and was awarded the School Justice Collaboration Program Grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention to able keeping kids out of school, in school, and out of court grant. The war allows us to further enhance the program by providing communication and conflict resolution for all sworn and non-sworn school police officers. The final component enabled us to expand the analysis of the school diversion program. Dr. Naomi Goldstein and her research team from the Department of Psychology at Drexel University in Philadelphia will examine the effectiveness of the program and its impact within the individual schools for individual youth. In closing, there's already been testimony at these, at these sessions about procedural justice, at times called procedural fairness. How fair can it be that prior to instituting our program, a 10-year-old child who walked into our schools with a pair of scissors in a book bag would be arrested taken to a processing location, fingerprinted and photographed. How fair can it be that a teenager caught with marijuana and self-medicating herself due to a traumatic event is arrested and processed in the same manner? Law enforcement can no longer be an extension of discipline. Zero tolerance can no longer be our charge when dealing with many of our young people in our schools. We can no longer ignore the fact that arrests in our schools across the nation are disproportionate, affecting students of color at a significantly higher rate. Many of these students come from impoverished communities and bring with them the trauma and the difficulties these environments create. If we are to gain true legitimacy in our communities across the country and put procedural justice into action, I submit that joining in collaboration with local, state, and federal partners to attack the school to prison pipeline must be our top priorities. I thank you again for the honor of speaking with you today. And thank you. Next, we'll hear from Melissa Jones, Senior Program Officer, Boston's Local Initiative Support Corporation. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here today to speak to you to an issue that's so important to me personally, to my organization, and to the neighborhoods that we're working with. I will speak to you today from a slightly different perspective uh, from the rest of the panel. I am not the law. <laughs> uh, rather, I'm a community developer and I'm a community organizer. And it's that from that trade and from that um, scope of living that my comments are derived here today. Uh, and as importantly, um, it's my perspective comes from my work at LISC. LISC, as many of you know, is one of the nation's largest nonprofit community development support organizations. We operate in 30 cities around the country, supporting hundreds of neighborhoods in comprehensive community revitalization. We've operated for 35 years. We've been mobilizing corporate, government, and philanthropic support to ensure that distressed neighborhoods have the resources they need to transform. For 21 of those years, LISC has run a very significant uh, community safety initiative, including collecting lessons learned and developing over 100 case studies documenting community development successes in fighting crime, particularly focused on the built environment. I'm based in LISC's Boston office, and in my city, like around the country, we are particularly concerned about neighborhoods 
uh, where concentrated poverty, bright, blight, and crime are co-located. Because crime happens in a place, we work to make the place less hospitable to crime. And because ultimately our goal is improved quality of life, we work with local leaders to transform crime hotspots to community assets that provide more permanent crime relief. Take the example of Hendry Street in Boston. A residential block in Boston, it was ground zero for the foreclosures during the foreclosure crisis. And similar to stories in many other cities, local gangs had taken vacant properties, um, taken them over there, and really terrorized neighbors. It was a very difficult block to police. And in 2009, Boston Police Department teamed up with local nonprofit developer, Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation, and agencies across the city to take that block back. This is not easy work. It required the partners to take control of 18 vacant parcels um, and properties overrun by crime. It also required community organizers to draw residents out of their home to launch a neighborhood action group. But that work paid off. And those properties are now owned and occupied by good neighbors. Hendry Street went from being one of the city's biggest hotspots to a vibrant street that is now crime free. This worked for three reasons that are integral parts of LISC's national strategy. The first one is a focus on local leadership identification and development. Uh, for example, in Boston, our Resilient Communities, Resilient Families Initiative has engaged more than 1,500 people via one-on-ones, meetings, surveys, events, et cetera, in three of our highest crime neighborhoods. Their input has yielded formal plans for neighborhoods and more importantly, leaders emerged who have formed local steering committees of residents and organizations who now serve in an ongoing, structured way to do problem solving in neighborhoods. People need a place to go to that they can find, that they can access, that they can trust where that problem solving can happen. Our second strategy is intensive capacity building to get projects done. We're talking about more than ongoing communication between officers and, and community members. We're talking about high intense technical capacity to retake vacant properties, to make problem properties into something new. So we ensure that strong organizations have the financial and technical resources to make those physical changes happen, to acquire the drug houses and turn them into quality family homes, or rehab commercial spaces for small business. We have seen again and again that community organizations, when well-resourced and skilled, create changes through new housing, through transit, infrastructure, and jobs that truly help reshape neighborhoods. And third, our third strategy is a focus on police partnership. All of this work includes building strategic partnerships between community groups and police, informed by data, so that their actions reinforce each other as they did on Hendry Street in Boston. Hendry Street is not an isolated success case for us. It's also not the only one in Boston or in the LISC network. There are hundreds of other examples across LISC network that shows us that collaborative problem solving between police and community groups that involve revisioning the built environment make big change. And there is increasing support in research and environmental criminology and collective efficacy that continues to build this case. I will close by offering four recommendations based on our experience of what is working around the country. One, support policies and programs that give police departments the resources they need so police can be there, as they were on Hendry Street, working as partners on crime prevention and community building, not solely on enforcement and suppression. Two, champion programs that value community engagement and provide resources to build the capacity of community organizations. As you know, community building between police and residents is not easy. We need strong organizations who can help build the trust needed both in law enforcement and in the community to have people ready and willing to do real problem solving together. Three, ensure there is adequate funding for training related to community police problem solving and high quality technical assistance. In Boston, it was game changing to bring police officers and community develop, development leaders together for joint trainings on things like the Sarah Method and crime prevention through environmental design. They emerged with a common language that they wouldn't have had before and a methodology for how they could work together to describe specific, to address specific crime problems. And finally, encourage efforts to reduce crime in the context of broader neighborhood revitalization. We recommend that the administration support programs like the Burn Criminal Justice Innovation that champions this approach. In Massachusetts, we have three BCJI sites. There are 46 nationwide. 
that are pursuing data-driven, community-oriented responses to their worst crime hotspots. Linked with developments in the physical environment, we believe this makes a big difference. I, wel fur I welcome further, I'm going to close here, <laughs> but I welcome further discussion with the task force about how these recommendations can benefit communities nationally, and thank you again for the opportunity. And thank you very much. Uh, next we'll go to David Kennedy, Professor, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Thank you. This is an extremely important process and a stellar panel I'm looking at. And thanks for having me. So my, my work focuses on I think the core of the, the focus for the task force, which is not exclusively but primarily uh, alienated communities of color with what we regard as serious public safety problems. And those neighborhoods in public safety terms endure three um, very important closely linked issues. They have persistent high levels of violence. They have high levels of incarceration, what we can even call mass incarceration, and persistent what they regard as intrusive policing. And they have broken relationships with law enforcement, especially the police. And I've been asked to talk about community policing in that context. I'm old enough and cranky enough to be tired of all the policings community policing and problem oriented policing and zero tolerance policing and intelligence led policing and I think it's increasingly clear that there's good policing and there's bad policing. And the principles of what's emerging as good policing I think are now increasingly evident. The first I would say is policing has no Hippocratic oath but if it did it would begin with first do no harm. So we know that Criminal justice is like chemotherapy. It can save your life, but it's always coming at a cost. It can kill you if we get it wrong. And we know that locking up entire neighborhoods hurts them and makes crime worse. We know that intrusive policing damages legitimacy and can make crime worse. We know that the implicit bias we all suffer from in law enforcement settings can lead to things that look like racism even if they're not. And in sum, we know that what we do in the name of crime prevention can damage communities and what med medicine calls iatrogenic conditions caused by treatment should be avoided. We should always say, seek, second principle, to strengthen the natural capacity of communities to prevent crime. We know that informal social control is a far more powerful driver of public safety than the actions of the state. We should seek always as a first step to seek to use the power of the state to mobilize informal social control. There are lots of examples of this. Many people here have talked about ceasefire. Ceasefire brings community voices in contact with core offenders and establishes community norms. In policing, there's a long tradition of third-party policing focusing on landlords and such. Connie Rice has been involved with the uh, Watts Gang Task Force and the um, Community Safety Partnership in South Central, which actively works through the police to mobilize community figures. Also in LA and elsewhere, police are working with ex-offender interventionists and outreach workers who can be independent producers of public safety in the neighborhoods untapped important capacities. Third principle is we should seek in all of our actions to strengthen legitimacy. I wish people could, in the general public, hear the panel we heard <clears throat> right before lunch in which police chief after police chief said, we have done harm, we have got this wrong, we have unintentionally done damage, we're gonna own that and we're going to admit it as a basis for moving forward. Director of the FBI said yesterday in public in Washington, D.C., I keep a copy on my desk of the wiretap authorization signed by Robert Kennedy to surveil Martin Luther King. And I keep it there because it was wrong and I need to remember that it's wrong. Again, when Connie Rice said, this is what I needed to do in Watts, 
what she was really talking about was broking, brokering reconciliation between the LAPD and elders in South Central. And we know that this can be done. We know that we can teach line officers the principles of procedural justice. Professor Mears has written something that now nearly every Chicago police officer is going through. It is teaching them how to apply procedural justice in every contact they have with the public. Next principle is we should get deterrence right. When we can persuade somebody not to do something rather than laying hands on them, we get compliance without getting arrested and incarceration. This is built into multiple now proved approaches, ceasefire, Chicago PSN, Hawaii Hope, um, all now either carefully evaluated in social science terms or generating real results on the ground. We know that we can tell core offenders to stop and that they will respect that. And when none of that works, and it will not always work, we need to use enforcement as strategically and sparingly as possible. We should minimize the use of the criminal sanction as greatly as is consistent with the public safety. And um, Chief Bethel did not talk about it, but in the focused deterrence operation in South Philadelphia, he has officers who have figured out that they can use things like cutting off gang members' stolen power and cable TV as a sanction for actually killing people, and that when they know that's coming, that is, in fact, as effective as federal prison two or three years down the line. Mark Kleiman, looking at the role of sanction in Hawaii Hope, again, very carefully evaluated, asked, what, what is the minimal level of sanction required? We'll say, we haven't found the lower bound yet. So we know that when we have to apply the law, we can do it much more sparingly than we do. And we, when we take all of those things together, it begins to be the template for what we all ought to be doing in policing. Thank you very much. Next, we'll go to uh, J. Scott Thompson, Chief, Camden County Police Department. Good afternoon. Co-Chairs, Commissioner Charles Ramsey and Lori Robinson, thank you for the invitation to provide testimony for the President's, 21st task force, uh, President's Task Force on 21st Policing. Uh, it is a tremendous honor. This is a watershed moment for American policing. We must acknowledge the grievances of the public, take inventory of ourselves, be committed to redress, and invite the community to have a hand on the steering wheel as we seek a new destination. In 2012, Camden, New Jersey, a city of 77,000, that is 96% minority, had 67 murders. The city had the dubious distinction of the highest rates in the nation for crime, poverty, and single parent households. The murder rate was 17 times the national average, eclipsing even the most violent third world countries. This was further exasperated by high levels of mistrust of the police. On May 1st, 2013, we created a new police organization to address the extreme challenges knowing that effective and sustainable public safety gains begins and ends with community policing. Community policing must be the core principle which lies at the foundation of a police department's culture. It is not an option. Community policing is an affirmative obligation. The only way to significantly reduce fear, crime, and disorder and then sustain these gains is to leverage the greatest force multiplier there is, the people of the community. So how do we get people to take this leap of faith with the police? The answer in a single word is trust. The public must trust its police. This trust is communicated through our actions and not our words. The only way trust is gained and built upon is through constant human contact. Classroom training for cultural diversity and sensitivity is critical as a starting point, but understanding and empathy of another is experientially learned. Police interactions with the people of the community cannot be limited to 911 emergency calls or during investigations for infractions of the law. This must not be the lens through which we view and experience each other. Our contact must be consistent with concern, yet respectful to people's rights to decline interaction to non-investigatory dialogue. American cities will never be made safer through police tactics akin to militarization. As little as 24 months ago, Camden had a 175 open-air 
flagrant drug markets within its nine square miles. Historically, we would attempt to arrest our way through this problem, ultimately causing more harm than repair and never achieving the objective. But now we've embraced our role as guardians and prevent drug dealing through walking beats and bicycle patrols. Parents have begun to let their children play in front of their houses. Corners that once held narcotic buyers and sellers are now home to pick up games of street ball, foot races, and push up competitions between the neighborhood cop and the kids. The community is safer through less incarceration as we view handcuffs as a tool of last resort. Police must learn of the issues that matter most to the community, then enforce the law with the people and not unilaterally upon them. And when this is performed, it must never be performed with a zero tolerance mentality, nor ignoring the tenets of procedural justice and legitimacy. The community with whom we interact are deserving of an explanation of our actions. Officers must be routinely trained and made aware of traditional habits that, albeit lawful, aggravate and drive apart community relations. Just because we can doesn't always mean we should. Procedural justice and police legitimacy should be integrated in the core curriculum at all police training academies and departmental and service training across the country. When violent crime escalates, police must proceed with a laser-like focus on the criminals responsible and not broadly upon the community in which the crimes are occurring. We must smartly transition from hot spots to hot people. In layman's terms, we must fish with a spear and not a net. The importance of this cannot be overstated and is central to most of the contention between minority communities and the police. Far too often, after an incident of violence, anxiety runs high, bracing for the irony of protection through heavy-handed enforcement tactics that will soon sweep through their neighborhoods. The police re-victimization polarizes the people we are trying to safeguard while creating the concoction for a flashpoint. Last summer in Camden, our progress was challenged with a spate of gang shootings. We found a different approach that was far more effective, cost efficient, and was a human investment that would return significant peace dividends. We hired Mr. Softy trucks onto the same corners, giving away free cones of ice cream. The sweltering summer streets were immediately flooded with children and parents who connected with their neighborhood cop like never before. The sounds of gunshots and sirens were replaced with laughter and conversation, key ingredients in the recipe of trust. Police must pivot from ineffective and damaging tactics to strategies that work. Anything less is policing malpractice. For the mutual benefit of the officer and the community, officers must be closely mentored, coached, and monitored. Better supervision is ensured and crisis is often avoided when issues can be identified with early warning systems. Although we still have a lot more work to do, the progress thus far in Camden has been extremely promising. In less than two years, murders and shootings have been reduced by more than half. But more important than crime statistics is the enhanced sense of safety. The change is visceral. Most notable is a recent follow-up survey of children that report feeling safer walking to and from school. And not coincidentally, test scores have risen as well. A rising tide lifts all boats. Finally, it is critically important for police organizations not to solely measure their effectiveness by traditional outputs such as uniform crime reports, arrest, tickets issued, or people detained. People measure safety by their lack of fear or concern to be able to enjoy their neighborhood, and so should we. Thank you very much. And thank you. And finally, we will hear from George Turner, Chief of the Atlanta, Georgia Police Department. Thank you uh, to the panel. I wanted to um, start by saying I've filed my testimony and I want to do a good, try to do a good job of summarizing what I've uh, submitted to you. Uh, I want to start by telling a story. Uh, I started uh, policing in the city of Atlanta more than 35 years ago. I was raised in the housing projects of Atlanta and I was fortunate enough to be sworn in as the police chief in 2010. At that time, we had two major issues that really created and caused problems for our city. First, we had a rogue uh, and a narcotics team that went in and uh, created a warrant and ultimately in the, as they entered, they shot and killed a 92-year-old woman. Secondly, we had a vice unit that go, went into a gay club and because of some potential illegal activities, put everybody down on the ground and left them there for more than an hour. So we had lost the trust in the community and we had to do something different. When I was sworn in in 2010, it was clear to me that I wanted to talk about three things. First, about community policing and what that simply meant and how we needed to change that. And then secondly, our technology increases and how we moved our police department to a different place. 
And finally, reinvesting in our public and our human resources and our officers. So first, how we were able to be successful with community policing and reducing our crime. I want to first talk about where we started. We started really by going to every community. I visited more than 150 community meetings the first year that I was police chief. Not just to begin having conversations, but began to have dialogue and to be accountable to those citizens and to simply say, give us an opportunity to make our words our actions. And then we also visited every police officer in the Atlanta Police Department and began to talk with them about what our new model was going to be around community policing. That was important because we wanted them to understand that the investment in each, in end of each person that was running a beat had the inclusion of trying to be protected and involved in the day-to-day -day operation of our, on our operation. We created a five-year strategic plan. And one of the objectives in the, in the plan was community engagement. It allowed us to then craft a different vision and mission statement that was inclusive and then celebrated the partnership with our community. As a result, over the last five years, we've had a reduction in, of 22% in overall part one crimes, and we are lower in crime than we've ever been in, since 1962. Over the last five years, less than 100 people have, uh, have been murdered in our city, and we consistently average more than 15 to 20% above the national average on clear-ups. As a matter of fact, we're in the process of being featured on First 48 and on A&E, and I would encourage you to look at that, that series. It is in, no doubt to me in my policing philosophy that community policing will continue to pay a large dividend in what we and how we police in years to come. I started off talking about community policing when I first took over. What does that look like? It means that we have what we call a homicide canvas initiative, that when leads are, grow cold in communities, that we go out and, and go door to door in business to business, with, not just with officers, but with community and law enforcement and also elected officials to really sh shake up those uh, leads that we need to have to solve those crimes. Community liaison units that allow us to really partner with our community and really focus on how we want to community to police our, their communities. Community focus groups to determine exactly where and how we even place our technology like our, our video integration centers and where that, those cameras should be erected. Our predictive crime analysis through uh, our community liaison unit and then our GLTB liaison, which we designed and pushed out an SOP that really dealt with a lot of challenges that, we, that was created during that vice uh, situation that I talked about earlier. Then through technology, we have provided a business and private sector engagement that allowed through our police foundation to put more than 3,600 cameras in the public and private sector that we have in one singleized location that we can utilize to have us, give us situational awareness as we deploy our resources. And then finally, our human development of our officers. We developed the Atlanta Police Leadership Institute, which allow us to lead and provide officers when they come into our organization, the opportunity to lead from the place that they stand. And then finally, developing scholarships through a private sector source so that officers can continue to their education and then provide additional training for officers so that they can understand the merits of community policing. So as we move forward uh, through this whole process, I'm looking forward to the questions that you'll have, but I'm confident that this, this task force will provide leadership as we move forward in this country about a profession that I absolutely adore and think that we have a obligation to continue to provide direction as we move forward in this profession. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to, uh, I'm gonna turn to the uh, task force members mm -hmm and they will be called on in the order in which they've indicated they have a question for the panel. We're going to start with Tracy Mears, who will be followed by Roberto Villasenor. Um, <laughs> that was extremely informative, and um, I have to say I really enjoyed reading um, Deputy Commissioner the account of, of Philadelphia's work. I have questions for you and for Ms. Jones. They're basically the same question, 
but they're getting at different levels of how you get the kind of collaboration among relevant um, government agencies to pull off these kinds of strategies that you described. So just a little bit of background. This is our third listening session, and we've had uh, witnesses talk about different ways of incentivizing or, or mandating different kinds of strategies, often focused on um, what the Department of Justice can do or, or maybe um, civil rights the, uh, or, or some other organization like that. What I thought was very interesting about both of your presentations was that um, with respect to your presentation, Ms. Jones, you mentioned um, you know, the effective programs in this area come from HUD or, or different, you know, and then you talk about um, having different agencies within the federal government work together. And then you, Deputy Commissioner, talk about different agencies in Philadelphia working together to pull off the program. And I was wondering if each of you could speak to, at least in your experience, um, just how that collaboration works. So for you, Deputy Commissioner, was it that the police department took the leading role in getting the different agencies in the city to work together? Was it a, a state incentive or something? And then for you, uh, Ms. Jones, how do you, or could you offer some ideas about how to get multiple agencies at the federal level to collaborate to pull off these kinds of important and effective strategies? Ladies first. I'll start. So, so first it starts with leadership. You know, I worked for Commissioner Ross and Commissioner Ramsey, and, and, and I, I had an issue with the number of young people who were getting arrested in the schools. Uh, but all too often I hear about collaboration, and everybody wants to sit behind an email or a phone call and call that collaboration. Collaboration means you have to get out of your chair, get on the ground, and meet people on their locale. You have to sit in there, look them in the face, and ask them very pointed questions and get some pointed answers back. And so that's what I did. I started down that process meeting with every, of the, every entity that was involved in these agencies and talked about what my vision was. Now, when you sit there and you looked at 85% of those kids we were arresting were getting diverted. So someone was sitting in another side of a room. I take these kids out of these schools, arrest them, and then someone sits in another locale and says, that kid should be diverted. So that didn't make any sense. I said, why wouldn't I divert him and avoid the trauma arrest at the beginning? And so when we started that process, I'm part of the DMC committee, a part of the JDAI Collaborative Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative. And so I started to bring that information into that collaborative and saying, how can we do these things differently? Also realizing there was programs already there. The juvenile justice system already had these programs, so they didn't recreate anything. And so as I started to put that in that conversation and have that conversation, I also came in the room with empathy. And also came in the room with knowing, guess what? I am not the big guy in charge right now. So when I go into a room with DHS and their deputy commissioners, I humble myself to understand that I need something from you. I can't take it from you. You have to give it to me. And so, so I went about that process really respecting each and every one of those entities involved. And so as we walked through that process and I threw out that I don't want to take kids into custody, my DHS deputy commissioner says, hey, listen, I'll have, you can have these programs. And so we started down that road. And even when we got to the MOU, I walked each and every, to the MOU, I walked that to those department heads personally and asked them to personally sign it. And it's not about me, it's not about any, the org, it's about the entire collective group. And, and so I made everyone very inclusive in that process. So there are actually several programs now that make it easier than it has been to do um, cross-departmental, cross-agency work. Uh, so there's BCJI, there's the Promise Neighborhoods Program, and there's the Choice Neighborhoods Program. And they each come with funding streams that help local neighborhoods that already have organizations in place deliver on the projects they want to deliver on cross and cross sector. Uh, so Boston is lucky, and actually a lot of cities are, in having community organizations that focus not just in an issue area, but in a neighborhood and a place. And so if, if your focus is the development of better quality of life in a place and in a neighborhood, then you're thinking about multiple factors impacting that neighborhood. And then you're thinking about the multiple funding streams from the position of being on the ground that would help you deliver on those programs. And so you start looking at HUD and you start seeing the programs HUD has come through and they're different at different times. The example I used used neighborhood stabilization funds that were available at that time to acquire those properties. 
There's now funds through Choice Neighborhoods to do redevelopment of public housing and affordable housing in neighborhoods. That's then where people look next. Um, and it continues in that way. So if you have organizations that you're continually building capacity in, which was one of our recommendations, then you have an opportunity to have neighbor neighborhood organizations that are flexible enough to figure out how to pull down the range of funding streams you need to transform. Ms. Myers, I, I'd like to just uh, offer a couple of things. We're doing something very similar with the juvenile diversion process. And what we were able to do, we got a $200,000 grant through the, BJ, uh, the, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council through our state by way of COPS through burn grants. And what we were able to do, uh, we utilized utilize that $200,000 to really get NGOs involved, to really craft a different kind of opportunity for juveniles. And so we now have lower line offenders doing very similar to what uh, Philadelphia are doing. We're taking those uh, individuals to those locations, doing triages on those individuals, and providing resources that they need so that they can continue to be whole. Thank you very much. Roberto Villasenor, followed by Brian Stevenson. I have two questions. Um, the first is for Mr. Kennedy. You made a very interesting statement that I keyed on. Um, we need to strengthen the natural capacity of communities to prevent crime. I'd like to see if you could expand on that a little bit more. Uh, maybe I missed it in your presentation, but I'd like to hear about that a little bit more. So we have lots and lots and lots of concrete examples of that. And the, there's a huge scholarly literature in all kinds of different fields that boils down to the fact, which is that the, the natural power of communities and, and friendship networks and kinship networks and such to set standards for right and wrong behavior in neighborhoods is just infinitely more powerful than what the cops and the courts can do. Um, and the way the academic community has usually looked at that is to make the distinction between communities that are safe and aren't, and they look sort of into root causes and collective efficacy and things like that. It's turning out to also be true that you can mobilize those resources very deliberately, and we can be every bit as purposeful about that as we are in designing a, a you know, school to work program or a narcotics entry rate or something like that. And one, one example of this is what was called the Moral Voice Initiative in Cincinnati. So Cincinnati PD knew who the impact players in gang violence in the Avondale neighborhood were. They passed those names on to the Community Police Partnering Center in Cincinnati, which was a product of the collaborative agreement. The Partnering Center found community people who had their own direct network, personal connections to those individuals. And they designed a process of going out, finding those guys in the community, talking with their families, saying, we know what's going on. We don't want you either killed or locked up. The community really needs this to stop. And we have all kinds of support available for you. They made about a dozen of those contacts. There'd been about a dozen homicides in that neighborhood in the year previously, and there wasn't another one for 18 months. So w when we know, as we do know, that especially serious violent crime is driven by very small numbers of people who are identifiable, it becomes possible to think very seriously about finding the folks in the community who have standing and influence over those folks and then helping design the contact that will address the situation. Thank you very much. The second question, I, I've been kind of forming over the past listening sessions, and a couple of the panels earlier today commented on it, and as a police chief, and I listened to all the police chiefs come out here, and, and everyone is toting reductions in crime, and we've all across the nation experience for the past five years reductions in crime. And the part that is making me wonder is that it seems like agencies that are strong proponents are achieving reductions in crime and agencies that don't really play that instrument are receiving strong reductions in crime. So I'm worried about a couple things there is, do any of you feel that 
There's other things such as apathy or, or nature, because a comment was said earlier today, if we reach the point where we're not connected with our communities enough that people just stop calling us, and then that begins to look like there's reduction in crime when maybe there's really separation between police and community. I go back to, um, with the indulgence of Ms. Rice here, because we had a discussion on Peel's principles of policing early on. It says, to recognize always that the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder and not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with them. Well, we're seeing the absence of crime but we're definitely seeing the visible actions of police dealing with them. So it seems like there's a disconnect there. And I'm beginning to wonder why is that there? And I'm just opening that up to anyone who wants to comment. I'll, I'll try that. Uh, I, I believe a couple of things. First, I believe that we as police chiefs, we have to guard our initiative as it relates to operational. I think that there are not a single police chief around the table, around the country that would say that community policing do not uh, demand a, a level of engagement as far as uh, law enforcement and, and putting handcuffs on individuals. We have to be smarter, and I think that you, you're seeing that, where we are targeting individuals that are constantly repeat offenders in our neighborhoods. But at the same time, we're getting information from communities as we engage on who those offenders are. Although our information and our data <coughs> is, is suggesting that, we have to rely on communities as well. We can talk about all the various different policing as you've talked about, Dr. Kennedy, but the fact is it's really around how we engage in our community, how we utilize that information in that engagement to solve crime and solve problems, and how we uh, really determine if we're successful. Clearly, if we're not reducing crime, very few of us will keep our jobs, as you know. But at the same time, we have to be able to gauge what the community think about our actions. And I think it's important that we utilize, what I do is utilize focus groups with the community, constantly communicating with them and giving them a voice in everything that we attempt to do. And so I believe that it's important for us to understand that it is a combination of both good police tactics as well as community engagement that drive these changes. Ryan Stevenson, followed by Connie Rice. So I have uh, two questions as well. And again, I want to thank all of you for your presentations. Um, and the first is, 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 is to you, Mr. Bethel. I, I was really intrigued by your comments about the impacts on children when they have these police encounters and the trauma that creates. Uh, I've been working with very young kids who, uh, 10, 11, who are handcuffed and who really struggle for a very long period of time just from that experience itself. And I'm wondering whether you have developed age-specific policies and protocols that the line officers implement when they are dealing with uh, younger children that you can talk a little bit about. Because I'm just, one of those things, when we did research on this, we didn't find m many departments to have any kind of age protocols in terms of police and, and encounters with children, particularly in the, in the school context. And then my, I'll just put both questions out there be really interested in, in getting uh, the perspectives of the rest of the panel. Uh, um, the chiefs have talked about uh, focus groups and, and outre outreach to particular community members. And I'm interested in how you value that or how you relate that to the presence of civilian review boards because we've been hearing a lot about that. And I'd like your opinions about the utility of the review boards in the process that you've been describing. And if you think they are useful, and this is something maybe uh, David and Ms. Jones can comment on, what are the one or two components that you think are key? Uh, one of the challenges we have is that we're hearing mostly from big cities or medium-sized cities. There's a lot of communities out there that aren't big, but we still want to see some of these uh, good ideas implemented. And I'd love your thoughts on just how we should prioritize the components that you think work. But so very briefly, I'm, as we evolve into this trauma-informed care and, and I became even better educated, it, it became a process of of training our folks and, and our men and women that charge. So we have to do a much better job in that. So I can't even begin to tell you that we have this all expansive program. Mm -hmm. So uh, for us in the state of Pennsylvania, 10 years or older is chargeable. So a kid under the age of 10 is not. But I, I can tell you, I brought 84 of my school officers into this program and they're the ones who administer the doses in our, in our diversion program. And I can't tell you how excited these 84 officers were. The worst thing I did was tell them I was gonna start the program and wait 30 days to do it. 
because they sat there. I mean, imagine I tell them that we have a program that's going to let kids go, and they have the next day do a 10-year-old child who comes in with pepper spray, who puts pepper spray on a sandwich, and because they believe it's pepper, and then they're called to be charged and to be locked up and may have to take that child away. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have those officers, when we're exposing to those opportunities and give those, those chances, that they are more than willing to embrace to do something different with a child. And so as I talked to Commissioner Ramsey and Commissioner Ross, the goal is as this program evolves, that this will become a citywide initiative so that when we engage all of our young people in this manner for the first time, that we have a choice. If, if I only give my officers a handcuffs and send them into these neighborhoods with no other tools, then yeah, we get all of that backflow. But what happens when they walk into a community and have in their tool bag ability to divert a child who just a retail theft for the first time, never ever been arrested before, and they can take that child and send him to the services? Because in our program, we don't, those kids, most of these kids never knew they were arrested. We never handcuff them. They stay at the school. So and oftentimes, we don't even have to engage them in a way that even makes them believe they've been affected by that trauma. But I think that's where our charge should be. We should spend a lot more time understanding the adolescent behavior, understanding what many of these children are going through. Uh, and and it's, it's astounding. I can tell you story as a story about how we're finding and being exposed to what our kids are really, the trauma that they're affected by when they walk into these schools. You know, when you have a young lady who's medicating herself because her family's her parents are getting divorced, and her friends say, hey, let's smoke weed. It'll make you feel better. And she smokes weed on her way to school. That's big. Mm -hmm. you know, and now that I've got my men and women behind the scenes and seeing those stories, my officers actually go to these houses and knock on these doors and tell parents, you need to get your kid in these programs because we can help you. And they're getting full, uh, full family services, parents who can't keep uh, keeping the daughter home because they don't have daycare. But DHS comes in and says, well, we're going to give you a credit to have daycare, and that child can be in school. Those are game changers. Those are the things that are going to make these young people, when they walk out of that, when my police officers say, oh, Kevin Bethel, he's the guy that saved my life potentially. Mm -hmm. And so we're finding those stories over and over again. And those stories are being told across America. You know, and when you look at these statistics of what these arrests are doing to our young people across the nation, we really have to take it from a, look, a bigger lens. As relates to citizen oversight, I encourage uh, citizen oversight. I think that you'll see the majority of uh, large cities uh, that have some level of citizen oversight, but I think that one of the most consistent things that you would find, either a subpoena power so that the officers are impelled to come and testify before the Civilian Review Board. Uh, I, I avoided that by simply changing my SOP, my standard operation procedure, and, to, and required our officers to go and stand and sit in front of the Citizen Review Board. We think it's important that if we have that kind, of, that kind of clarity in our direction, then what has happened, the majority of the outcomes have been very consistent with what we've discovered in our Office, office of Professional Standard Investigations. So I, I am far from a civilian review expert. So these are observations and thoughts rather than real expertise. Um, so there's, there's a function of, of outside review which is about incidents. And I think the higher the level of distrust in the, the agency itself and its procedures, the more important that gets. And that can clearly be beneficial. Um, it's clearly gonna be on the table and there's gonna be work in that direction. One would hope that as legitimacy and trust improves that that particular function becomes less necessary. You know, we'll see about that. But in addition, when I think about this, I think, for example, about what doctors do. So doctors always do regular case reviews and they do them collectively. And the, the goal is not to figure out whose ticket should be taken away or who should be indicted for malpractice. It's to figure out what went wrong, identify problems, figure out how to do continuous process improvement. And Commissioner Bethel's story about we're arresting them, they go across the city, they get released again, and everybody involved knows that's going on. And there's no locus to say this is really dumb, we should fix it. And civilian review boards could, could play that function. Um, uh, groups like the Center for Policing Equity have been able to develop early warning systems for the worst markers for implicit bias, which we're all very concerned about at this point. Um, and things like focus groups, which sound sort of soft and, and loose, are actually really good mechanisms 
for, for surfacing things that, and again, you know this in criminal justice, we know lots and lots and lots of very important problems and failures, and somehow we never find the critical mass to actually deal with them. And having kind of outside advice and support for that kind of process, I think, could be very helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Connie Rice, followed by Jose Lopez. Is this on? No, it's on. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for your testimony. It's been fabulous testimony. It really has from each of you. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Kennedy. You have observed the LA transformation in LAPD. Could you please explain to this panel why I keep going on about it? They're tired of hearing about it from me. I'd like for them to hear about it from somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, happy to play that role. Set the record straight. Not a not a doctor. Um, there there are those here who have who have been there. You have an honorary doctor, David. Um, forget it. You've got the equivalent uh, of a doctorate. So um, just hang it up. Go I try ahead. to I try to do a good job anyway. So, um, I, you keep coming back to it. I think because it's. I, I think it's nearly miraculous what's happened in LA, yeah. and I'm, I, I don't do polite. I'm, I'm nasty, and um, it is mm -hmm. extraordinary what's happened there. I mean, I've been involved in LA regularly since the mid 1980s, and it, it, it was the hardest shell, hardest core, most militaristic. Uh, it was politically insulated, as you know, until after. Um, Rodney King, when, when the chief in LAPD had civil service protection, he didn't care, he didn't have to, and they didn't care, and they didn't have to. Um, they viewed the enemy, the, the community as an enemy, especially black and brown LA. The gang strategy, which I know a lot about, was the gangs went to the corners and said, these are our corners, and we own them, and we'll protect them with our weapons, and Crash went to those corners and said, there are corners and we'll protect them with our weapons and it wasn't much better on either side. And what, what, what happened after Bratton got there was the single most profound cultural shift I have ever seen in, in policing. Modern NYPD is close to it. It's, you know, those, are, those are the big contenders for, for thorough, persistent transformation. But in, in New York, it was about technical crime fighting and in LA, it was about what we're all convened here. It was about the way the department was going to view and engage with the citizens of Los Angeles. And what gives me heart about this is first that it happened, and then that is, as we've talked about, there was a moment about six years ago now when in about 18 months, you could practically watch it happening. There was this tipping process in LA that was shocking. And it was one, one institution on the far side of that and another institution on the near side of it. And I wish it all got more attention, partly because of the, the gravity of that transformation, but because a lot of what we're, we're all struggling toward now, which is fundamentally different ways of engaging with and working with our citizens in the joint pursuit of public safety has in fact been modeled and institutionalized there. I mentioned the Watts Gang Task Force, there's, there's the public housing work, there are the interventionists, there are all sorts of things that have become embraced by the department as the right way to do public safety work. And um, I'm a big believer in, in stealing stuff before you go invent it, and LA has a huge amount of, of R&D work that has played out, paid off, and we should all look at it. The public housing work really is astounding. Can you expand on that? So. <laughs> Um, I, I yield my minutes to Constant Rice. No, um, <laughs> so here's, here's the story as I know it, which is, um, some of this I know personally, the, the worst housing projects outside of the old days in you know, Henry Horner in Chicago were Nickerson Gardens and Jordan Downs and such in, in South Central. 
they are the, the most terrifying places I had ever been. I've been in both places and LA was scarier. And they were gang ridden, the, um, the, the, the residents were terrified, the gang members were terrified, the cops were terrified, and they had been like that forever. And LAPD created a super grade patrol officer who committed to being in those places over time, meaning for years. They moved in, they were not promoted out, they were not rotated out, the, the housing project became their beats. And they were both charged with and naturally came to know the community and its issues. And you know, I was, I was snide about community policing earlier on because I am tired of all these bumper stickers, but th this, this is community policing at its essential best. And in all kinds of ways, both formal and informal, those partnerships have steadily brought conditions in those places back down to what most of us would regard as a civilized norm. And it was sort of to a number of points, not high tech, not a lot of money. It was about getting the right people in the right places and building those relationships. And what we both know is, for example, when there is trouble in Jordan Downs, um, those officers will go in broad daylight to the interventionists who work those areas, stand in broad daylight with women whose kids have been killed by cops and who have reconciled with LAPD, and they will work with the community to say, no, we are not gonna burn the place down today, and it works. Okay, great. The last question I would have for the panel's benefit is, do you see other large departments that are either on the road to where LAPD is or have achieved something similar? Anybody? I, I don't know if enough about the program to make a comparison. I'm just only what I'm hearing today, so. I, I think when you start to talk about, I think, constitutional changes inside of police departments, organizational changes, and the concepts of what we're doing, I believe the city of Atlanta is doing some amazing things. Atlanta? Atlanta, the city of Atlanta. Uh, what, what I will say to you is that it's all about relationships and partnerships. We can go to the gamut of various different things with our liaison programs and how we police those communities. We don't have the same number of uh, housing projects as we once did, but we have a growing gang issue within the community. We're doing a number of things with, our, you know, with a drug market, with the state and federal partners, and really creating opportunities for people to move away from the criminal justice process and giving them opportunities. I see. David, you don't see another large department that's on par with LAPD? I, I think in the, the way we were just talking, LAPD is the state of that art right now. Okay. But there are lots of large and, and especially medium-sized agencies that are now committed to that. So NYPD with the new regime absolutely is. So we'll uh, see you in a few years. Gary McCarthy in okay. Chicago is making real headway. Kathy O'Toole in Seattle is driving things this way. You heard from Tony Bass. The, the, the thing that's grieved me most about the public conversation right now and why I wish the general public could hear the panel before lunch is you would think from the public debate that we were back in 1955 on these issues, and we're not. Everything I talked about and everything you've heard from, from this group and, and earlier today, the, the better folks in the business believe all that. They're, they've accepted it. They're, they're trying to figure out how to do the work, as are the rest of us. But nobody's being dragged, kicking, and streaming. I, I'm going to have to intervene a little bit. We're running quickly out of time. Yeah, Mr. We're very much so. Okay. Um, Jose Lopez, followed by Brittany Packnett. Yes, I have, a, I have a question. Um, so I feel like what, we, what we've heard on this panel and again on, on other panels is, is moving towards um, you know, a model where the way in which we're talking about policing is uh, yeah, being effective is moving in the direction of using kind of handcuffs as a, as a last resort and, uh, and intervening 
um, and using not just police but also social service agencies. Uh, though I feel like we're still talking about it at, at the point in which something has already gone wrong. Um, and so I have a question uh, for the panel uh, uh, about that, right? And, and so I just, I just feel like I'm not convinced that the, that the decrease of violent crime can be sustained without addressing the origins of violence. Um, and I think poverty and the unequal, unequal distribution of wealth um, probably is the thing that drives that. Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, for all of the panelists, more along the lines of how can we all switch our hats and put on the hats of, of an activist and saying that we know what drives this, so let's come up with recommendations that challenge poverty and that challenge the unequal distribution of wealth so that we're not intervening at the point where something has already gone wrong. Well, I, I think you're, you're absolutely correct uh, in many regards, um, but, but I also think at the same time with, from a policing perspective, uh, with uh, trying to get um, particularly um, neighborhoods that are, are struggling through violent crime um, is to deal with the issue that's in front of us and be able to manage the things that we can put our hands on. Um, but while the other applications are uh, put into, in, into work as well, you know, it, there's, a, there's a priest out of uh, San Diego that says nothing stops a, a bullet like a job, and that is, uh, that's absolutely correct. And, but we have also seen in, that in some of our more challenged neighborhoods that uh, economic redevelopment, um, the educational system, nothing is going to happen if public safety is not first and foremost brought in, into what is, could be uh, a safer, respectable more environment. Um, and I, I see that as our challenge as, as police chiefs, is to, is to ensure that we're providing the people that are, that are in some of these most challenged neighborhoods with the same opportunities that, that others get throughout the United States of America. Okay, um, I agree. And so we do a lot of work that's focused on economic development for that reason, and focused on asset development, because we think that's a big piece of, of what's happened. So in cities like Boston, where there has been a growth in jobs at the higher end of the salary scale in specialized sectors and industries, you see a, a strong growth of jobs there, and then you see a strong growth of service-related jobs, service industry jobs, that are paying relatively low wages. Um, and we think that there's work to be done. There's work to be done to right that structure, that income inequality, because what happens in cities then is people can't afford to live in the cities where they are, or they are struggling so hard to live in those cities that other things that would be taken care of in the neighborhood just fall to, fall to the wayside. Um, and so we think affordable housing is a big piece of making sure that doesn't happen. That can be rental or home ownership, and that's a big piece of what the work that LISC does nationally, and we think it's an important piece. Um, in cities where there's strong affordability pressures in that big split, it's also important to be thinking about um, market-related, something that meets the demand for affordability in a, way that, in a way that can actually keep pace with demand. And so you hear cities like Boston and New York really trying to figure out how to do that differently now. Um, and that's been a large conversation for the last year and a half in both cities. Um, so I, I would say that I agree with that, and I think there's a lot of good work being done. There's also a lot of um, training and um, retraining that's happening through community colleges in increasingly more effective ways, and that is, that is part of it to get people into um, higher wage employment. But um, again, there's a lot of jobs where you can work very hard every day and uh, stay um, in a very challenged situation. I, I will just finally say this that I absolutely agree with everything that you talked about as it relates to social ills. I think that our challenge is finding our roles. Unfortunately, as a police chief, uh, we have a specific role in this whole cog, and we have to work on really true collaboration with uh, all kinds of organizations. And I think when you look at cities that are doing it well, they are doing just that. Uh, but we can't be confused. And my wife constantly tell me that you can't do it all. As a police department, we can't do it all. We have to include the other disciplines that create the kind of ills that you just discussed. David. So just very briefly, without taking anything away from what we all think, I think, we also know now that 
some significant piece when it comes to violence of what we have previously assigned to community and individual factors and economics and that sort of thing is in fact driven by the legitimacy crisis and that the violence is in fact people taking care of things themselves because they do not have faith in the criminal justice system to protect them and to act. And there's very strong research out of Chicago that shows that even in neighborhoods where socioeconomic conditions have fundamentally improved, violence remains high because the legitimacy issue has not improved. And so we, <coughs> we need to be very serious about both of those things. Brittany Packnett, followed by Cedric Alexander for the final question. I thank you all so much. So um, my question is for Deputy Commissioner Bethel. I appreciate very much the work that you're doing as a former educator myself and as someone who trains teachers. And I think that it has been repeated over and over again that relationships matter, both as we're talking about community policing, but also in schools. And so my question is, um, it seems that the program that has been, uh, had quite a bit of success has extended into relationships in the social services community and in criminal justice and the courts. My question is, what kind of work has been done to build relationships on the other end of this? So with teachers and with parents and caregivers of students, to both communicate with them what new practices are in the schools and also build with those folks um, in terms of tactics and ideas to also divert children in other ways. So, so we have begun that process. Uh, one of the things that we're doing now uh, through the training that we're gonna receive as it relates to conflict med mediation is that we're gonna be going in, my office is gonna be going in the schools to talk about the collateral consequences with the kids. Uh, Dr. Height uh, has a, a focus group that I was able to meet with and sit down and talk with those kids about the program, what would it look like, how was, and get their input on that. Uh, I met with the principals. It's ironic when you sit in a room and you have 214 schools and 200 principals and you tell them that 1,500 kids are getting arrested on a yearly basis and everybody looks in shock, not realizing that they're, all their five and four, when you add them all up, comes up to 1,500. And so I had that conversation with about that all of your numbers and all the things that are happening count. And so as we begin this process, we're in the early stage of that, uh, of really, really starting an education campaign uh, through the funding we just received. We're, we have a portion of that will be able to really message a, a lot better uh, to the kids, to the parents. Uh, one of the things we're going to do this year, when the next school year starts out, really go hard at the parents. Some of these kids are carrying items because the parents says, here, put this pepper spray in your bag. When you're going to and from school, somebody may jump, you pull it out not realizing the magnitude of that it's a prohibited weapon could, that could result in an offense. And that's what we're finding when we do these intake interviews, that many of the items that kids are carrying have been given to them by a parent or a loved one or someone with no intentions of using it in school, but going across the city and through the various corridors realize that. And so we recognize that we're going to do a very strong campaign uh, in that regard. We have not done it yet, so I, I won't uh, get ahead of myself, but that is part of the, our, our process as we go through this to really, really educate parents, educate kids, uh, and make this a very, very strong community effort. Thank you very much. Uh, Cedric Alexander. Okay, well, thank you very much, and um, please help me thank the panel for this excellent <laughs> discussion. And in the interest of time, we're gonna skip uh, a break, and we're gonna go right into the next panel, so. Please bear with us. Thank you. Oh, if the fourth panel can move right up, we'll take those witnesses right now. Uh, our fourth panel is going to be on using community policing to restore trust.
So and he, he did. He's, he's, he's very <laughs> impressive. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like that one point he said about how well, but that's the thing. The principal says, oh, we only have four. Yeah, but you got 200 and some schools. So yeah. if all of you lock up four or five kids, yeah. now you're talking about thousands of kids being arrested. He, he, he's and so what? sincere. Oh, oh, absolutely. Oh, my Passion. gosh. So yeah, now, he, oh, there are some serious crimes that happen. Sure, sure. Not all There's no question about that. But the most of it is just... I really need to show me... But I think he's a little Oh no, he's he's no, he's genuine, man. I keep trying to talk him into being a chief, and he keeps. Oh, oh, oh. He wants to stay doing what he's doing, right? No, I mean, just, there's some good openings coming up too. It'd be perfect for him. Uh huh. There's some slots coming open now that'd be perfect for him. Yeah. You got a wish. You got a couple. They like hanging out with you. Rich Ross, him. I'm very, I'm very fortunate. Yeah, you have a couple of Oh, you have some really good yeah, so I'm Like the same thing other departments. If our, if our fourth panel can, can take their seats, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, as noted earlier, the bios for this panel are on the website and also copies of their bios are available uh, at our uh, desk uh, outside. Uh, we're gonna start with Reverend uh, Jeff Brown, who's with RECAP, which stands for Rebuilding Every City uh, Around Peace. Uh, Reverend Brown, welcome. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Ms. Robinson, uh, Co-Chair Ramsey, and, and all of the panelists. It's just a pleasure to be a part of this. I know many of you in other circles. I'm the president of RECAP, uh, which means uh, Rebuilding Every City Around Peace, and it's a national expression of the work that I've done in Boston as one of the co-founders of the Boston Ten Point Coalition, which is a faith-based group that worked uh, with the community and with the police to reduce violence there. And I wanna thank you for allowing uh, community leaders and community people and the youth uh, to be a part of uh, these, uh, these uh, hearings. So 23 years ago, uh, there were lots of people who were leery of uh, faith-based institutions being involved in public safety prescriptions. But I was gratified to hear uh, just about every chief that has, uh, and police officer uh, who's testified, talked about uh, their relationship with faith-based institutions. Um, I think for, for local persons, I think faith institutions need to be involved in much of what is community policing, and it's very important. And much of that is in the longer statement that I've written to you. And I'm a Baptist preacher, so I'm gonna try to be short. Somebody ought to say amen to that. <laughs> so I, I, what I thought I'd do, uh, just to start off, is just to tell a story of, um, of an example of the strength of the relationship that we have in Boston and how that can translate into uh, progress and social change. Uh, sometime in August, I received a phone call from uh, our police commissioner, Billy Evans. And he called me and he said, um, have you been watching what's been happening in Ferguson? And I said, absolutely. And he said, well, do you think something like that can happen in Boston? And I said, absolutely. You know, when we think about Boston and its history of race relations and the balkanization of our neighborhoods, it could very well happen uh, in our cities. And so he said, well, what do you think we should do? I said, well, you know, we should sit down and we should talk. And so we gathered community and faith leaders together on, on an almost weekly basis to sit down and talk about uh, where we are as a city, where we're going, if there are protests, how best should the city handle it, and how best should the police department handle it. And we gave our input uh, to our, our commissioner. Uh, when the verdict, the Darrell Wilson verdict, occurred, uh, there were indeed uh, sporadic protests throughout the city. 
at that point, uh, we had an emergency meeting uh, with other city officials to uh, hold a forum. Uh, and we held the forum in the church because we knew that there were going to be a lot of um, uh, voices that would be very upset to talk about policing in their context. Boston is certainly not a perfect city. But it was also a place where, where people felt that uh, although the anger would be there, that should be a place where the anger could be expressed and expressed in a constructive way. And so we had a series of forums. The first one was on uh, the state of police community relations in the city. It was over 1,000 people who attended that event. And then the uh, subsequent here, uh, forums were on uh, what happens in Boston when a police officer is involved in a shooting and what is the process of evaluation. Uh, we also had a forum on what is the city's expression of a civilian review board. And uh, the next one, and they're still ongoing, is on police training. Uh, all of these events were well attended uh, by both uh, the community and the police department. And the police department received a lot of feedback. A lot of it was positive, uh, uh, a, a bunch of it was also uh, negative. But what was interesting about it was that they stayed the entire time they uh, took into advisement uh, a lot of what was said. And when we think about what happened in Boston as a result of what happened in Ferguson and in um, uh, New York City, uh, our response was markedly different. I think there's a key piece that I'd want to also mention as well. Uh, there was a moment when the tragic deaths of Officer uh, Lou and, and Ramos in, in New York City uh, started uh, a counter response that was happening uh, around the country and certainly in our city where people were talking about police lives matter. And uh, they were happening in Boston, but they weren't happening in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan, which are uh, traditional uh, African-American communities, but they were happening in West Roxbury, in Hyde Park, and uh, in uh, the uh, part of Dorchester where is a heavy um, Irish community. As a result of that, uh, the leadership, uh, the black clergy and uh, community leaders got together and said, we, we should have a prayer service and we should bring together the police officers and the police brass and the protesters, the leadership, many of us who, who, who we knew, they were parts of our church or at, at some point in relationship with us, to, uh, to just come together with the guise of, of resetting uh, the terms of engagement. And uh, we did that, and we did it in uh, uh, not too long after Christmas. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that it was a holiday, um, there were a lot of people there in attendance. Uh, the leadership of both sides came together. And what happened as a result was a remarkable meeting of, of those two groups in an area that was not antagonistic. Many of them exchanged uh, phone numbers with some of the police brass with the purpose of, of having a back channel type of communication as things move forward. I tell you this because to me that's an example of community policing that's working not only to, uh, uh, to deal with some of the ills within our community but to also deal with the thorny issues of race and to, to talk uh, in a constructive way about some of the uncomfortable issues that, uh, that I know that this task force is dealing with right now. I have some recommendations uh, that I just want to read uh, very quickly. Number one, sure, I know, I know. I told you I'm Baptist. So, um, <laughs> so I'll just say an effective community policing strategy should include uh, strong faith-based and community-based partnerships with the emphasis on partnerships. Uh, those groups who are involved with the police should not feel like they're another tool in the law enforcement tool chest, but real partners. Uh, the second uh, recommendation is I think those partnerships deliver a needed moral voice that strengthens community policing efforts. And David Kennedy, uh, in his testimonies, uh, eloquently talked about that. Uh, and then lastly, supporting faith-based and community-based programming for high-risk youth uh, also builds trust.
And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Brown. Our next speaker is Dwayne Crawford, who is executive director of Noble, the National Organization for Black Law Enforcement Executives. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me first start off by acknowledging and thanking President Obama for his leadership as well as Attorney General Eric Coder. And when I say leadership, that's the one piece that I would say kind of encompasses what my biggest concerns are for this country, the lack thereof, that leadership. I think it's going to be very important for what the task force is already doing. I think it's going to be very important for leaders across this country to exhibit leadership and not default to the media and social media and television and radio to do that. I also want to acknowledge co-chairperson Charles Ramsey, co-chairperson Lori Robinson for your leadership of this task force. Additionally, the members of the task force, I also want to acknowledge and, uh, the executive board of Noble as well as our members. Uh, and just really say on behalf of Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, just bring you greetings on behalf of the entire organization. The men and women, our members, are very concerned. Uh, we have been in the forefront of this issue for many, many years. Uh, we've been training from, I want to say, December 1st until mid-January. Over 800 people have sat in churches, town halls, schools. I'm actually heading uh, next week back to St. Louis. And these families, these parents, and these children are asking one question. Please advise us. Please advise us how we should conduct ourselves going forward. And please explain to us the new normal. Uh, I was with uh, Jack and Jill, uh, their regional meeting in, um, in Prince George County last weekend. And it was very interesting because you sat there and you had a pretty affluent group of people there who were asking the same question if you were in a poor neighborhood. Uh, so this is, the issues that we're talking about are really crossing all economic barriers here. But again, my name is Dwayne Crawford, bringing you testimony on behalf of Noble. We've been in existence for nearly 40 years. We have over 60 chapters and nearly 4,000 members worldwide. Our mission is to ensure equity in the administration of justice. And we do that by making sure we provide justice by action. And I, and I, and I again want to applaud this task force for the action that you're taking. It is our position that this country has a very unique opportunity through this task force to address the lack of trust and understanding of law enforcement by communities of color. It is imperative, imperative every citizen in this country collectively deploy solutions to ensure that America is secured both domestically and internationally. And we think that some of the issues we're talking about need to be talked about in a broader context of securing our borders both domestically and internationally. Secondly, we also think there's a strong correlation to what this country was founded on, and that's the Declaration of Independence. It is clear that people do not feel, for various reasons, that their civil rights and human rights are being uh, observed. Now, I'm not here to say whether I agree or disagree with that, but the reality of it is, is there's many people who feel that their lives, for various reasons, do not matter. And when you get in that kind of a prism, the new normal becomes what? We must do all we can do to attack that. Because, yes, perception is reality, but in this case, we cannot have citizens walking around this country feeling as though their lives do not matter. Now, the recent events that have occurred in Ferguson, Missouri, and Staten Island definitely have brought this to light. Uh, we feel that it is very important also that these persons understand that there is not a direct correlation between what they perceive as attack on their civil rights to what is actually going on in this country. For example, again, whether it's perception or reality, people feel that a lot of the gains in the civil rights struggle are under attack, right or wrong, but that's the perception. When you look at the, uh, the civil rights acts that are being attacked, you look at fair, fair housing standards that are being attacked, at the end of the day, these people feel, when I say people, people of color feel, that the gains of the 50s and 60s and 70s are now for various reasons under attack. Then what winds up happening is these individuals then translate that to what? Law enforcement, why? Because law enforcement represents what? The government right or wrong. So I think we need to understand from a broader context here that it isn't just about police here. It's about broader things that are going on in the country, but now you see what occurs in Ferguson, you see what occurs in Staten Island, and what? These issues come up to really kind of uh, force us to look at some of these things. Now, I'm not here to say whether the Supreme Court should do this or that, but understand something. These things are not in isolation and we should not treat what occurred in Ferguson instead of not in isolation. What are our recommendations from Noble? Number one, community policing must become the law of the land. Now we know this has been around since the 80s, and we know that most police agencies are actually deploying community policing. 
But we can also say we probably would not agree that it's being looked upon as the standard of policing across the country. We think that should become the standard philosophy of policing going forward. Number two, the police agency must mirror the racial composition of that community. It is a recommendation that law enforcement enhances recruitment methods. If a department's recruiting methods are not resulting in a diverse force, they then need to look at local and private sector organizations that are doing well in this area. There are best practices that are already existing of how to secure and develop and form a diverse workforce. Thirdly, training. Training and cultural sensitivity and critical thinking are crucial to an officer's performance. You cannot be effective or be an ethical officer if you cannot think critically, that is, being able to gather and process information to guide you in your decision-making process. Community policing demands that officers interact with people who live in their neighborhoods, that work in their neighborhoods. We also feel those officers should be trained on how to communicate with people, solve community problems, and develop an appreciation for cultural and ethnic differences. Additionally, superiors should continually evaluate their officer's ability to command these skills. And then also, we also feel as though if an officer, for whatever reason, is lacking in these areas, there needs to be some punitive uh, action taken by that superior. Another recommendation, trust. We feel that transparency is another key element of what we're talking about community policing and how it can address the concerns of this nation. Communities want to know their concerns are being heard and are being addressed. And many times we also fill the following areas. Community-based forms should be deployed, uh, community advisory committees, as well as making sure that families are being engaged at the police agency. Lastly, we've got to merge educational law enforcement with educational law literacy. I'm going to say this again. Law literacy and law enforcement education. Our children do not understand the basic laws of our country. We think it's very important to train them on that, as well as how to interface with law enforcement. We thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Crawford. Our third witness is Justin Hansford. He's an assistant professor of law at St. Louis University Law School. Welcome. Yes, thank you, and thank you for your invitation. Uh, in November of last year, I had the honor of going to testify at the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland with uh, Mike Brown's mother and father and a number of Ferguson activists. Uh, we talked about the subjects of racial profiling and police brutality and the responses we received from the officials in the United Nations confirmed that the state of policing and the criminal justice system in the United States has damaged America's moral standing around the world. The UN was appalled uh, at the actions that they saw in Ferguson and the response by police officers uh, in, in our region. And of course, this takes place in the context of a country where we have a jail and, and prison population that's nearly 43% black and a nation that is only 13% black. And so the US imprisons more of its black community than South Africa did during apartheid. And so outrages like the Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice and Eric Garner tragedies just serve to uh, continue to inflame the festering sore that was already present. Now, I still remain hopeful that the United States can become a beacon for human rights, but it's going to take a huge transition in our, in our policing system so that we become a force of justice, not injustice, and our police become a site for healing and not racial division in our communities. And as I, I reflected on the question that was posed to me today, I have to say at first I was uh, very puzzled by it because uh, our, our charge here is to discuss how community policing can restore trust in uh, communities between police and minority communities. But in an environment where, according to the Malcolm X grassroots movement, a member of our community is killed every 28 hours, and I, I stated the incarceration statistics earlier, it doesn't seem either logical or responsible to seek to restore trust uh, when such an attack is happening. But then I dug deep and I thought about uh, where I live. I live in St. Louis, Missouri, and we call ourselves the Show Me State. So um, I thought to myself, well, what if uh, law enforcement 
actually demonstrated and showed me that they were interested in restoring relationships, showing me through data, through change in their practices, through actual results, that there was going to be a transition in the method of policing that happened in this country. Then we can begin to discuss how we can actually restore relationships and engage in community policing. So I created this uh, metaphor in my mind of a, a, a resuscitated policing community that goes from a crawl to a walk to a run to ultimately uh, a fast forward and a fly in to the, the region of mutual respect and community policing. And there are a number of steps that have to be taken, one before the other. So first, we need to look at ending the militarization of our police. So we are aware of the 1033 program and the uh, use of military equipment in our local and state law enforcement agencies. Uh, that has to stop. It's, un it's, it's um, very clear that if people have this equipment, they're going to use it. And we saw the outcome in Ferguson. Also, uh, we, we need to consider conditioning Department of Justice funding on uh, the end of racial profiling. So uh, serious proposals to end government practices is almost always accompanied by a change in funding practices or actual uh, regulations that mandate that agencies comply with recommendations. So I've yet to see anything of the kind done for racial profiling in the United States, and that's something that also should be considered. As you move forward, uh, also consider the creation of a national, national federally operated database on police violence. So the director of the FBI just uh, said yesterday, quote, it's ridiculous that I can't tell you how many people were shot by the police last week, last month, or last year. We need to fix that. We need to create a national database so we can start to compile data and so we can have more uh, data-informed conversations on these issues. Um, we need to create national standards on the use of force uh, so that uh, people should be clear that they're not going to be faced with deadly force in situations involved, for example, jaywalking or the selling of loose cigarettes. Uh, why not provide uh, citizens a right to a hearing with any officer who uses force against them? Why not uh, mandate uh, uh, training in conflict resolution for officers? So if police are professionals, uh, why not mandate personal liability insurance? Why not take this opportunity to think creatively about uh, creating new cultures in policing? And finally, I want us to try to think about reimagining what it means to be a law enforcement officer. We need to think about the idea of human rights and how we can integrate that into the day-to-day -day policing that takes place on our streets. So what would that look like on an individual level? When members of the community are stopped by law enforcement, uh, oftentimes they're humiliated. Oftentimes they're treated in aggressive manners. Um, I know that there's been a movement towards the use of body cams. Maybe those body cams, in addition to uh, uh, trying to collect evidence, uh, should also be observed to make sure that police are interacting positively and constructively with members of the community. Um, also, you could create uh, monies and funds for victims of police brutality to provide some recompense. Um, as an attorney and a law professor, I can tell you that right now there's a state of impunity for police officers. So if there is a civil case brought against a police officer for misconduct, um, almost universally that police officer is indemnified um, and so they don't pay any money out of their own pocket. And of course we see the criminal, the standard for criminal liability is excessively high. So there's literally very little chance that there'll be any sort of uh, accountability. And then for the victims, um, there's, there's very low chance for any sort of financial recompense outside of the civil tort system, which can be very expensive. So why not create a federal fund to provide recompense for victims of police brutality, even those who are not killed, but who have lower levels of abuse that take place. And finally, um, as we move towards uh, community policing, we need to think about alternatives to the criminal justice system as the epitome of community policing. So once a police officer can sees themselves not just as someone who needs to reduce crime, but also someone who needs to protect the rights of citizens and promote their human rights at all costs, then they can think outside the box and think about uh, engaging themselves as public safety officers in the creation of, of jobs and the creation of employment to help keep people from having to enter the system in the first place. And of course, participatory uh, governance structures 
uh, such as the ones we saw in Cincinnati, are also a, a great uh, trend that we see going forward. So just in conclusion, I want to say that in, in order to build trust, we're going to have to reimagine what it means to be a police officer in this country. And I hope this task force is a first step towards doing just that. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Hansford. Our last speaker on this panel uh, is uh, Chief Cecil Smith, who is the police chief in Sanford, Florida. Uh, welcome, Chief. Thank you. And <clears throat> Mr. Director, co-chairs, members of the task force, this is indeed an honor to have the opportunity to sit before you. My name is Cecil Smith. I'm the chief of police in Sanford, Florida. A little under three years ago, the city of Sanford was thrust into the national and international spotlight with the death of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman. It should be noted that during the months following his death, several peaceful rallies were held within the city. At one point, up to 20,000 people descended upon a community of 54,000. And as such, there were no arrests, there was no property damage unlike some of the things that we have seen since that time. And why? I attribute it to this to the community's commitment to working together to ensure that its message was heard, acknowledged, and changes were actually made. The following are just a few recommendations which were established, which established the conversation uh, in the community to rebuild the trust and are currently being used within our community. And many of these recommendations are universal. Changing the perception of law enforcement within the community and within law enforcement itself. How do we view the community? How does the community view us? How do we engage and disengage the community is extremely important. Secondly, transparency. You heard that spoken to earlier. Transparency in our day-to-day -day operations. Transparency in the administration of our internal and external investigations. And most importantly, and of recent, transparency in the wearing and use of body cameras. Number three, opening the lines of communications. Providing the community with a platform to, to address its issues and its concerns. One of the key things that occurred in Sanford is that we facilitate several monthly meetings which allows the community the opportunity to express their concerns. In one such of these meetings, which is called our West Side Community Meeting, we bring in each of the department heads from each of the departments within the city. That's public works, that's streets and sanitation, that's the health departments, that's parks and recreation. To sit at the table, to hold conversations with those in the community, to discuss ways that we can rebuild trust and work with each other. Sanford's pastors connecting, as we have a pastors at the end. The faith base is extremely important that we meet with those local pastors, community leaders, and activists to address the concerns that's brought to them before they become a concern in the community so the police department has an ability to address them. Meeting in the community as a chief and as a command staff, one of the things we call, fondly call, is sweet tea with the chief. Meeting in restaurants, meeting in homes, meeting in the churches, meeting in youth locations. Why? Because when people are comfortable in their own setting, they're more willing to talk to you about the issues and concerns that are affecting them. Taking the, uh, the time to educate the community on the laws. How often do we hear, I didn't know that, I didn't understand that, why did that happen? So for us, we believe that having community advisory boards and community uh, civilian police academies allows the community, one, to express their concerns, and two, through the academies, actually learn what's happening in the police department. Number five, making yourself available to the community. Again, providing the community an understanding of the direction the police department is taking. Being in the community again, walking in the community, being a part of the solution, being a part of the conversations. And one of the things that we have noticed in the community is that it's not just a black thing. It has to be a Hispanic, an Asian, a Muslim. It's all about getting into each of these communities and understanding the culture and having our officers understand those cultures and being able to develop the trust that's there. Always expecting the unexpected and remembering to get in front of issues before they become major issues. 
ensuring that we don't wait, we don't prolong, and that we take the appropriate actions before things get out of hand. Allowing your officers or our officers to make recommendations on changes within the community because it's important for them to build trust by having the autonomy to make decisions, to do things with the people in the community so that they have that level playing ground and moving forward. We also looked at the fact that there are many, the, many opportunities to join in with our fellow or federal agencies through the Department of Justice and through the COPS office by bringing in ethics training, by bringing in training on fair and impartial treatment and fair and impartial bias-based policing. And why? Because there, everyone in this room and across our country carries some type of bias. The important part is, is when, in building trust, knowing how to control and put our biases in check and dealing with people on a common ground. We looked at volunteerism. Uh, it stressed the importance of having the community's involvement into developing the trust. What better resource is there than to have those community members as ambassadors for the police department to talk on the behalf of the police department. Uh, and finally, dealing with the health department. Working with the health department to assess not only the mental, but the physical and social health of the things that are affecting us in our communities. What better resource, and in many cases, what untapped resources that they have, they have the ability to go in to talk to us about combating hungers. As law enforcement officers, we go into homes all the time, looking at youth pregnancy, youth <coughs> and abuse of drugs that are in our community. And by having the health department as a partner to deal with those issues has been monumental. I can't stress the importance of, of creating the trust that's in the community. And each of, again, each of these recommendations, though simple, are universal across the board. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Smith. Uh, I'm going to begin the questioning uh, with Cedric uh, Alexander. Good evening, and uh, thank you as well, too. So uh, <clears throat> my first question is for Reverend Brown. Uh, and certainly, I, I want you to keep an open mind with my question here, because no is an indictment of you or anybody specifically. I've been in this business for 38 years now, and both at the federal, state, and local level, I've always had opportunities to, to work in communities across the country where uh, we have often called up on and asked the clergy mm -hmm. to help us uh, as it relates to building relationships, building bridges, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think you would agree, probably virtually, any uh, community across America, uh, there's no shortage of churches. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but one, you know, but here's where I struggle and here's where I, where I would like to get some insight from you. And I'm also going to ask uh, uh, Chief Smith this as well too. Uh, but <clears throat> how do their, their clergy like yourself, who are very much committed to seeing something very different mm -hmm. in communities of color, Mm -hmm. And it's demonstrated by your actions, not by what you do once in a while, mm -hmm. but by, by what you do consistently. Part of the problem that I see in some communities across the country is that you don't get that consistency from mm -hmm. clergy. Mm -hmm. uh, but when something happens, oftentimes clergy sometimes being in opposition of the police mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to working with police. And I have seen that very strongly as well, too but there were no proactive measures taken uh, before anything happened to work with police in some of those clergy communities, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't believe you can have it both ways. I'll give you a case in point some years ago in Rochester, New York, I was chief, mm -hmm. and I had a community group. They came out, and about 10 people, about three or four of them were clergy, mm -hmm. and they met with me, and I met with them very impromptu and they stated, well, we got a drug problem on this corner, Chief, and it's out here every night. Kids are ganged up, bada bing, bada bang. And we want something done about it now. And what I said to them was, with my command staff sitting there with me, by the time the sun go down, your problem will be resolved. But I need you to understand something, that when we go through there tonight, uh, if you're son, daughter, niece, nephew, 
uh, member of your church friend get caught in the net, mm -hmm. don't call me in the morning. Mm -hmm. Do not call me. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we got you, we understand. Well, true to form, the following morning I get phone calls. Well, that's little Jimmy. Little Jimmy, he was just passing through. The point that I'm making is, is that what I need is, in, you know, and it helped me formulate my thoughts around these recommendations. Mm -hmm. As much as we are continually asking police mm -hmm. to be held responsible, mm -hmm. I need to know in some kind of way, how do we get community leaders mm -hmm. to take some responsibility? And then what's the consequences for their lack of action? Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that's a tough question. And, uh, and because I'd like to hear from Chief Smith as well, too, because we all are very familiar with his work, great work he's done there mm -hmm. uh, in his city since being there. And, uh, but, but we really need to get more clergy on board mm -hmm. and find a way to hold them accountable because they're going to hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. They're going to hold Chief Smith accountable. Mm -hmm. and, but I need to find a way to help hold certain, certain people in communities as well, too, accountable to help us move this whole thing along because, I mean, that's the only way we're going to get to where we're going, right? Sure. Is absolutely. that we got to do it together? Yeah. yeah. And I think one thing we need to understand is that across the country, you have committed clergy. You can go, I mean, I've been in, in the past 18 months, I've been in 19 cities. And in each city, there have been a cadre of clergy mm -hmm. who were committed uh, to doing this kind of work, either committed to reducing violence or, or finding ways to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to build community and working with the police. One thing we have to understand is, is that they're not the majority. They are, they are, they are a small group, uh, generally those who are not in positions of power uh, within their clergy circles. Um, I would also say that there are exceptions, but they're not your huge church, your mega church pastors, um, uh, or those pastors who have mega egos. Uh, they're, they're usually pastors of mid-level or smaller churches who draw their memberships from the community that's affected, and they are the ones who are committed. They're generally younger uh, pastors, or younger preachers as well. Um, when I was in Ferguson in October, when there was a call for clergy to come and there were uh, a huge contingent coming, you can see that uh, among those clergy were younger clergy, committed clergy, and many of them stayed there for days and weeks uh, trying to support the community. That's who you should be looking forward to doing this kind of work. If, you, if you're trying to work with a pastor and you go to his church and his name is larger than Jesus' name, you don't want that. Chief Smith. Well, one of the things that, that has been uh, beneficial to us is keeping the clergy engaged. And one of the ways we've done that, and I will tell you, is when I first took over, we had about 60 clergy who were involved in the, in the program. We're down to about 40. But one of the things that was important for them is that they developed their own hi hierarchy and organization. And thus, we meet with their leadership to ensure that the information is shared. And then one of the other things that we offer with them is through our chaplaincy program, is that having them actively engage with the police officers and keeping that dialogue completely there keeps us engaged with those, those chaplains with those, uh, the members of the pastors, Sanford, Sanford's pastors connecting, so that we're always dialoguing back and forth with each other. Now, are there rogue, I'm going to say it, rogue ministers out there who initially join in to uh, take part in what we believe was a, a good process and then went off and did their own things? Absolutely. The most difficult part is keeping or keeping a citizen in check more so than keeping the officers in check. And it's easier for us to deal with those who are willing to sit down at the table and work with us with those issues. Thank you. Yeah, I had a question for Chief Smith, just about the, the sweet tea with the, uh, with the chief program. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that and, and a few questions. One is, uh, just in, in your experience, kind of unfolding the program, how important you thought it was for 
uh, not just uh, officers that you're managing, but also top level management to get out and talk with the communities. And I'm also interested in, in hearing kind of what happened in those interactions. Like, were those spaces where uh, the community resident, residents were coming in and, uh, you know, talking about improvements, but at the same time, you know, filing complaints to top management about the officers in those local neighborhoods. Uh, and if you've been able to kind of see a trend uh, since the implementation of that program uh, in, you know, in any way in terms of crime reduction or the reduction of uh, community complaints against officers in particular neighborhoods. Well, sweet tea with the chief was a concept that we, I'm originally from Elgin, Illinois, Elgin Police Department. We were very, very progressive in dealing with community issues. And taking that, that same concept into uh, Sanford was extremely important so that in an informal setting where people are comfortable just talking about what their issues are, what their concerns are, and knowing that, it, that their information would be kept confidential if there was a complaint against an officer. The thing that we set up is that it's myself, my deputy chiefs, my internal affairs. If there is a complaint, I will tell a lot of people to go and deal with internal affairs so those issues are being held or being dealt with directly with that portion of the police department. As the command staff, having the ability to sit down with people and not just my officers, for the community as a whole, it gives them the, uh, the understanding that I am willing to take my time to be there with them, not just the guy sitting in the office, but a person who is approachable, uh, a face of the department, these, you know, so we talk about setting the examples, but many times we have to be the example. With regards to uh, how crime has, gone, has, has taken on, if we go back and look at our crime stats for the first year that I took over, I think someone alluded to the fact that uh, we talk about crime always going down. My goal was to have people call the police. Call us and talk to us about the issues and things that were taking place because in years prior, that was a problem. People weren't talking to us. People weren't coming to us. There was a feeling of complete disconnect between the police department and the uh, of community. My crime rate actually went up the first year. And that's purposeful because I wanted people to call us and tell us what the things were do, what was going on in their communities. And thus, in this past year, I've seen a 13% decrease in crime because now the community knows that we're having these conversations. We talk to each other about the things that are taking place and that the, the uh, us and them mentality has in many ways been pushed, apart, pushed aside. I hope I answered all your questions. Yes. How many officers in your police department? I have 130. Uh, thank you. Uh, Brittany Packnett, uh, uh, followed by Roberto uh, Villasenor. So um, two quick questions. One is to Pastor Brown and kind of following up um, on Task Force Member Alexander's question. So I'm, I'm from St. Louis, born and raised. Uh, well, not born, raised. Um, and I'm the only person in my immediate family who's not a Baptist minister. Um, <laughs> And so having grown up in, in that community in, in particular with clergy who, um, at least during my childhood, took on a lot of social justice issues, there has been a lot of local and national conversation about the growing, um, at least perceived divide between young people, in particular African-American young people, and clergy. Um, and so my question is, especially as we look at the fact that millennials are the most unchurched generation mm -hmm. uh, in modern times, how do you actually continue to bridge that gap? Because I'm actually curious as to some of the pastors and clergy folk you're referring to because I don't know that I know them. Mm -hmm. And I've been on the ground quite frequently with Professor Hansford. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering kind of how you can, how, how that bridge can, how that divide, excuse me, can proactively be bridged. Right. So I know that it was the National PICO group that, uh, and the Sojourners community uh, that made the call for uh, folks to come and be supportive that in October. And I know that many of those clergy uh, remained and were connected to St. Louis. But to answer your question, I think the only way that we can keep uh, millennials in, engaged uh, is by being very transparent and frank about dealing with the issues that we don't like to deal with in church. 
and to be able to to face them. I think with my history, I've spent 23 years um, working with with gang members, drug dealers, people at high risk at the street level. You don't you don't work and build relationships with youth and not deal with some of the uncomfortable issues that we don't like to talk about in church and gain a perspective on, on that that would be helpful in terms of ministering to folks. Um, the groups that I've worked with uh, across the country are those folks who have come out of the four walls of their sanctuaries and met the problems where the problems are. And then they make a wonderful discovery that youth on the streets are not the problem to be solved, but they are young people who are struggling to make it on the street. And that, what, and that part of the problem is the disconnect between pastors who think that their God-given task is to build up the membership and therefore the finances of the church instead of doing what Jesus would do. I mean, if he came back, he would not go to, you know, I mean, with all due respect to T.D. Jakes' church, he'd be out there on the street. So, though, you know, that kind of experience generates the kind of relationships you would have with the police department because you would see what they have to deal with on a nightly basis and you'd want to be helpful in some way. Thank you. And my second question is for Professor Hansford. So you talk about um, articulating a commitment to human rights and not just crime reduction. And I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I think at least my perception is that that would be quite a shift in the culture of policing in America and would be perhaps even more than running might be that flight section. And so I want to know how you, the process by which you believe that could happen stateside. And also um, as an extension to Jose's question, what, what portions of that commitment to human rights should involve poverty reduction as well? Yes, yeah, so I, I think you begin with measurements. So when you uh, listen to law enforcement discuss success or failure, it always starts and ends with crime reduction. Um, but as we know in, in, in our communities, we've had crime reduction, we've also had inc incarceration increases. And to me, that's not a success, that's a failure. And so if you reconceptualize what you're aiming for from crime reduction alone to general well-being, then you can expand the territory that public safety officers should be concerned with. And so when you think about wealth inequality, for example, there's a, a book by Richard Wilkinson called The Spirit Level, he talks about how inequality in society has been statistically proven to increase crime rates. So it's not, some, it's not a conjecture to argue that by trying to have job programs or investments in uh, uh, education, uh, you know, vocational training, uh, that you're actually reducing crime and you're increasing well-being at the same time. So reducing crime it does not have to come from arrests and incarceration. And then you know, finally, in our region, um, as you know, we have the uh, epidemic of predatory policing, as um, um, Constance Rice has, has talked, to us, talked to us about in the past, where police officers actually have quotas and they seek to fill the municipal uh, coffers based on the amount of tickets that they can accrue in a certain time period. So when your measurement is in a quota or in a crime reduction statistic and it's to the complete uh, uh, the complete disregard for the well-being of the community, then you're failing. And so, we, and so also getting to human rights issues, um, you see that um, you know, human rights were violated, we believe, in Ferguson um, after the demonstrations. And again, so police officers, they can't see their goals be to, to limit First Amendment rights, to limit demonstrations, to try to create a status quo at all costs. Uh, there, has, there has to be a balance, and that balance has to include constitutional rights and human rights. Uh, Chief Villasenor, and his will be the last question. Um, this is probably for Mr. Crawford. In, in your uh, comments, you talked about community policing needs to be the law of all land, and, and I understand what you're saying there. One of the things that we're struggling with as a commission, too, and not struggling, but just discussing, and I'd like to maybe hear some outside perspective, how do you envision whatever recommendations that we come out with on this commission 
of being reinforced throughout the country. How, how do we get some teeth? How do you see that that would be effective? Let me want to just, uh, say this. Um, and, and let me applaud you for that question. We know, and I want to say probably, so I think either 84, 88, but in that time frame in the 80s, we know that really came to the forefront of community policing. So it's no surprise. But for example, uh, back in October, we were in Ferguson, Missouri, speaking and, and doing our law in your community uh, training there. And a woman, she probably was 75, 76 years old, and we started off our presentation talking about community policing. And so she raised her hand and got up, and she, in her mind, she felt that community policing was made up by law enforcement to explain Ferguson, Missouri. And she was very honest about it. She was you know, very polite and she says, I don't believe that. Because in her mind, she's never heard it and she's 70 something plus years old. We then share with her that the father of policing, Dr. Lee Brown, a member of Noble and, and he's African American and she didn't believe that. And so we had a young person next to her Google his name and the young man reads it to her. And so she sits there and she's like, and towards the end of our hour and a half with that, that community and, and, and that church, St. Mark's Church, she stood up a second time. And what she talked about was she felt that she shouldn't have to wait till she's 70 something years old. One, to learn about law literacy and law enforcement education, but also community policing. So I think it starts off with like any business model, right? If you were trying to sell a widget, you could put a business plan together, right? And you would target you know, the, the market you want to go after, how many people you need to buy that widget. At the end of the day, how do you define success? Well, I think it goes back to the basics. How do you sell community policing in a way that, it, one, law enforcement buys in, whether it's the unions, whether it's the leadership, the community buys in. But I think sometimes uh, law enforcement, in my opinion, I'm fairly new to this industry, looks at this industry, everyone, is not any different than most other industries in this way, though. You have a product, which is protect and serve. You've got a target audience, which are these communities. And at the end of the day, you're accountable to the people either elected you in office, that are paying your taxes, that are paying your income. Same thing here, in my personal opinion, is how do you brand this in a way where it addresses whether the concerns and the opportunities are, so like, like, something called like a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. The same way you build a business model, you build this, and the difference here is there's enough data that we have when it works. There's enough real evidence that it's impactful. But back to this lady that was 77 years old. She was very honest when she said that law literacy and law education has to get into the schools, and you've got to start building a culture of people understanding this. And lastly, I'll say this. So much of this is leadership. The leaders have got to demand that they expect a certain amount of performance and a certain amount of accountability. So if the leadership isn't going to make it a, a lie in the sand and say that it's acceptable and it's a law of the land, then you're not going to expect, your, 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 in my opinion, your rank and file officers to do that. Now, I know that's a very high level explanation, but I think whether it's how to diversify your workforce, a lot of these things have been done, everyone. They've been done for years. But at some point, in my opinion, law enforcement needs to look at this thing in a broader way. If, you, if your life depended on it and you had to get communities to buy in and law enforcement, you would do what? You would build a business model. You would market it. You would brand it. Think about this, everyone. If someone want, other than going to the cop's website, if the everyday person want to know about community policing, where would they go? Because the everyday person doesn't really know that cops exist. So I would just say to you that in my opinion, there are some fundamental business disciplines that could be deployed, in my opinion, to really make that a reality. And the good thing about it, most of the people are still living that created it, right? I mean, these people haven't passed away, at least to the best of my knowledge. I want to thank every member of this panel. It's been wonderful. Uh, please join me in thanking the witnesses. Uh, we're going to take just a five-minute break and then come back uh, for our uh, final uh, panel.
for today. This is our youth and law enforcement uh, panel. The first speaker will be Delilah Coleman, member of Navajo Nation, and she's a senior at Flagstaff High School. Delilah? I would like to thank the panel for this opportunity to be here today as what I can see the only person representing a tribal community. And I would like to start off with, on the 4th of July, the typical all-American family is indulging in barbecue cuisine and enjoying the booming sounds of fireworks. However, this is not the reality of a tribal <coughs> members. As a person of the Navajo Nation, the 4th of July is a time for rampant drinking and increased domestic violence disputes, creating an unsafe and unhealthy environment for today's Navajo youth. Unfortunately, this is where the pattern begins. The children exposed to this toxic environment are subject to be to drop out and are least likely to have their own are the most likely to have their own substance problems. They are the or they are the resilient ones and continue to strive for an education and leave the reservation. On the 27,000 square foot Navajo reservation, home for over half the Navajos of the 300,000, sorry, where the youth are the majority. It's a land where bootlegging and alcoholism are the social norm and are expected rather than a game of football. It is a land where many children do not know their parents or are subject to negligent abuse because their grandparents are too far along in age to have proper care or understand their delinquent behavior. As you can tell, due to the high and extensive amounts of poverty and substance abuse, children are often relocated to relatives' homes due to the implementation of the Indian Child Welfare Act or become wards of the state when no living relative will take on the responsibility or cannot be found fit for care. However, this was never the traditional way of life. What one must understand about Native American communities and First Nations in general is how sheltered and remote these isolated communities are. Internet and cell phone usage is barely hitting the reservations as we talk right now. However, this does not mean that all civilians on that reservation are updated on the latest technology or information. With the increasing developments of synthetic drugs, prescription drugs, and gang violence, many are not sure what the warning signs are for this. For example, gang affiliation is becoming an increasing problem on the Navajo Reservation. Right now, in 2009, there was 225 gangs alone. And it's steadily growing as more conflicts are growing apparent. But many families are not sure what the reality is of being involved with these um, juveniles. But it's not too late because as someone who has seen these, and I've seen both sides of the law, I know what these families go through. And so a lot of the time it leads to no arrests or reports of these. And there are many factors to that, but I believe it comes from the economic and financial reasoning. A lot of the time these families have to call the police on their own family members. And a lot of the times the, the, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the abuser, domestic or substance abuser, is the head of the household and brings in the income for the family. So a lot of the time the fear of not knowing what's gonna stem from arrest or incarceration leads to um, not reporting. And I hear of cases where the nearest town is two to five hours away. If you can imagine the potential damage done in that wide window of time, you'd be able to understand why the police are not heavily relied on. Tribal police enforcement cover a 70 mile radius on a single shift much of the time they patrol alone. In border towns, there are instances where we don't know which police force has jurisdiction. It can make it as scary to report a crime because of the potential runaround. The amount of confusion and uncertainty on these border towns and reservations communities cause the numbers of Native youth at risk of incarceration to increase with no real solutions being given to stop this growing epidemic. Due to the short shortage in staffing over a large and rural area, there have been instances of officer shootings and cold case murders or kidnappings. Tragedies are beginning to plague the reservations faster than students are able to graduate and receive an education to bring home solution to prevent these disasters. That is why I propose that all Native youth, starting from elementary school age, receive classes on public safety and public police education. Giving these people, these children, someone to count on in times of need or crisis is the biggest gift of all to prevent the loss of a loved one or their own lives. And I propose that tribal and city police work together on initiatives to bring in more experienced officers on diversity and cultural sensitivity to decrease the amount of arrests or incarcerations. And I suggest 
that if a youth is incarcerated, that we be culturally sensitive and give them their traditional teachings and ceremonies. And as a member of the Coconino community, um, Coconino community has a jail where, where um, the arrested can have access to their own sweat lodges and ceremonies. And I believe that's really important because when someone is incarcerated and they come from a deep heritage such as myself, we want to be able to have access to our roots and where we come from. And a lot of that is ignored, especially in bigger cities such as Phoenix. And by giving them something to lean on, such as their religion, it can help them become a better citizen and understand law enforcement. And as I've said in my testimony, I was one of those children who had to witness these things. And I've come a long way from that because I stopped what seeing, copying what I've seen and started listening to what my family has told me. And um, a lot of that stems from my cultural beliefs and learning and teaching myself what was the traditional way of the Koli people and others. So thank you for your time. <laughs> and thank you very much for your testimony. Next we'll hear from Jose Gonzalez, alumnus, foster care and crossover youth. Hello, I wanna thank you guys um, the members of the 21st Century Task Force of Policing to allow me to pre present my testimony today. Speaking from the heart is very important to me. I come today to share my experiences and struggles as they relate to child welfare and um, juvenile justice system. Providing some background is important as it is to shape me who I am today. I first ran away when I was seven years old about the same time my father passed away. He didn't, he did, his death didn't have a big impact on me because he was never he never played a role in my life. He was absent, simply never there. I got involved in drug use when, at the age of nine. I went to jail for smoking marijuana. I made some bad decisions as a young boy. One time, me and my brother decided to throw rocks at a car on the freeway. Unfortunately, one of the rocks hit a kid in the passenger seat <clears throat> and severely injured him. This recklessness and criminal act resulted in me being placed on probation for which I violated on numerous occasions. I got involved with the gang, and these actions resulted in me spending um, time in jail in the juvenile detention facility, as well as in three months in a boys' ranch. This is just part of my story. It is, it is very important that you understand the family support structure that existed for me as a young person. Growing up to, in a single fa a parent family, as one of five kids, my mother struggled to, to best support us. As a rowdy kid, my siblings and I would get, my, get us kicked out of apartments on a regular basis. Living hotel to hotel, and I would, um, for several years, my mother would do whatever she, she had to get money to provide for us, so we, we would have a hotel room to call home for the night. Living in a hotel with my mom, four siblings, two dogs, her boyfriend was a challenge, to say the least. Needless to say, I have a fair amount of interaction with law enforcement in my youth. Some has been positive. For example, a school resource officer got me involved in an after school program. Officer Bill D helped me stop being a bad kid and assisted with me in after school activities. He sought me out to be a part of his club that included all sorts of youth athletes, athletes academics and helping me gain confidence in reaching out to other social circles beyond my troubled community. The important idea I'd like to convey is, the, is that approach is everything. Coming from a lot of trauma in my past, it is important that law enforcement is sensitive to the issue that can exist in a young person's life. An example of approach is not so positive is when I was six or seven years old, a cop slammed my older brother down to the floor um, for mischief. He ended up with scratches on his face the tough part was he was calling us bastards and assholes while he was doing it. This was extremely hurtful. Another issue is that I'm always approached by officers with the mindset of what's the quickest way to get me down. Admittedly, I'm a big guy and I could be imposing. However, officers always have their hands on their guns and most of the times when I'm in their presence. The main recommendation I have for law enforcement that to work 
to be more respectful to individuals they engage with. I want to be treated with respect and fairness and not to be looked at as a criminal, but as a productive member of the community. I just want everyone to hear me heart to heart and not just ear, in one ear and out the other because there are a lot of young adults out there just like me and are trying to better themselves. I have a lot of family currently in prison, including two, brother, two of my brothers, six of my cousins, and two uncles. One of my cousins is serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole for murder. Another family, other family members flow in and out of the, of the justice system and some are still in the custody of C Child Protective Services. I myself am still under the custody of CPS until next week when I turn 21. I have a young daughter now and I want to support her in a way I was never supported. My experience have allowed me to, to provide um, positive su support to many that I come in contact with. I recently accepted a position as a case manager in a local group home. I feel strongly that my experiences will allow me to better understand the struggles of youth in the child welfare and juvenile justice system and offer support to them in a positive and meaningful way. So basically, I just want to let you guys know again that approach is everything, you know, like where I'm from, cops are hated, you know, just because you can go to, a cop can show up to um, a kid stealing something at Walmart and automatically thinks that he's going to have to do something because a kid's going to act out of, out of line or something. And, and the cop always wants you to listen to him, you know, like if you're trying to say something, the cop will tell you to shut up, listen to me, I'm talking, you know, like I don't think that's right at all. I think they should all have respect. Like they want us to give them respect, they need to give the same respect. And a lot of cops don't do that, especially in the greater Phoenix area. They don't, they don't do that. They rather just take it in their own hands and handle it their own way. And that's not right. They need to abide by the law just like we have to. Thank you again for listening to me. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jamesia Lucky, Youth Conference Committee member, Coco, Florida Police Athletic League. Hello, I'm Jamesia Lucky, and I'm with the Cocoa Police Athletic League, and I just want to say thank you all. It is an honor to be here before you all. I re would recommend that the Tag Force consider supporting programs that foster positive relationships between cops and kids, and that program is a national organization, the Police Athletic League. The Police Athletic League was founded in 1914, and it is based on the conviction that the young people, if they are not reached at an early age, if they are reached at an early age, it can develop a strong positive attitude towards police officers in their journeys throughout life towards their goals and good citizenship. The POWER program brings youth under supervision and positive influence of law enforcement agencies and expands public awareness about the roles of a police officer and that and the reinforcements of the responsibilities, values, and attitudes installed in young people by their parents. I'm not going to sit here and quote stats or tell you what research says about youth and law enforcement. I'm here to share my personal t story slash testimony. I will share how how caring people from my community, which included law enforcement, helped save me from myself. The same organization that has saved countless young people and that has given them the tools to make good decisions. Before I got involved with POW, most of you would not believe that I was the most disre disrespectful, disobedient child anyone can have. I was always in trouble. I could never spend a whole week in school without getting in trouble or getting suspended. I was so disrespectful, not only to authorities, but also to my peers. I was failing school because I was missing so many days. I felt like I wasn't smart, em smart enough. Why did I feel this way? Many adults and some of my peers told me I would never be anything in life. No one loved me or no one ever will. What hurted me the most was when a pastor told me I would never make it. It hurt me badly. I shut everything and everyone out. I wanted to commit suicide. After a few months of moping around, my mom decided to put me in a summer program. It was the summer program which 
was the Weed and Seed Youth Employment Training Program. I knew I wasn't going to like it, and I just knew it wasn't going to work out. But to my surprise, I liked it, the program. We learned how to fill out applications, how to dress appropriately, how to, could, how to act in a job interview. They also covered life skill, time management, and setting goals. The second phase of the program introduced me to the Cocoa Police Athletic League Youth Directors Council. As a youth leadership program, through this experience, I started to gain faith. I was somebody and I could be or do anything I wanted to. I did 180 degrees turnaround in school. I went from being a DF student to an AB student, and eventually I was making straight A's and helping out at my school. They gained more trust in me. I got more involved in my community and learned how to give back as we were being taught in our police athletic lead leadership program. I refused to miss an event with PAL or either a program, no matter what it took for me to get there. My hard work and determination paid off. I was selected to attend the State Police Athletic League Youth Directors Conference. The Police Athletic League Youth Conference is a conference for youth planned and coordinated by youth under the supervision of adults, many of whom are law enforcement. What I saw and experienced on that stage was so amazing. At that very moment, very moment, I decided that I was going to be up on that stage next year. What I experienced were my peers from all over the state expressing themselves and no one judging them. We were encouraged to just be ourselves. After the conference, whenever anyone would ask me how was my trip, I would beam up with pride because I had a new goal. I was committed to my local pal doing what I had to do to get up there on that stage as part of the conference committee the next year. It was all I could talk about and it kept me focused. I worked the entire year in our local pal alongside a police officer and my advisor, cleaning homes of veterans and elderly, working with the Weed and Seed in their community garden. We attended the Youth Crime Provision Summit and volunteering for National Night Out Against Violence to name just a few things, it all paid off. When finally getting there, is it was the most intense training that involved planning, coordinated public speaking, and making presentations. The fellowship with my peers gave me the opportunity to share my story. It felt good to know that someone that was listening to something I said could help that was in the same boat I was in. Just a year before I joined the Police Athletic League, it was an honor. Now I have graduated high school and returned as a volunteer. I often hear that the future of providing the same opportunities that I had are not as bright because of the lack of funds and more and more in our communities, young people think that is think that they are supposed to be odds with the police. They have no experience with law, law enforcement except the negative that they see in the media or hear from friends and family members. Studies have shown that if a young person respect the police officer on a ball field, gym, classroom, the youth will likely come to respect the laws that the police officer enforce, such as respect the beneficial to youth, the police officers, the neighborhoods, and the businesses. In my closing, there is a whole world out there and a lot of people that care and understand. I believe children have to be reached at an early age before they start to believe in all the negative. Please help organizations like the Police Athletic League continue to fill the gaps between the parents and the schools. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Nicholas Parrott, staff member, the Brotherhood Sister Soul. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Nicholas Pert. I am a 26-year-old resident of New York City. I'm currently working at an organization in Harlem called the Brotherhood Sister Soul. I've also been a strong advocate for police reforms in my city. In 2013, 
I was a plaintiff in a class action lawsuit, Floyd versus the city of New York. When I was 14, my mother told me not to panic if a police officer stopped me. Since my mother gave me this advice, I've sadly had numerous occasions to remember and consider her wisdom. My mother has since passed away and I have become the parent and father to my three younger siblings. I've also become the face of the lawsuit challenging the NYPD's policy of stop and frisk. A few years ago, I was celebrating my 18th birthday with a cousin and a friend. We decided to walk to a nearby place to get some burgers. The restaurant was closed, so we sat on the bench in the median strip that runs down the middle of Broadway in New York City. We were talking, and during the evening, when suddenly and out of nowhere, squad cars surround us. A policeman yells from the window, get on the ground. I was stunned, and I was scared. I was on the ground with a gun pointed at me. I couldn't... I couldn't see what was happening, but I could feel a policeman's hand reaching into my pocket at gunpoint. They ran their hands through my shorts, my legs, and my behind. They asked me questions. Then the officer handed me my wallet and wished me a happy birthday. I was humiliated. In 2011, I was on my way to the store when two police officers jumped out of an unmarked car and told me to stop and put my hands up against the wall. I complied. Without my permission, they took my cell phone from my hand. One of the officers reached into my pocket and removed my keys and, the, and my wallet. He looked through my wallet and then handcuffed me. The officer asked if I had come out of a particular building. No, I told them. I live next door. They put me in a car, removed my shoes, and went through my socks and asked if I had any marijuana in my possession. And if so, I should let them know. They then took my keys and went into my building and tried to enter my apartment. My terrified siblings tried to call me as they heard strangers trying to get in. I couldn't answer because the police had confiscated my phone. The police tried to use my keys to get into my apartment. They banged on the door, but my siblings said only children were in the house, and then they left. The police came back downstairs, and I was simply let go. I felt helpless. The NYPD says the purpose of stop and frisk is to remove guns from the street. Under the law, the NYPD is supposed to have reasonable suspicion before stopping and frisking an, indi an individual. Yet, over the last decade, of those stopped, less than 0.1% had a gun and less than 5% were arrested. Nearly 4 million stops have occurred in New York City in the last decade, with nearly 700,000 stops in 2012. 84% were black or Latino. Unnecessary police interaction has become a rite of passage for far too many young people in this country. The psychological consequences of unwarranted stops and frisks are damaging. Aggressive policing is alienating an entire generation of young people and it has long lasting effects. I represent all those who have been stopped for no other reason than walking while black. Mothers of black and brown boys should not have to mentally prepare their sons to be harassed by those who are supposed to be there to protect them. My suggestions would be strengthening the relationship between policing, strengthening the, the relationship between police and community is imperative to the longevity of crime reduction in this country. It is of the essence to have a force that will be willing to establish relationships with residents and also be open to dialogue when it matters most. I encourage the task force to consider long-term systematic solutions where commanding officers Commanding officers. Where commanding officers and community affairs officers are easily accessible. I hope to see officers on a beat and becoming a pivotal force in the community like they once were a time ago. There should be a greater outreach to community to the community beyond partnering with a, a school or a local church. I envision community events where officers are transparent about the current climate of the communities they serve. I would recommend community affairs officers being more visible in big cities. We, have, we, we currently have a culture of reactive community policing. It's time to have proactive, a proactive approach to policing, where experienced, cop, where experienced police officers are bridging the gaps in these intentions. I envision a force where police officers understand the culture of the community as well as the socioeconomic conditions that young people face. I hope to also Hope to also see more police accountability for misconduct. I would encourage strengthening government agencies like the Civilian Complaint Review Board, 
I am optimistic it will be a step forward in giving individuals a voice instead of being stonewalled. I hope police practices will change and that when I have children, I won't have to pass along my mother's advice. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Michael Reynolds, co-president, Youth Power Movement. Hello. All right, so, you hear me? All right, I'm Mike. Yeah. Oh, there you go. All right, so my name is Michael Reynolds. I'm 17 years of age, and I attend Loyola High School in Detroit, Michigan. The police have impacted my life in so many ways. When I was in first grade in Detroit, I lived in extreme poverty. One day, I was walking into class. I walked into class, and it was career day. And the police officer changed my life because when because I lived in poverty, I did not have many other essential things that I needed to survive the frigid winters of the East Coast. I did not have, I did not have coat, a coat, I didn't have boots, and I didn't really have many socks. After school, I was walking that long mile back to the house, and, the, and that same police officer that presented in my classroom stopped and asked why I did not have a coat. He took me and he got me a hot meal, and he bought me a coat and boots. For the next three weeks, I was warm and comfortable. But I will say, I mean, just because of the community that I live in, someone robbed me for the coat. I was in first grade at the time, you know, and that really affected me. With me being young and innocent, I really didn't have an opinion about law enforcement. But I know that I looked up to my brothers and my sisters in the, in the neighborhood. I didn't, have, I didn't have a mom. I didn't have dad. Dad really wasn't around, you know. And, for example, something that I did, and I, I regret it, but I learned from it. I was eight years old. I had a toy gun and I went in and I was acting like I was robbing a, a convention store. You know, the police came and everything. You know, they took me home and I got a slap on the wrist, but that's our society where young people are looking up at these older adults that's doing bad. Like the panelists said, Mrs. Brittany said, we're millennials. We're not really in the church, you know. So who are we looking up to? We're not looking up to the people that's on the corner that's trying to sell God and, and show us the right way. Who are we looking up to? Looking up to them local drug dealers and gang bangers. But the real problem is we're not looking up to the, pe the people sitting on the stage right now. And that's the problem. So we're going to go, I'm going to fast forward a few years of my life when, I, when my high school career began. As I walked down the hall, a police officer that was employed by the school noticed that I didn't have my identification badge. Before I can explain why I didn't have my badge, he escorted me to the office. And I got an entire week for not having my ID. He told me to leave the school premises immediately. As I walked to the bus stop, a different police officer pulled over and demanded, why, demanded for me to tell him why, why I was not in school. As I tried to tell him, he put me inside his police car. He drove me back to the school. And as I sat in the, in the car for two and a half hours while he was trying to work out and see why I'm not in school, he later came back to the car and said, you know what, you was right, you got suspended. And I tried to tell him that all along. He didn't listen, you know. And as that, as that day went on, I got two tickets. I got a ticket, I got a ticket and my, uh, my guardian got a ticket for $300 a piece, which equaled out to $600. I got a whole entire week off, and I got two court dates following each ticket. So can I ask you, is, is it worth it? Is my education worth a piece of plastic. Is it worth me losing a week of school plus two days and losing $600 that could have went to rent, that could have went to food, the essential things that I need? I told you I was raised in poverty. I ain't have it good, you know? And being a young African-American male that was raised in Detroit, the people that was the role models, like I said, there was the drug dealers and the gang bangers. But really, that police officer that changed my life, he gave me a role model. He gave me an idol at a young age and said, you know what, I want to be like that because dad's not there. Mom not there. I want to be like that guy. I want to be somebody that, that had a sense of honor. But I will say that it's a shame because this is, this is the United States of America, the land of the free, home of the brave, right? You know, all, everybody on this panel has been affected by violence. It's not just me. It's not just the black skin. It's not me just in Detroit. It's not him in Brooklyn. Did I say it right? Harlem. Harlem. I apologize. I always get it wrong. It's, cool. it's, not, it's not my sister over here in Florida or my brother here in Arizona. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a system that funnels young people. So how do we stop this system? What is this system even called? The school to prison pipeline. 
I'm not even reading off my notes no more because it's coming all from the heart now, you know? Because at the end of the day, I'm passionate about this issue. I'm passionate about it because I've been affected by it. It's a shame that I have to pay for private school just so I can get a quality education because the education in urban Detroit is watered down. How is I supposed to go anywhere? I'm trying to get where y'all at. I can't get where y'all at if I'm continuing in a cycle of poverty. Right? So how do we do this? How do we change this school system? How about implement restorative practices? How about not kicking kids out of school for these minor infractions? How about modifying zero tolerance? How about instead of having police officers in the school that's going to police us, that's going to throw us in jail and throw away the key and don't care really nothing about us, how about we get some counselors? How about we get after school suspension? You know, so where when I get suspended, I'm not out there on the street. I'm not out there with them, them people that's going to influence me the wrong way. I got to be in there. I got to do the work. I'm not at home watching Jerry Springer, watching violence. Violence is all around us. But at the end of the day, if I don't have that, that security at home, that family at home that's going to protect me, I need to go towards the school and I need them to protect me. Because education is the only way out of true poverty. All right, I'm also going to bring up some, some alternatives. Now, like I said, I've been on each side of the problem. I've been incarcerated and I've also worked with the police. I mean, right now I'm an explorer. And me being an explorer, I follow police officers. I understand at the end of the day, police officers are human beings just like me, you, and everybody else in here. They fear for their life just as I fear for mine when I see them. It's a shame that my brothers and sisters on this panel, when they see the police, they get timid. They're feared, the police. The police are supposed to be in the community. They're supposed to protect and serve the community. But it's a shame they, they're not protecting. I'm not saying they're not protecting and serving it. We're looking at them. We're fearing them. If police officers are more in the community, people will get more of a positive image of the police officer. He volunteered his time and out of uniform without his hand on a gun. People will get less scared. So I want to thank y'all so much for having me. And I'm going to let you know at the end of the day, y'all law, everybody on this panel up here is an expert in y'all field. Y'all got degrees, but you got to understand everybody down here as well is an expert in our field because we went through the issue. We dealt with the problems. And you cannot change anything that affects youth without youth. It is a shame, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be here because the only youth that's sitting up here is the youth right here. We need more youth in this crowd that's listening to us because it's wisdom. It's wisdom, man. It's, we got we to take y'all place. Y'all not going to be there for long. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But we got to be ready. You, you understand? I want to say I see greatness in everybody on this panel. And I wish y'all the best. And I wish to see you again. But I see greatness in everybody up here. You tell Barack Obama, is he ready to make that choice? For these young people in the United States of America to grow educationally, to grow with the police and understand that these are people, these are our friends, these are people that protect and serve us, not people that's gunning us down like Michael Brown and, and Trayvon Martin. It's up to y'all to make that decision. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you all very much. And now I'm going to turn to my task force members for questions, and we're going to start with Sean Smoot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just uh, really want to thank each and every one of you for uh, having the courage to come testify before a presidential task force. Uh, I certainly don't think I would have been able to do that with the poise that you have, each of you have, uh, when I was your age. And so uh, I, I want you to know that we heard you and, um, and uh, we're very impressed by uh, your ability to, to talk to us about some things that are very personal stories. And um, uh, I, I don't have a question because you answered my question, uh, Mr. Reynolds, uh, at the end of your speech. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your testimony. Thank you. Next we'll hear from uh, Brittany Packman. Hi, you all. I, I want to um, echo Sean's thanks to you guys, not just for your testimony today, but for your continued leadership. 
There are a lot of folks of all ages who don't always step up, and so I appreciate that you all are doing that, whether the cameras are on or off, and to encourage you to keep doing that work because we, we all need you to keep doing that. So here's my question, because you guys heard on the last panel um, practices that have been successful in Philadelphia to um, divert students before they get into trouble, right? So before they're incarcerated, before they come into the juvenile justice system. But a lot of you all very bravely bore witness to the fact that you can still turn your life around even after you've had that kind of interaction. So my question to you all is what kinds of practices, programs do you all want to see from your community and specifically the kind of behaviors that you want to see from officers in your community for those folks who are saying, you know what, I messed up a couple of times, but I'm actually here trying to turn my life around. Well, the first experiences that a lot of Native youth have with the police enforcement is between, I would say, five months to seven years. And a lot of that is because they're either being removed from their homes or they're subject, they're the victims of abuse. And whether that be, you know, physical, sexual, all types of abuse. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from a lot of intergen intergenerational trauma from the effects of colonization. A lot of Native American families, I don't know if you know any, but they suffer with alcoholism or poverty. And what I would like to see personally is the tribal or city police taking the initiative to talk to these kids. Because in my communities, both Flagstaff and tribal, we, I have never seen outreach towards people like me. And I've had to personally take my own path and pave it myself. I've done this independently without any um, outside help like my fellow panelists have. And a lot of that I think can help with either mentor programs from us, for example, I'm a part of um, ASAP, Arizona Students Aiming for Prevention, and we promote healthy living through anti-tobacco. Um, and the tobacco, as you may know, is either commercial or traditional. And what I want to do is take out the commercial because students will copy what they see on the media, from their family, outside resources. But what we do is unique. We go to um, a sister school, Puente de Hojo, which is an elementary school, and we actually give peer education to these kids. So as I've said in my testimony, public safety and peer education on law enforcement. So starting from an early age is very effective because we can show these kids that not all police are out to take you away from your families and put you into the system. They're not here to make you out to be a second class citizen because you might be born a second class citizen, but you can't, you, there's ways to move up. There are ways to make people change the perceptions of you. There's ways to change the stereotype of the drunk Indian or the poor Indian. And so I think a lot of it has to stem from the early age development because if students are able to be exposed to other opportunities and other safer types of justice, then they'll understand as they get older that there are people to rely on rather than their families to be the vigilantes. Anyone else want to jump in and I'll comment jump, on that? I'll jump in on it. Um, we need to put resources into prevention and intervention in school systems instead of strict and mandatory suspensions and expulsions. Support educators, parents, students, and also counselors to get trained in restorative practices and other solutions that keep kids in school. With me, I, like she just said, you know, young people, they copy what they see. And it's not clear what the generation in, uh, ahead of us really put in front of us. You know, they, they set a negative image for us. So now it's our time to clean it up. And also, I like that. I would like for officers to be in the community more. And not only be in the community, like be in the community and actually like talk to young people, not talk at them. Because when you talk at a young person, it's not gonna be effective. You also need more peer-to-peer -peer mediation. Because when you have peer-to-peer -peer mediation, it's been proven to be more successful. I mean, don't, no offense or not like that, but a young person is gonna listen more to a young person, more than an adult, you know? And with us, with the young people out on this panel, we definitely been trained in our in our field we've lived it you know and i'm sure from our respective groups the young people that's under us listen to us because we've been through it you know don't get me wrong and also i like to talk more about the school to prison pipeline 
Uh, when kids are getting kicked out of school, it's a system that puts them into the juvenile justice system. And you have a, a variation of different policies that basically that, that, that steer these kids into the system. You know, you got private prisons that's getting built on third grade reading levels and third grade attendance. Like she said, we got to go for the young people because that's where they're going for. Let's go for the same group of young people. You know, you got, for example, zero tolerance. Insubordination, which is, which is a word that really don't have a clear definition, but the school system can definitely kick you out of school for it. <laughs> you got, um, you got, I said zero tolerance, you got minor infractions where kids can get kicked out of school. Like for me, I got kicked out of school for an ID. I can get kicked out of school for uh, having the wrong clothing on. You know, I can dress nice in a nice suit and they can kick me out. Because I don't got the, uh, the, 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 the polo on, I don't have the money to buy the khakis and everything else. You know, like she said, everyone is not rich. <laughs> we have to understand that. So these, these, these rules that, that's, that's being implemented in these school systems are fraud. Because of the simple fact, it's, it's just not possible. Like the uh, brother before me uh, said, there's 19% African American people in this country and 50% people that's incarcerated. You look at the statistics, they're paying $100,000 a year to incarcerate a male. And now I'm not just saying male of black color, I'm saying male minorities. Minorities, black, brown, orange, green, you know, males that identify LGBTQ, uh, males and females that's in foster care. It's a system that's directed for us to, to, to be sucked into the juvenile justice system. Now it's just our chance to implement these, these variation of different programs to make sure we don't go there. Thank you very question. much. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I know I'm a little long-winded. I apologize about that. Thank, no, no, that's great. Thank you. Brian Stevenson. I did have a, just a, just if you can give me a, just a, a quick feedback on this. Um, what do you say uh, to the young people who are looking up to you about how they should manage police encounters. I get asked this question all the time from parents and others. I'd be interested in hearing what you think, uh, what you say to uh, you know, the 14, 15, 16 year olds you know uh, with how they should act uh, when they are stopped by the police. And I, any of you can respond. Well, um, i like to answer that and also answer the question that Brittany had as well. Um, you know, I'm part of, um, the Brotherhood Sister Soul, I am a worker there, but I also was an alumni. I, I mean, a member at one point, and um, I remember, you know, we would have weekly sessions and we would learn about sexism, misogyny, mass incarceration. I remember how empowering it was to, you know, learn this information about mass incarceration. So we knew, you know, th those sessions, you know, it wasn't a uh, depressing session to learn about this, but um, it was very empowering to, 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 you know, see the statistics and how, you know, we are disproportionately affected by some of the policies that exist in this country. And, um, you know, I, I, I take, you know, bits and pieces from, you know, my mentors and, you know, I, or I would say, you know, from my mentors that something that I do take and I implement with my young people, um, they respected the stages that I went through as a young person. You know, they, you know, when, you know, uh, I said something inappropriate, you know, they would push me on that question. Why do you think like that? You know, there wasn't like, you know, you should not think like that, but let's, let me push you, let me push you on, on this issue and let, get you to think that, you know, like maybe I should think twice about some of the things that I say. But, um, you know, around, you know, um, you know, redefining your life and, you know, for black and brown people and, you know, their perceptions and role models. You know, I think, you know, we really have to redefine the way we look at people with criminal records. You know, we have to really, you know, folks, you know, you go to jail, you do, you, you pay a penance. And once you're released, that's it. You know, I don't think anyone should have to pay for, you know, something that they've done, um, uh, New, uh, new, numerous amounts of years and you know folks who are living in poverty you know they lose their housing they lose a lot of opportunities because of that and you even have like a republican i think Rand paul you know speaking about you know two million people who are um can't vote because of 
nonviolent offenses. And, you know, it's even shocking, you know, to hear that. But, um, you know, we just have to really revamp the way we, our perceptions of people with arrest records and, you know, that they are part of society. You know, they, you know, come back and, you know, we have to find a way to have these people, have those people, you know, land on their feet. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that's helpful. But I think you were going to answer something as well. Me? Yeah. Did, if you. Um, I was. I was just going to say, you know, like um, to me, I would tell them, you know, just do as you're as they ask. But where I come from, that's not how youth are raised. You know, like cops automatically, you see a cop you're either running from or giving them hell. You know, when they stop you. And that's just because that's that's how everybody is taught, you know, cops are bad people and because of what they do, you know, and like you can't you can't change somebody that's already been taught this for ever and ever and ever, you know, like you can't change that. You can try to put a try to put a curve in their in their their way of thinking, but it matters like what you guys are gonna do to change it. You know, you guys are the one that's gonna change everything. Us, we're just we're just here to to say how we feel. You know, but what you guys say is what's gonna change. So, and I also think you know the the you know when talking to young people about you know police interaction, you know it's a touchy subject because it's all as if you're imposing on their innocence. You know, that is a reality and it's a very unfortunate reality and I hope that, you know, we can infiltrate that and, you know, have that not be a part of that. You know, I remember, you know, it's, you know, a lot of miscommunication between citizens and the government and, and you know, their laws being made and folks just aren't aware of them. You know, like in uh, New York City, you know, you have to be 15 years old to, you have to be, if you're 15 years and older, you have to ride your bike in the street. It's like I don't want, I wouldn't want my brother, but my brother, you know, riding his bike in the street. But you know, I wouldn't dispute that. But you know, the thing is, you know, kids don't look their age. So what happens is they have a lot of interactions with officers come up to them and they're like, "How old are you?" You know, and it's like that's very reactive. You know, we, that's not, you know, hello, how was your day? You know, I, I would, you know, want that approach. But you know. Hopefully, you know, we can, you know, change that conversation and angle it in a different way where we don't have to trample on young people's innocence, but, you know, you do, and it probably will exist for the next, for the coming years, and, you know, it's a reality. Mr. Reynolds, you wanted to add something? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, I see your question. We're living in a, in a new Jim Crow, mass incarceration, and really, I look at it like this. Um, if I was approached by the police, I'll listen to them. I'll listen to what they say. And the reason that I'll listen to them is because of simple fact, I know my rights as a young individual. And all I can do is I can tell them to do the same thing, learn their rights and listen to the police because they're the people that's gonna guide us. And they lead you wrong, hey, get a good lawyer. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Coleman, you had. As someone who has a brother who I would consider high risk for arrest or incarceration, he recently got in trouble with the law for um, possession of paraphernalia, and he's 5'11", and he's 15. So obviously, he's a big dude for his age. And as Nicholas has been saying, um, the loss of innocence, especially Native American children, is gone before I would say they reach 14, 15, because they have seen so much, and they've been exposed to so much. So. As for how to approach police, I don't know if you, <laughs> a lot of American history is very watered down and Native Americans have been having issues with law enforcement and government for years. Honor the treaty, change the mascot. Every, it seems as if every decade we have a new issue. And that's what I really enjoy about my generation right now is we're all becoming advocates. And so back to my suggestion of law enforcement education but it, BIE schools don't have enough funding to bring in even sufficient teachers to reach the standards of Arizona's. And Arizona is very behind in education. I think we're one of the last few states. And that's a problem. But 
It's even more of a problem when we have basically a third world country living in our own backyard. So how do we change the perception of the police, you ask? It's very hard and it's gonna take a lot of time, but a lot of it we have to ask our leaders and your leaders to come together and find a basis and meet a middle ground to get the stereotypes and the perceptions and the bias out. And that's very hard to do, as we know, because of tribal sovereignty and the corruption that goes on between both governments. And as someone who has a brother I would consider high risk, I just tell him to listen to what they say. Don't be aggressive. Come off as nice and calm. Because the <coughs> only way they're gonna treat you as a human is if you give them that human way. Don't let them demonize you as they did to Eric Garner. Thank you. Jose Lopez. Yeah, I have a, I have a quick question. So, uh, Brother Michael, when you were at the very end, you mentioned the president and you said, you know, you gotta, you gotta choose which way you're going. Um, and so, uh, I guess my question, uh, you know, just to bring that to a more, uh, to think about that locally, right? So the reality is in this room, uh, that we do have the year of the administration and the president, uh, but we're also sitting in a room filled with management, right? Filled with uh, commissioners and chiefs of different departments across the country. And so when they go back to their offices on Monday uh, to start off the week, what is the message? Uh, what do you want the chiefs in this room uh, to go back into their departments on Monday? What is the message that you want them to deliver uh, to their rank and file officers? Uh, and this is, this is for the entire panel, but just thinking about for the folks in this room, you know, what should they go back on Monday and say to their officers based on what they've heard here today? You want me to go first? All right, I'll go. All right, so for me, what I want you to do is I want you to go back to your office. I want you to let your staff know that young people in this country, you cannot judge them on the image that they have. Everybody not gonna wear a, a, a tie, a suit, and some dress shoes. Some people, some people act out of anger because of the simple fact that they don't know how to respond to some of the situations that they've been through. And we all know that. But we still treat them like animals. We still cage them and put them, in, I mean incarcerate them and treat them like animals. I was incarcerated, I was incarcerated for two weeks and I felt like beneath a human. I wasn't even able to make a phone call for crying out loud for two weeks. I mean, once I made my one phone call, I got out, but I mean, every kid isn't, isn't like me, you know? And some kids may walk down the street with their pants sagging, but that's, that, their pants sagging isn't you no know, trying to defy you or say, hey, you know what, you know, screw you or whatever. Their pants are sagging is because that's the culture that we live in, and we have to understand that. So when you go back to your office, I want you to tell your staff to reach out to the young people. Do not, like I said, don't talk at young people. Because when you talk at young people, it's like, I'm not gonna even listen, man. It's going in one ear and not the other. Talk to them, try to relate to them. You know, try to solve some of the situations that they're, that they're going on, that's going on in their lives. How can you help? You know, how can you pick them up? Don't really just give everything to them, you know? Give them a, help, a helping hand. Help them get into a job in your office. Help them come and talk to you and help other young people. Like, you help them, you know? Make it a chain reaction. But then that's how you make a movement. That's what I want you to do. I want you to change my generation because, because my generation is, have color blindness. We don't see, we can't see the simple things that's in front of us. Because we'd rather look at the TV and play video games all day. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to make that movement. And I want you to know that I see greatness in you. And I want you to tell them the same thing. Anyone else want to comment on that? Personally, um, my success has come from reaching out to, you know, my managers like you guys. <laughs> and it's difficult because I come from such an isolated community that has maybe a few hundred members. And I don't mean the Navajo Nation as a whole, I mean where my chapter house is located, which is the Navajo, Navajo Mountain, and it's on the border of Arizona and Utah. And it's about half an hour to two hours away from a town or a city. And what's difficult is that these kids don't have the resources to have people reach out to them. 
And um, the reason why I'm here today is actually from Cornell Alfred from the Inspire program at George Washington University. And I reached out because of her program that talked about federal and tribal relations. And so I consider myself lucky because I got that and I was one of hundreds of applicants. But these kids out there, they don't have access to these programs, you know? And if they have, and you wanna mend the police and civilian relationship, so maybe we could bring in you know, a program that will take these kids and show them the inner workings of the police and justice system. So they understand and they know why these crimes and the way they're handled in the system works. So they, they know they're not just seen as another statistic or another number in the database. They're seen as a human and they can see that you guys are human too. You're not just out to get them because you know you want more money in your pocket. And what's interestingly enough is a lot of kids I've talked to from my communities, they want these programs. They want to see these things. They want to change what their parents have seen. They want to change what our ancestors have seen. They want to see this change and they want to make this society as a whole work together. So if we just worked together and brought in new programs and new initiatives, who knows, in 20 years, we might see them working together with your kids or your people who will take on the next thing. And who knows what that'll bring on, what kind of change, what kind of decrease in t statistics we could see and how much, how much safer we can make the world for the future generations. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. This has been an outstanding panel. Please join me in thanking them. For and now I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, Ron Davis, as we move into the audience participation phase. Be before the young people leave, I wanted to, uh, one, uh, thank you guys for your, your appearance. You did a great, great testimony, great question and answer point. Um, at, uh, some people may be surprised. I think most of us know, especially those that have kids your age, just how bright intelligence the generation is, and you're proving it once again. Thank you for your leadership. I want to thank my colleagues at the Office of Justice Program, specifically the Office of Justice, Juvenile Justice, Delinquency, and Prevention. I see Cindy Papp is sitting there. We asked them to help round up and to identify and bring youth leadership, young adults that would come in and bring knowledge to this, uh, this panel, and it was for their help. Please accept our thank you for doing that, for working that. I want to make sure that uh, you know, we have a strong partnership with all of our components at the Department of Justice. And I would say, please go back and let Bob Listen be the administrator know that he knocked it out the park. It's a home run. We didn't expect to see just the level of leadership you brought in. And I think everyone is just, this is really very beneficial. I also feel very comfortable saying this, that on behalf of the president. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for your leadership. And I think this has been up to the point as we're moving forward one of the critical pieces that was missing. And I think too often we do turn to others to speak for you. So to hear from you directly, to hear your recommendations, um, it was very powerful. And I would just say this as a father, I'm uh, very proud of you guys. You did a tremendous job and you should be very proud of yourself. So thank you guys. Thank you. As we proceed forward, we're gonna go into the community feedback portion. So we'll give the uh, panel an opportunity to, uh, you guys are gonna get swarmed as you try to get out of here, so know that. Okay. Um, so at this stage, we're going to take about a five minutes so we can get ready for, I think we're gonna have a couple of comments. Can they just go straight into it? We can go straight into it. So at this stage, for those that are watching the webcast, if you have any comments, you can submit this uh, online. And what we'll do now is for anyone in the audience that wants to make a comment, uh, there's cards that's being passed around or raise your hand, we can get you a card uh, and we can then hear your comments. So we'll do this two parts as Mr. Copel pulls up, Jim pulls up. I have one speaker and I think you have some comments on, that's online as well. So let me start with Mr. Anthony Gray. Oh. And, and Mr. Gray, they're going to bring you a microphone right where you are, Mr. Sir, sir. Yes. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank the Table 12. Um, you guys are outstanding, as well as the panelists. Um, 
me being a millennial, I'm 23 age. I was born in Chicago. Uh, spent most of my adult life in Arizona. First and foremost, I want to say it's a, it's a difference. It's, it's a difference, a very contrast. Um, being in Chicago, you see a lot of things, a lot of different things. Uh, the stop and frisk, like they were mentioning, the, um, you know, just based off your color, because you fit the description, you know, quote unquote. And um, in Arizona, it's, you know, I don't even be bothered a little bit because the, it's for the brown, you know. They're focusing, a lot of the officers are focal pointing on these individuals, which is not fair. Um, my question to you, though, is, is it some health, some mental health practices that you guys can maybe in, employ that be able to help these police officers to, you know, not be stressed, though, you know, because I'm, I'm seeing it. That's what it's basically is coming down to. It's biased, you know. That you have a lot of officers that are stressed out, you know, and when you get to those stress and they have to come to work and they're stressed, you know, it's not, that's not going to work, though, because they're only going to take it out on the civilians. So are there any things, any suggestions you guys can come up with in order to help the officers out, though? Because in the reality, it's the community as well. They need help as well, though, you know, so. Sorry, Connie, where are the uh, community? Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to answer. We have, but we can probably pull you to the side and okay. for reference. But thank you, Mr. Gray. But we're just going to receive comments at this time. But don't go anywhere because we can talk to you afterwards. Yes, sir. Any other, I don't have any other cards. I want to double check before I go to online. Any other comments from the, from the audience or the public? With this, I'll turn to Jim for online comments. Ron, we have uh, four comments uh, that are very poignant and relevant to today's discussion. Uh, we have a retired law enforcement officer from Edwin, Washington, Trudy Dana, who says, my suggestion is to encourage strong relationships between law enforcement and the community. It is not costly. It is not political. It is not complicated or glitzy. It does not require complex administration. It is racially all-inclusive. It can be easily undertaken by every law enforcement agency, large or small, rural or urban. It can be Im implemented immediately with minimal effort, building relationships with law enforcement. I have a comment from Marjorie Robinson. I would like to address just one piece of this issue, the proliferation of firearms. It seems unlikely that police will be convinced to talk more and shoot less often as long as they know that many civilians do carry guns. Fear combined with racial stereotyping, intentional or not, often leads to tragedy. By the same token, we need restraint on the part of the police for the public to feel that they are safe. How can we reach the condition that police officers and citizens feel safe in each other's presence when there are so many firearms on the street? Will your task, the next um, ent entry was, from Fay, who says, will your task force consider the establishment of a national police oversight agency? This agency would be a separate unit with its own director, investigators, and prosecutors. This agency would be charged with investigating questionable police actions and prosecuting officers when necessary. Then Dorian B. has written, a thing that I am hearing talked about in the police task force is the way police, law enforcement, and prison are shaped to sweep undesirables away. And lastly, if we let ourselves see it like that, we can change the way we relate to these people. We oppress. We must speak freedom. That's it. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for the, for the uh, people that gave the comments. At this time, I will turn it back to the co-chairs. Uh, thanks so much, Ron. Uh, we're, we're at the point now of having um, brief concluding remarks from our task force members. And I want to turn uh, to Roberto Villasenor, and then we'll go down the line. It's always fun to be first and not have your time to think about what you're going to say. But actually, it's not that difficult. Once again, these panels, as I said at one of the other um, question periods, it has provided me an opportunity to really focus in on my profession and ask a lot of questions of myself to my compatriots, to the citizens that we serve, and it really helps to shape how I think about things. And I'm learning a lot, and that, that's extremely valuable. Today's topics of, of community policing, it, it just reinforced again how, I think David Kennedy talked about it, and I can definitely relate to him. We keep coming up with these buzzwords for different types of policing. 
intelligence-led policing, problem-oriented policing, community policing, neighborhood policing. All of that is dressing for the same concept. It's making connections between police officers and the people that we serve. We cannot get away from that underlying principle, and I think we have to keep battling to make that come true and to keep working with that. And again, I'm just honored to sit here and listen, and hopefully I can bring some of those suggestions to bear on our recommendations. So thank you all for taking the time to spend your day with us, and I hope that you got out of, as much out of it as I did. Thank you. Well, I just want to add my uh, gratitude to the staff and to the uh, witnesses who testified. This is really, really helpful uh, stuff today, a lot to think about. I thought uh, the, the witnesses were very well prepared. I appreciate the department uh, organizing our last panel to hear from the youth. Uh, and I'm encouraged by some of the developments um, and some of the interventions that I heard described. I look forward uh, to reconvening tomorrow and to deliberating uh, on these issues in a kind of sober way and making recommendations that will inspire some of the really creative and effective policing that we heard described today uh, to be more the norm than the exception. And that's my uh, great hope as we uh, move forward in this process. I, I want to echo uh, uh, Brian's comments. And just uh, I think the panels we had all day today were really, really good, uh, uh, Madam Co-Chair and, and uh, Chief Ramsey. Um, uh, particularly the panel of experts on community policing and identifying for us some real solid programs that currently exist uh, that can help with the implementation of recommendations that I think will be um, going forward. So uh, I also look forward to, uh, to continuing on tomorrow. And I, if I may, just as a point of personal privilege, I know that my family is at home watching the webcast. And I would like to thank them uh, because I've been gone a lot for these task force <laughs> activities and uh, tell them that I, I uh, love them and I will see them sometime next week. <laughs> I'll give the same message to my cat who is watching me on the, on the computer. Um, first of all, I want to just thank our leadership, our two co-chairs and all the staff who put together such excellent panels, They're extremely thoughtful, very rich in their testimony, very textured and thoughtful. And um, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate my co-panelists. Um, I would like to say, however, that we're not as old as we look to the young people. I mean, they acted like we were older than Methuselah. I mean, it was unbelievable the way they acted like that we needed to be carted off in wheelchairs or something. But um, no, we're not that old, and we're going to be around for a little while. So I look forward to working with these youngsters. Um, they were quite wonderful. It was great to hear their perspectives. And so I just want to thank my co-panelists, and I look forward to helping us pull together some hard-hitting and relevant suggestions. And I think we'll have a good handle on what to recommend, and I look forward to helping to shape that. Thank you. Well, I feel like these hearings are, are starting to build to a crescendo. Today was a real high point for me. I think we heard from some of the most courageous leaders in our profession. Good hearts, good ideas, but mostly a lot of courage to try things and do things that aren't necessarily popular um, in all areas of their lives. So I'm inspired by them, so hopefully we can be just as bold as they are with our recommendations and really make things better. Thanks. <laughs> I'm so mesmerized by listening to <laughs> my colleagues. I didn't realize it was my turn. Um, <laughs> it's been a long day, but a, a really quite wonderful one. Um, one of the things that I have loved about today, e each listening session, I think, oh, it can't get better than this, and then we learn something um, more. And one of the great things about today, and I guess kudos go to the COP staff and um, other folks who have been putting together these wonderful panels, is the way that each one build on the next one and sort of related and sort of the, I, and um, it made concrete some of the issues that we've been talking about since the first listening panel. I think today I felt as if the issues of procedural justice and legitimacy and trust building, which 
we had started out our listening sessions saying was sort of the key um, to, to the work were made real in, in so many ways. And then to cap off the day, listening to um, the next generation who obviously can't wait until I get off this stage. <laughs> Happy to have you up here um, and have you fly all around the country. Um, it was ri ridiculously uh, gratifying. So thanks to all of you and um, please keep these suggestions coming in and thanks Marge for sending in your comment. Um, so I, I was a little bit late this morning because my flight didn't get in uh, and I, we were actually hosting a conference of about 450 Teach for America professionals and the most important thing that we did in St. Louis last week was actually go into classrooms and listen to young people um, because the foundation of everything that we're talking about, community policing, whatever name it comes under today, really the foundation of it is relationships. Um, and the way in which we build authentic relationships is by listening um, and by placing it an intensive value in listening. And so um, I'm thinking a great deal about, uh, and, and I'm thankful for the equity of voice that we have seen today and throughout our listening sessions to ensure that lots of perspectives in different age brackets and from around the country uh, and from different cultural traditions are represented. Um, and I'm also just thinking about the premise of relationships and the idea that shifting the premise of relationships from simply being crime reduction and public safety to also including human and constitutional rights being the premise of, of our relationships uh, and our communities and the idea that our fates are tied up with one another. If that's the premise of our relationships and that's how we go out and build relationships with one another, um, then I have a lot of hope for where we are going to go. So I echo uh, the thanks of the other task force members for all of the testimony today, especially the testimony uh, and witness of young people who are taking a whole lot of pride in themselves and we take a lot of pride in you. Thank you. Uh, so th thanks to, to everyone in the room. Uh, echo what has been said about all of the panelists, uh, especially panel five and the young folk um, who have uh, kind of listened through this process and, and flown into Phoenix to be able to share your perspectives, share your stories. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, Michael Reynolds said it, but the, the reality is that each of us in our own experiences are experts on the issue. Uh, and so I look forward to hearing tomorrow and in Washington, um, you know, the voices of more young people get included uh, in the process. Uh, so thanks to everyone, thanks to the panelists, thanks to all the technical staff for every great listening session. There has to be a great team behind the scenes. Um, so thanks to all of the, the, the folks at, uh, at COPS and SAI Thanks to the sign team working hard um, and, uh, and everyone else who um, worked behind the scenes to make today successful. Thank you. The only thing I would like to say, I, I, I agree with everything you've heard from my uh, uh, cohorts here on this task force, but more than anything else at the end of the day, and, and this is our third meeting together, uh, as a task force is that I really want to give kudos all of them. I am just so delighted to be part of this with such talented and brilliant people to be up here on this task force with and 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 I'm going to ask y'all to give them a round of applause and thank you very much. Well, I think I speak for both Chuck and myself in saying we are very blessed to be serving with this task force. All of you are just a pleasure uh, to serve with uh, and a brilliant group. Uh, I would just say that this has been a wonderful day. Uh, for each of our listening sessions, like Tracy, I've felt it couldn't get better. Uh, and yet the panels we've had today, uh, each one has presented us with uh, witnesses who have had so much to contribute. And I just have to mention the research panel at the beginning because the, the academics on it had so much to, to really add to what we've heard in the other sessions and kind of brought it together 
with the evidence-based uh, material that they presented us with. And then to wrap up with the youth before us, with the candor that they brought to it. And I have to say, they even made Jose and Brittany look kind of old and staying. <laughs> Which, of course, made the rest of us feel extremely ancient. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Commissioner Ramsey, you're, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And I, too, want to just thank everyone who's made this day possible. Uh, those who came here to present oral testimony, those that submitted written testimony, participated uh, through social media. Um, we really do appreciate your, your, your input. It's going to be invaluable in trying to come up with the recommendations that will uh, ultimately wind up on the President's desk. Uh, COP staff, once again, excellent job, SAI. Uh, our sign interpreters who uh, are working very, very hard over there and have been on all these listening sessions. Uh, thank you very much. And it was another good day. This listening session really, I think, was outstanding and, um, and really pretty diverse. I mean, uh, Lori mentioned the beginning with the researchers and, and all the information that they brought forward. But then to end it with panel five, uh, with young people, um, I think just really capped off a very impressive day. And um, I want to thank all of you for coming, for being a part of that, and um, understand that they will come when you will be here. You will be doing what we're doing now. Um, you are the future. You're the ones that's going to pick up the mantle and carry it forward. Uh, so don't give up. Don't give up on yourselves. Don't give up on us old timers sitting up here. Uh, there's, uh, there's, this is important stuff. You're making a valuable contribution. Uh, but you have to stay engaged, and you have to really encourage other young people to be engaged, because if there is a void, others will fill it. So if you want your voices to be heard, then you have to speak up, and you have to stand up and, and, and be heard. So thank you all for being here. You are role models for all of us, and um, thank you. God bless all of you, and thank you for being here. We're good. Mr. Chairman, if I was to close out, but just for reminding those on the webcast that we have uh, tomorrow, we'll be start at 9 o'clock, Tracy. We'll start at 9 o'clock tomorrow, and we will be focusing on issues of training and education. Take care. <laughs>